Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. We are just preparing the Facebook live stream. Attendees are joining us. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us this morning for Our Moss, Our Future 2021. Um, you are reminded that the, uh, the sessions are being uh, live streamed on Facebook. So if anyone hasn't joined, you can certainly share um, the link to recordings for the Facebook live stream with your wider networks. Uh, Dr. Wajid, I will be going live. Uh, please allow uh, about a four second lag before you start speaking for the purposes of Facebook live stream. Um, uh, we are going live. Okay. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah khairan for everyone who's joining us bright and early on this beautiful Saturday morning in December. My name is Dr. Wajid. I'm the Assistant Secretary General for the Muslim Council of Britain. It's normal when an ummah is as beaten down and as bad a situation and as demoralized as the Muslim ummah is today, that we tend to look back towards our history, towards our golden age, when we were the ones who were contributing to civilization and who were leading the world. But the truth is, if you want to change things, if we want to change our situation, then we cannot just look at the past. We must also look to the future. Here at the Muslim Council of Britain, we believe that this future has the best chance of success, of being a united future, and of being full of barakah if it starts from our mosques. Welcome to our mosque, our future conference, 2021. As always, we'd like to begin with a recitation from the Quran, and I'd like to invite uh, Qari Isaq Jassad to recite a few verses. Kari Ishaq is a qualified solicitor, an expert on Tajweed, uh, who studied in Egypt and Morocco, but especially you know, known to us because he's one of the founders of the National Hafad uh, Association, which has been doing fantastic work uh, for some time now, but especially over the COVID period. So without further ado, uh, Kari Ishaq, I would like to invite you to uh, recite some verses from the Quran for us. Just going to transfer over. And it wouldn't be an Islamic conference if there weren't some slight technical issues. So you know that, alhamdulillah, we're 100% halal. Uh, uh, over to you, Kari Ishaq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Assalamu. Inshallah, uh, I will begin the uh, conference with some recitation from the Quran. And I've chosen to recite some verses from Surah Hujurat, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Innama al-mu'minuna ikhwatun فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَسْخَرْ قَوْمٌ مِّن قَوْمٍ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُونُوا خَيْرًا أَن يَكُونُوا خَيْرًا مِّنْهُمْ وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَىٰ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُمْ وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الايمان ومن لم يتب فاولئك هم الظالمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن 
إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِثْمٌ وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابٌ رَّحِيمٌ يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم Inna Allah alimun khabir. And just a brief translation of the verses I just recited from Surah Hujurat. The believers are but brothers, so make settlement between your brothers and fear Allah that you may receive mercy. O oh, you who have believed, let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them. Nor let women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them. And do not insult one another and do not call each other by offensive nicknames. Wretched is the name of disobedience of another one's faith. And whoever does not repent, it is those who are the wrongdoers. Oh, you who have believed, avoid much negative assumption. Indeed, some assumption is sin. And do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like the flesh of his brother when dead? You would detest it. So fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. O mankind, indeed, we have created you for male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. Sadaqallah al-Azim. Jazakallah khair and khair sahab. I very much appreciate uh, the recitation and also the, the translation so we can benefit from it. Thank you so much and for all the work that you do with National Hafad Association and beyond. So with that, we're starting properly. Bismillah. Um, some general housekeeping rules. I know that this is a virtual conference, so uh, you may think that we don't need to do too much housekeeping, but there's a few things. Um, wherever you are, the fire exits are where they normally would be and your toilets are hopefully nearby if you need to use them. And if you do get hungry, then the kitchen will usually have something hidden that you can snack on and nobody will need to know. You can just press the um, uh, camera off button and we'll, we'll all keep it a secret between ourselves. Uh, apart from that, it's the usual, please keep your uh, microphone off, especially what, unless you're a speaker, in which case you will also keep it off, but we'll have to remind you to say that you're speaking on mute. Uh, and um, we can have uh, play our own version of Muslim bingo about how many times that happens during the conference today. Uh, and we want this to be interactive. In fact, it can be actually more interactive than a live conference because you can actually share your thoughts, your ideas, and your questions in the chat box. So please do keep it interactive and, and rolling um, throughout the presentations. We'll do our best to answer them and share them with the speakers. And those that can't be answered can be answered at a later point. So do share them and keep it interactive. The hashtag that we're gonna be using today is our community. So please do consider do that if you're one of those hip people on social media and we will be live streaming and recording this conference as well. So check out our Facebook page uh, for the live stream. Um, as always, any event like this is not possible without some form of sponsorship. And it's important that we uh, identify those who put their money where their mouth is and uh, support the development of our masajid for the future. Our main charity sponsor and partner for this conference is Islamic Relief uh, UK, which is well known and will be doing a variety of presentations uh, throughout uh, the conference, especially focusing on the emergency that is de rapidly developing and worsening in Afghanistan. So please do keep a lookout for that. Our other sponsors include Bates uh, Wells LLP, Euro Quality Foundation, which is a charity primarily supporting high impact charities while undertaking some charitable activity itself. Uh, Simply Mosque, which is a team of specialist Muslim insurance brokers providing insurance 
for mosques, charities, and other forms of Islamic institutions, and Communities for All, a Manchester-based uh, organization whose principal aim is to support all communities, encouraging community cohesion, integration, and improving socioeconomic inclusion. With that, enough of me talking because nobody wants to hear that, especially not my family. So I'm going to move on to our first speaker who we all know, but it's worth saying because it, it, is, it is a marker. We often hear it so much from the outside world that we tend to believe it ourselves that you know the Muslims uh, oppress the women or we're, we're not inclusive of young people. And you know, there's no greater evidence of change than our next speaker who is, the first female Scottish, uh, we won't hold that against her just, but you know, we will deal with the female part, but the Scottish part is a bit hard to swallow still for here down south. Uh, youngest secretary general of the MCB. She has a passion for community building, empowering young people and women. And she's set out some strategic priorities, which is what the conference is built around. Those themes are developed around those strategic priorities. So if you wanna know what's important for the leadership of MCB, then just look at the agenda that we're dealing with in the conference today. That'll give you a good idea. So I'd like to invite our Secretary General, Sister Zara Muhammad, to the stage. Um, Assalamualaikum, Jazakallah Karawajid, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, my many thanks to all of our sponsors and all of you attendees that have joined us bright and early this morning. Bismillah rahman rahim It gives me such a pleasure and delight to be able to, uh, I guess, officially open this conference, which will mark not only our last event of the year, but the doorway to the next, uh, the celebration of MCB's 25 years in the new year that is to come very shortly. It's been an important marker also for me because I come to and very close to my one year in term. And I think when I set out this journey, you know, I thought about these strategic priorities and what we wanted to achieve, which is really the framework of this conference. And my thanks to Dr. Saad Amin, who will be speaking shortly, um, for really taking that on board and putting it together. But throughout these past few months, I've been visiting you, our affiliates, and, you know, traveling across <laughs> the country, you know, visiting massages, visiting girls' schools, um, visiting local community groups, women's groups, both starting, continuing with the legacy of work behind them. And I've taken so much inspiration that our strategy and work will not be effective unless it's really in touch with you on the ground, what's actually happening. And we know that the challenges that we as Muslim communities face are not just those internal to ourselves, which we will be tackling in this conference, but also in our external reality. And very much with my own election, there was plenty of discussion as to whether a woman could lead, especially a Muslim woman, and whether she'd be allowed to lead. But with your fantastic support, encouragement, and votes, um, we've shown that absolutely that is possible. Um, but also that, you know, with 50% of British Muslims being under the age of 25, now is our moment to really think about how our institutions need to be, to be fit for purpose, to be relevant, to be accessible. MCB has a track record of community building, community change, but most importantly, community cohesion, bringing so many diverse communities together under this umbrella, not for the sake of uniformity, but for the sake of an inspired unity. And that is really in the spirit of this ummah that we're all here to change things, not just for ourselves, but for the greater humanity. And putting all of those themes together, this conference is looking at what can we do for our youth? What can we do for our women and our most marginalized communities? What can we do for our institutions? Not just about improving them, but keeping them safe in all of the things that we've seen in the news recently. And then thinking about our elderly and our bereaved. And so many people have gone through so many challenges in the course of this pandemic, which we are still in. So to conclude, I'm really, really looking forward forward to sharing my own session, but also the whole brevity of this conference. My thanks to everybody who's been part of this. There are many unsung heroes, but in particularly our head of mosque affairs, Dr. Zad Amin, who probably hasn't slept too much, but we hope will sleep till just 7am until he starts his next four jobs as a doctor. But back to you, Dr. Wajan, and just my du'as that Allah accepts our efforts and increases us in goodness. And I pray it's a very beneficial and successful conference for all of us. Amin. I mean, Jazakallah khair, and thank you so much, Zara. And speaking of Dr. Shazad, I mean, um, as everyone knows, putting on a conference like this takes a team of people putting in many, many hours, lots of effort and energy, uh, but any great team needs a, a great leader, and uh, Dr. Shazad was that leader. 
uh, as such as I was saying, still sending emails and organizing things until, you know, well past 1, 2 a.m. last night and then bright up at 6 o'clock in the morning, was awake again, ready to practice things. So uh, he's also the Assistant Secretary General of the MCB. Um, he's the current head of Mosque Affairs for the MCB and lots of the guidance that are coming out. You've been seeing guidance on safeguarding, on how we can engage with refugees, on the environment. All these things have you know, started off on Dr. Shazad's uh, word processor at some point in the last few months and alhamdulillah have been taken to completion. Um, he's a GP by profession and he gets this kind of uh, real connection to knowing how to uh, make mosques shine because he himself is a chair of uh, Khizra Mosque in Manchester. So without further ado, Dr. Shazad, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wajid and everyone else for the introduction. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this conference today. Uh, this is our annual uh, Muslim Council of Britain, Our Mosques, Our Future Conference. And this year, our theme will be our communities. Due to the pandemic, uh, we've decided to have this conference online and we hope next year, uh, inshallah, we can uh, be face to face again at a large venue. We'll be discussing a variety of issues and we hope to address current issues that affect Muslims and mosques across the country. We'll start with a session on becoming greener mosques and really in turn look at how we can become greener homes and how we can look after our environment. We'll also look at some of the challenges we face as Muslims and mosques and in the community and how we can address them. And this will be followed by a very important session on safeguarding, safeguarding from a charity's perspective and also from dealing with children and adults and also safety and security of our mosques. This will be followed by a session around looking after the elderly post pandemic, looking at how can we introduce bereavement counselling into our mosques. We've had lots of death, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. And then also an update on the new COVID guidance uh, that's changed recently and they'll we'll have one of our special speakers talk about this and just introduce what we would recommend from the MCB. And this will be, fin finally, we'll have uh, six awards that we'll be giving out tonight. This will be the first uh, MCB annual awards that we'll be providing. And inshallah, this you'll see some great work that's been going on across the country by mosques and other Islamic organizations. This conference really aligns to our mosque affairs strategy for this year. And the priorities are, as uh, Zara mentioned, earlier on, there'll be discussions around inclusion and diversity. And we're really looking at this conference as not just being a one-off event. So it's not just a one-off event. You come here, you listen, and then that's the end of it. This will hopefully, the themes that we discussed today will form part of the work that we do over the next 12 months. We'll be looking at how we can work together to address the challenges that we face. And we'll be touching on some of the problems, but also what's the solutions. As we approach 25 years of the Muslim Council of Britain, next year, inshallah, we'll be having, uh, we have the Visit My Mosque event every year. And next year, we hope to have two Visit My Mosque events. And we'll be making this announcement very soon. I hope you all find this conference beneficial and hope it can help us all to unite and work together to tackle the challenges that Muslims and mosques face in today's age and solve them together. As someone who's been a trustee and chair at a large mosque in the country, so I'm the current chair at UK, I'm Kizra Mosque, uh, and I've been part as a trustee and chair for the most part of the last 10 years. I, I believe that our mosques across the country can make small changes, which can have a big impact in the services and the standards that we provide to the wider community. Jazakumullah here for listening. I hope you all enjoy the conference. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shazad. Very much appreciated. And wow, two mosque conferences next year. Looking forward to that. Uh, I mean, these are flagship events. This is how we can move forward as a community so that every mosque and every um, uh, Muslim community in this country has a chance to develop and learn from each other. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm really looking forward to our first session, which is being led by Dr. Husna Ahmed. Um, so I just wanted to introduce Dr. Husna Ahmed first. Uh, Dr. Husna Ahmed uh, OBE is the CEO of Global One 2015. It's a faith-based international NGO focused on women. 
And uh, if I was to read her entire CV, I would actually take up more space and time than both speakers combined. So mashallah, she's done so much work. I mean, she's the board member for uh, uh, of Faith for the Climate and at Palmer's Green Mosque, which is extremely relevant to our discussion here. She's also co-chair for the Multi-Faith Advisory Council to the UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. And she sits on the steering committee of the World Bank's Moral Imperative Initiative. And if you, any of you are surprised that the World Bank has a moral imperative initiative, then join my club. But Dr. Ahmed is you know, steering that, mashallah, and, uh, and, and you know, that, that is a force for change. And it's so inspiring to see Muslims who are in these positions uh, influencing policy at the highest levels. She's the Secretary General of the World Muslim Leadership Forum and the coordinator for the Alliance of NGOs and CSOs, um, which work in collaboration with the UN Office for uh, South Cooperation. And uh, she was uh, recently honored for the work that she was doing with dis disadvantaged people for work promoting social justice with disadvantaged communities. Um, she's uh, also extremely relevant for all the work that's happening with COVID been an advisory uh, for faith leaders uh, to the MHCLG, the UK Minister of Housing Communities and Local Government, that has been uh, putting in place a lot of the rules around COVID. So thank you so much for the work that you've been doing on that, because I'm sure that has had an impact on um, the way that uh, the, the Muslim communities and mosque spaces are treated um, during the, the last two years. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass over to Dr. Hassan Ahmed to begin the first session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, absolute pleasure to meet you, Dr. Wajid, Dr. Shahzad, and um, reunite with Zahra Muhammad, um, who I had the um, honor and pleasure of meeting at COP26 recently. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, I think this is a wonderful um, conference that you've organized because. Um, it's something that we as Muslims need to recognize how important our communities are and our masjids are. So our masjids are our future. And it's it's really sad that uh, with COVID, you know, we haven't been able to attend our mosques like we used to. I want to um, introduce our keynote speaker for this session, uh, who is um, somebody that really doesn't need any introduction. He's someone who's highly beloved and respected in the Muslim community as a humanitarian uh, worker. And um, he's been in this sector for 16 years. Um, I forgive him for being a Liverpool FC water, but you know, that, that's, that's not a problem. Um, Dufail Hussein uh, is somebody who's you know, leading IRUK, He's the director of IR UK and I, Islamic Relief, you know, is an institution which we as Muslims are all so proud of. It's, it's a, one of the leading lights in the humanitarian space, not just for Muslims, but, you know, globally. And, you know, Tufel, you know, you uh, are leading the UK um, uh, 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 department or UK um, wing of Islamic Relief. And you know, I, I just want to just add two more things, and that is that you were the CEO of Orphans in Need, which is another you know amazing organisation. You were also the trustee of MC um, F uh, Muslims Charity uh, Forum, and you're also leading on TIC um, International, which is a, a, a wing of um, Islamic uh, Relief. So I pass it over to you, Tofaya, to please. Um, speak about protecting our environment and about our masjids in, in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Amabat. I will forgive you for the slur on uh, Liverpool Football Club because I, I respect you so much, Dr. Islam. MashaAllah. Allah bless you and your family always for everything that you do for our community here and globally. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I think it's a uh, uh, a, a wonderful initiative, mashallah, um, to talk about climate change within our community, something which I feel is not talked about enough. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. Just bear with me. I'm not the best with technology. I hope that I'm able to do it. So um, can you see that? Dr. Hussa? No, I can't see anything. Sorry. Okay. Hold on. Because it's showing me that, that I'm sharing slides. Um, Dr. Wajid, can you help? 
this. Yep, we're just going to make uh, Brother Tufail co-host and um, uh, and then he will be able to share his slides. Okay. And mashallah, you know, look at the unity. We have even Scots and Liverpool supporters with the rest of us, uh, and, you know, alhamdulillah. This alhamdulillah. Is, that we are able to get together is truly a miracle of Allah SWT. Alhamdulillah. We have some Man United supporters there, I guess, but we don't need to talk about them. Yes, because they uh, are they, they don't need to explain themselves. <laughs> Karen hiding. Apologies, we're just about to make you co-host. No problem at all. And there you go, you have the power. Okay, bismillah. So, um, so Maj, if I just share the slides here, it will appear. Can you see that now? Yeah, um, if you start sharing, give it a second and inshallah. Uh, oh, and I think we might need to, uh, if, if we can get our tech team to allow the spotlight to um, come off. And then that way, I think we'll be able to see the slides. Da, da, da. Can you see that? Can yes, you see that now? It, we can. You can see it now. It's perfect. And if you just display full display, then it will be perfect. It'll be visible. So I'm now starting the slideshow, and you should be able to see that now. Is that okay? Is that okay? There you go. Look, all yeah. that money that Bill Gates has given us is finally working. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So climate change. Um, climate change is having a, a devastating impact. On, on our on our world and it's we're, we're seeing the effects here in the uk of course um through increased flooding um through prolonged days of heat waves and it's having an impact here but really the most uh where we really see an impact is globally abroad and it's the most vulnerable that are impacted unfortunately we're seeing these extreme weather phenomena that that are creating floods um, causing floods, fires, forest fires, cyclones, droughts, famines. And these are such common occurrences across the world now that the media have actually stopped reporting on them. Uh, how many of you knew that there were devastating floods in Sudan last year? I went, I went to Sudan last year and, and after the floods. And it, it washed away whole villages. Uh, in some places, floods were reaching as high as, flood, the flood level was as high as six feet. People died. Hardly anybody in the community here knew about it. We, we organized an event here um, for, the, for the charities just to highlight the issue. How many of you knew that um, there were floods recently, in, uh, a few months ago in Niger? Flash floods that, that, that took lives, that destroyed homes. Again, no, no coverage in the media. Regular flooding in India and, and other places, again, nothing. So, and these are now unfortunately becoming common occurrences. It's estimated that 85% of the world's population has been affected by human-induced climate change. The World Health Organization, and this is, a, this is quite a conservative figure to be honest, but it's still a very shocking figure. The World Health Organization estimates that 150,000 people a year die because of climate change. A, an absolutely shocking stat. These are contributing to a global food crisis as a result of these, um, these, these, these um, natural disasters. We're, we're, we're losing crops we're losing livestock and it's there this is creating a shortage of food globally and it's it's increasing it's 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 driving up the 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 cost of food here in the uk our food is subsidized so we don't see the impact of that as much but globally it food isn't subsidized which means that people average person can't afford food uh, we're seeing that right now unfold in afghanistan where 23 million people are facing acute hunger now, a, a contributing factor towards that is, is um, that the Afghanistan saw, experienced its worst drought in over 35 years this year. And that led to a low, a low crop yield. And, and again, a, a, an inflation in the cost of food. I was, in, I was in Afghanistan a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I saw children dying of hunger. And these are all as a result of the impact um, of climate change. <clears throat> and and I, we have to question, what world are we leaving for our, for our children? In 20 years, the world has significantly changed because of climate change. What will happen in another 10, 20 years as the, the effects of climate change worsen? 
Alhamdulillah, Allah will never test, uh, uh, you know, will never burden a soul beyond its ability to, to manage that burden. And it's not too late. We can reverse the effects of climate change, which is why we have the net zero target, which is why, um, you know, by, 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 by 2050, we, we, our aim is as a globe, as, as a global community to, to reach net zero uh, and, and to try and keep temperatures to, to 1.5 degrees. There's a lot to do. Uh, and we as a Muslim community have a responsibility there. So what is Islamic Relief doing to, to tackle the climate crisis? Globally, uh, our teams are working with our communities, the people that we serve, to adapt the way that they live. So we're, we're helping farmers to adapt the way that they farm. Uh, new farming techniques, um, seeds that, lead, that need less water. We're, we're, we're implementing these across the world um, with, with our communities. We're helping to implement disaster risk reduction uh, programs. So uh, natural flood defenses, in, for example, in Bangladesh, we've been helping to replant the Sundarband, which is um, the, the mangrove forest, which has always been a natural barrier to, to flooding for Bangladesh. We're, we're creating shelters that will allow the community in Bangladesh to, to, um, to, to, to escape uh, flooding when it happens. And we're implementing sustainable water projects. So one, one project in particular, so in Africa, um, I talked about Niger earlier, and that, that's because uh, in, in a, when you think about Niger, you think, how is, how is Niger, how is, how is flooding affecting Niger? Um, it's a dry country. It's a, it's a barren desert. It's because of um, extreme rainfalls. You find that um, in, in some parts of Africa, like Mali and Niger, six months of rainfall will fall within a couple of days creating these flash, devastating flash floods, which kill people, destroy property, destroy crops. Our teams have learned to harness that, actually. So what, they, what they, we've come up with a new, a very innovative project, which is called the Microdam Project. So through a geological survey, we find land which is um, appropriate for this project. And we, we build these microdams, which harness that water. So instead of that water evaporating into, into the atmosphere, uh, first of all, creating devastation, then evaporating, that water is actually held and it creates a reservoir and that reservoir is big enough, uh, large enough to provide uh, enough water for the community for the whole of the dry season for, for six months. I saw one reservoir, which is about uh, a, a kilometer by a kilometer and a half wide. And within that, we create fish farming, uh, and that's an industry for, for widow families, etc. So we're, we're, we're trying innovative solutions to help, to help our communities to adapt and to protect from the effects of climate change. Here in the UK, We're getting involved in advocacy campaigns along with Dr. Husna and her team um, uh, and, and other Muslim organizations like the Muslim Charities Forum. We're, we're doing our best to try and lobby the government through advocacy campaigns, which include uh, COP26, which was the, uh, the, the global conference that, that brings together world leaders to try and uh, put in place policies that will help us to reach net zero by 2050. We had, um, we had a couple of high profile events at the event. You see one picture there on the right. Um, that, so uh, that, that was one event uh, within the within the sort of main sort of political zone, and we had another event with the Pakistani government, um, which um, be, and, and this is um, obviously very ap appropriate because Pakistan is is particularly affected by climate change. So we, events like these help to help to lobby uh, governments and and, um, and 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 of course people that have influence to try and uh, to try and change policies to help. The communities that we serve across the world. We're, we're involved in community action. So a couple of years ago, we were working with the Balam and Tooting Islamic Center to try and um, to try and inspire their, their masalis during Ramadan to not use plastic bottles for water and instead use a more sustainable um, form of carrying water. So we were handing out these bottles um, through, through the masjid. We, uh, of course, traditionally used to give out plastic bottles. Many of you might remember that Islamic Relief used to give out plastic bottled water. We, we've stopped doing that because of, because of climate change. Um, and of course, the solarization of the Glasgow Central Mosque, which I'll talk about a bit more in a, in a second. Now, I just want you to spend a minute just to, to read this hadith. Our, our beautiful faith is clear on the responsibility, on our responsibility towards sustaining our earth. We therefore need to be leading the debate on climate change. The fact is we're not. We are such a compassionate community. Whenever there is a crisis across the world, the community, we can always rely on the community to respond. They'll give, they'll give, they'll give, they'll donate, 
they'll go out on the streets to collect funds, they'll take action to, to try and help people in need. Climate change is, 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 is taking the lives of around 150,000 people a year. That, if, you, if you equate that to a natural disaster, that's, that's one, two, that, you know, if you all remember, and, and we will, for those of us that were around at that time, we'll never forget the, the earthquake in Pakistan in Northwest Frontier in 2005, which cost over 140,000 lives. That moved us as a community. It moved us to action during that Ramadan. And I remember the, the passion within the community to try and help. We're seeing an earthquake on that magnitude every year because of climate change, but the community don't know about it. We have a responsibility to do something about that. And, and we see mosques, uh, mosques can play a key role in trying to help the community to understand about the impact of climate change and, and hopefully change the way that we, we live our lives. So mosques are a fundamental pillar of our community. There are over, what, 1,500 mosques in the UK. They're serving their communities throughout the year. Uh, and, and, and so through a, a project like the Solarization Project in, 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 that we're implementing in Glasgow Central Mosque, we can significantly reduce the amount of harmful emissions that our community emit in, in, into the atmosphere, just by simply focusing on the mosques. Um, we, we can, uh, the, the mosques are an influential platform. The, the khutbahs, the, 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 the classes within the masjids, the conversations that happen with the masjids influence our community. And we can change the narrative within our community and help them to understand the, the harmful impacts of climate change. But we need the mosques on board. And that was what really inspired us to, to solarize Glasgow Central Mosque. Excuse me, that's my, my, my daughter spanging on the door. Uh, we'll, we'll, try, we'll, try, <laughs> we'll try and carry on. Um, so the, the Glasgow Central Mosque, why Glasgow Central Mosque? Well, COP26, which is that, that global event to highlight uh, the effects of climate change and to influence, um, to influence leaders across the world. COP26 took place in Glasgow. Glasgow Central Mosque is the, is the largest and the most iconic mosque in Glasgow, which was really a stone's throw away from COP26 conference. So we wanted to use that as an example of the, the, the brilliant work that the Muslim community are doing to contribute towards the, 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 the battle against climate change and the effects. So we decided to solarize Glasgow Central Mosque. We will be installing 130 solar panels. And this, inshallah, will be cutting around 18,000 kilograms of harmful CO2 emissions into the year. Um, in terms of energy savings, uh, it's estimated that will, it will save around five to 6,000 pounds in, in energy costs per year. That's around 20 to 30% of Glasgow Central Mosque's annual energy bill. And they've committed to, to allocating the savings towards an urban food growing project. So that that so planting um, uh, planting of vegetation will obviously help to reduce emissions because vegetation takes harmful emissions and turns it into oxygen, uh, and then, but then also whatever vegetation they're growing will help um, will help the vulnerable in in their community by providing them with food. Uh, and they're, they're also they've also committed to hosting annual awareness sessions for the community again to help the, our community to understand and to inshallah inspire a change in behavior. So the, 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 the ultimate objective through this campaign is of course to, to try and inspire change within our community. There are what, three to four million Muslims that we're waiting for the census to come out, but let's just say over three million Muslims in the UK. We, if we were to change the way that we live our lives, we can have a significant positive impact on climate change. So our, on the back of this um, solarization project, we are going to be delivering a wider advocacy campaign, which will help to inspire other mosques and houses of worship to hopefully solarize. We're going to be calling on the government to establish a green fund for houses of worship to, to help fund the installation of these solar panel projects, so, solar panels. And, and we're, also how, we're also going to be lobbying the government, we've already started, to set up dedicated, dedicated dialogue channels with faith leaders. The majority of people across the world adhere to a faith. We need to be a part of that discussion. And just, just to finish off, um, what else can our mosques do to reduce harmful emissions? Well, we can, as I've already mentioned, we can reduce plastic waste, um, encourage our, our masalis, especially during Ramadan, 
to, to move from plastic bottles to more sustainable solutions. Uh, bottles like these, um, they, alhamdulillah, you pay once and you use them for years. And, and, and of course, the other benefit is that they can keep uh, water cool too. Uh, reduce meat in meals. Now, um, what people don't know is that um, industrialized production of meat is a massive contributor to harmful emissions into the earth. 60% of greenhouse gases that are that are that are that are uh, that are you know sent into the into the atmosphere um, through global food production. 60% of that is because of meat production. That's a huge amount. Um, and here's another startling fact: meat, Muslims are ferocious meat eaters. Um, uh, it's it's estimated that uh, the uh, the the Meat production in the UK, 20% of the meat in the UK is halal, 20%. We're only about 5% of the population. Uh, you know, so we, we can make a, a significant impact by helping to reduce the amount of meat in our meals. And that's also good for our health too, to have a more balanced diet. We can change our bulbs to a more eco-friendly alternatives, install motion sensor switches. We all see how we, you know, we, we leave the prayer room or we leave rooms and we, the lights are, le are left on. These, these are contributing to emitting harmful emissions into, into the atmosphere and also you know, leading to higher bills for our community and for our masjids. And we need to encourage worshippers to walk to the masjid, driving just around the corner. Again, you start up the car, you, these are releasing harmful emissions. My, of course, if you've got an electric car, that's different. Um, but we, we are, um, as a community, we're growing older and... And, and I think it's it's important for us to also look at, look at the health benefits of walking, especially for the older older generation within our community. Uh, and so we need to encourage our worshippers. It will have a positive impact on climate change, but also on the health of our community. And of course, will will help us to reduce um, uh, you know uh, neighbours that are that are annoyed with, uh, with 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 the Muslim community because of parking issues, which we're all affected by, of course. We need more khutbahs and madrasa lessons on climate change. We need to plant more trees and vegetables, as I've already stated, the, the, the benefit of doing that. And we need to encourage people in our community to lobby the MPs. There are 3 million plus Muslims in the UK, and this is and our community is growing fast. We are a significant number and a significant community and a significant voice. So when you see campaigns from the Climate Coalition, from Islamic Relief, uh, from, uh, from, from, from Dr. Husna and her team, get involved. Spread that in, into you know share that amongst your community and encourage them to, to lobby their MPs on on climate change. And we need you, of course. Uh, ultimately, these efforts are nothing without the help of Allah. And we need you, please, to to pray for uh, the earth and all its inhabitants. We have to remember that it's the most vulnerable that are impacted by climate change. Uh, but very soon, if we carry on the way that we are, we are we are going to start to see significant impact here in the UK. And our future generations may not have an earth um, uh, which, which they can live peacefully in because of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with tawfiq. I mean, I thank you all. Zakhlaw khair. Zakhlaw khair. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've got some questions. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Wadid, if you can help me um, with the questions in a, in a moment. I just want to touch upon a couple of things um, that you talked about, Tufail. Um, One of the things you said was, you know, the, the fact that we as Muslims have um, a responsibility. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, environmental ethics, you know, the four sort of key things that um, scholars are, are talking about is Tawheed, um, Mizan, um, and they're also talking about Maslaha, and you, you've mentioned, you know, the community, because, you know, uh, uh, the global community where we as Muslims should be helping our neighbours, um, and I think, um, you know, the, the main one is Khalifa, that we are stewards of this planet, and we have to walk lightly on this planet, and I think, you know, from my experience, unfortunately, the Muslim communities aren't um, engaging enough and, and uh, uh, my sense is that it's mainly because of the other priorities in our lives 
but it's you know now especially with you know all the uh, media coverage about COP26 and uh, um, the engagement and uh, um, you know obviously your uh, uh, solarization project came under the Ummah for Earth um, which is a, a, um, a, an initiative which, which um, is really pushing for youth um, action on climate change you know where Global One and Islamic Relief and a number of other organizations are involved um, so I think you know for us the most important thing is that how can Muslims really come together and I, I liked what Zara said earlier about unity how can we come together and collaborate you know, to have impact um, you, you've got six children of your own so you know the first question I'd like to ask if I may is you know how are you sort of inspiring your children to you know think about the environment and how can they contribute you know um, you mentioned some things uh, if you could expand on that and then I'd like Dr Wadi if you could just bring in a couple of the questions because I can't really see anything on the question and answer but I can think there's some things on the chat yeah yeah, so, yeah I, I think first of all I, I talk about climate change I talk about the, the impact it's having on our, on our on our world so you know at least there is some conversation around it and and a level of understanding but more importantly we take action so we've um, we we've actually um, significantly reduced the amount of meat that we eat in our house um so um in, in a week um whereas before it was meat every day <laughs> lunch uh, evening sometimes even for breakfast um now now uh, we we at least have a, a vegetable dish three to four maybe maybe three to four days a week um, so the, the, there's a more balanced um, diet. I also try and encourage my kids to walk more. So instead of taking the bus to school, I say, look, it's only a 10 minute walk, walk. And I, and I, and I walk. So I, if I have a meeting, I, and I always remind my kids about this, if I have a meeting that's less than three miles away uh, and I have time, I'll walk to the meeting. Uh, or, or if I have to go to the masjid and I have time, I'll try and walk to the masjid. Um, so th these are, I, it, I think it's meaningful action, taking action, um, having conversations, but taking and uh, living living your life in a way that you can inspire others uh, by taking the right action. Uh, if I can just also say about the community, I I I I truly believe that um, the, the the community isn't as involved. It's, it's because they they don't quite understand the impacts of climate change. I, I mentioned the presentation. Our community is the most compassionate. They are they are always ready to respond. We see whenever there's a crisis, they will do whatever they can to support. I've seen people that have no money that, you know, they will give everything, right, to help other, others in need. If we can inculcate this understanding that climate change is having this devastating impact on communities across the world, where hundreds of thousands of people are dying annually because of climate change, because of the way that we live our lives, I'm sure that we can inspire some change in the community. Okay. I, I, I was going to flip it a little bit back to you, Sister Rosna. Because yeah. Dr. Hussna, because um, how could we do that? What uh, Brother Safel just said, how do we inspire our community to take it more seriously and to make it a Muslim issue? I think the um, struggle that I've seen is people understanding what climate change is, as Safel just said, um, because, you know, for so many years, everyone thinks climate change is in the realms of, you know, of the scientists. Um, but really, you know, trying to break it down and understand what impact it has on our communities is the way forward. And, um, you know, one thing that we need to realize is that in the global south, you know, where many of the Muslims, you know, uh, we've got um, what two, almost two billion Muslims in the world, and the majority of, of them are in the global south. You know, the impact of climate change is no fault of their own. It was because of the Industrial Revolution. It, it, it's because of the greed. You know, capitalism. Of, yeah, of capitalism um, and corruption and you know, things like that, which have impacted. And we're having to take the you know, brunt of it and also uh, uh, being told that, you know, we can't uh, de develop our country. You know, the nations in the global south can't develop in the same way that the industrial nations did because of climate change. So, you know, uh, this there's a concept that came out in COP26, which was loss and damage. And loss and damage is really about how uh, um, a fund could be set up to really support the global south to, you know, develop, um, but in, in a green way, you know, um, and, and support those. And I think the other pr problem that I feel is, you know, really significant that needs to be mentioned is about the scale of human migration that will happen. Already we're seeing it you know, uh, a conflict, you know, and then with um, climate change, you know, with the floods and droughts and everything, um, you know, you mentioned Afghanistan, you know, th there's going to be huge uh, um, uh, migration and that will be a test 
of you know uh, uh, the global um, international community in terms of how they cooperate. You know, um, because you know, will the North? You know, be uh, as forthcoming to support you know migration, and already we're seeing politically throughout uh, uh, Europe, you know, the negativity around um, Muslims, you know, the Islamophobia that you're you're, you're sensing, the rise of um, you know uh, uh, the National Front, and you know those sort of movements. Um, coming back to your question, I think you know what we've tried to do as uh, Global One is we produced um, a book on uh, greening the Hajj, and you know I think we we need to. Have those moments. So, for instance, um, at uh, COP26, um, uh, you know, lots of Muslims came together and we produced this, and MCB was, you know, part of this. Uh, Muslims coming together to have an extraordinary impact because often what you'll see, you'll see, you know, the 84% of the adherents of uh, the world are faith, you know, adherents, but, you know, at place at moments where you have uh, conferences like the UN um, conference, you have the other, you know, particularly the Christians are very vocal and advocacy is huge with them, but Muslims are unseen. So it was wonderful to see the, you know, Muslims take part in um, the climate march. Um, and many of us were there in the rain, you know, walking with our banners and things. And that was fantastic. And also having leaflets to give to others to show them that, yes, we are doing things. And this solarization um, of this mosque in Glasgow and the wonderful dinner that the, the vegetarian dinner that we all had there, that was you know, <laughs> amazing. But, you know, it's these. We had, we had a few complaints. No, no, it was fantastic, absolutely wonderful, you know. And you know, I'm sorry if I sent any complaints. <laughs> that sense of you know coming together and collaborating, which is really, really urgent, because you know often I would go into a room and I'd be the only um, woman of color or only uh, Muslim there, and everyone else would be middle-aged white women. Um, you know, it, talking about environment because that was their the thing that they were really passionate about. But you know what we are seeing now um, is the youth. Um, particularly Muslim youth are wanting to engage and are wanting to um, uh, play a role. And I think MCB has a huge role to play in this in really engaging and bringing the youth. And I think this, you know, focus on the Amos as the spiritual and social and community hubs to re and also, you know, uh, getting them engaged on the environment front. I think that is the way forward. Absolutely. Over to you, Wajid. I'll just pass over to one of the youth that you were mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had to join the party and I, I particularly wore green, you know, just in case anybody didn't know my commitment to environmentalism. <laughs> it was uh, so wonderful to see you both in Glasgow and of course at COP26 as well, uh, where I was delighted to be um, traveling through the green zone with Dr. Husna and finding about how much of a pioneer she is. And, and of course, Phil actually attended the gender and inclusion session by Islamic Relief and the solar panel greening mosques in Glasgow Central Mall. So I guess my question to both of you is that, you know, being it's very difficult i guess for us to operate as organizations in the green space because sometimes there's a lot of jargon there's a lot of kind of people who are already well established that inclusion of just being us as ethnic minorities or different can also be quite challenging and i know for many of our communities some of the barriers is they don't see themselves in the environmental space or it's expensive you know to go green i'm trying to put food on the table how am i supposed to afford all of these things and also it's kind of like an added weight and burden rather than something that we naturally do. And I know to fell in some of the sessions that Islamic Relief ran, you know, there was this whole impetus that the global South and, and most of these, some of these uh, vast majority of these countries are Muslim countries that yeah. really do suffer on the back of this. So I guess bringing that all together, do you think there's some insights that you can share for communities who are feeling it's too hard to go green, it's too expensive. And then on the other side, that responsibility that we do have to who are going greener for in some ways? Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, Doctor Sue, would you like to go first? Or? I, I can I can I can kick off if you want. No, right, right. Okay. Seeing as you're on mute, um, I, I think look, it, it's it's it starts off with actually having conversations. We're not even having these conversations in our community at the moment. Um, and I, I go back to the example I said. I, I, I talked earlier about the, the the compassion of our community when we when we talk about. And we're going to talk today about Afghanistan, which is not being, which is not being spoken about. Um, when we talk about these issues in, in our community, you see a response. We're an emotional community. We're a community that's committed to our faith, that's committed to 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 um, to, to, to to helping people in need. Uh, and and so, 
I've talked about some of the startling facts there, right? The, about, about how the global South, about how these communities that are most vulnerable are being impacted by climate change. If we start talking about this, we will get the attention of our community. The changes that we've out, that we've outlined, right? We've many really outlined some of them. There's lots that we can do as a community to help to 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 reduce harmful emissions into the earth. They're not expensive changes. They really aren't. Um, of course, moving to an electric car, yes, that is that is probably expensive at this moment in time. Um, but th there are other alternatives you could do. Like I said about moving to moving to a more vegetarian diet. That. It's cheaper, if anything, right? It's 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 also very good for you. Very good for you. Walking, cheaper. You're you you know you're you're expending you're spending less less money on fuel, uh, by 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 helping by having a more sort of uh, a, a, a conscious effort to try and ensure that your light switch is turned off. Again, these are all helping to reduce uh, our our energy bills, right? So, if anything, I don't think it's more expensive. It's just we we just need to inculcate that understanding, and that starts with discuss, that starts starts with dialogue, and that's why we wanted to get the masjids on board. Um, so once the um, uh, once the the masjids are on board, that's where the majority of the community congregate, right? That's where they come together. One khut, khutbah talking about climate change can have a huge impact. If you start, the masjid start to, you know, the, the community start to see solar panels going up, they'll start to ask questions about what, 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 what why, why, what, what impact does that have on, 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 the, on, the, on the masjid? We start to see signs within the masjids about how we need to be careful about eating meat or like, or using less plastic during Ramadan, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These will all help to inculcate understanding in our community and you'll find, and, and, by the grace of Allah, even just some of the, 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 the changes that I've outlined, they are not difficult to, to do. They really aren't. And think about this. Uh, and again, I, I talk about this because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fundraiser and I'm a charity worker. But, you know, we, when we talk about a crisis, people are willing to honestly empty their banks to help, to help people in need. Right. And, you know, we, we love, we love uh, uh, wealth is something important to us. Right. Uh, and, but we're willing to give our wealth to help people in need, right? To, to help change their, their situation. All we have to do, we're not asking for welfare. We're just asking them to change their behaviors, to change some behaviors. And I think that we can do that by, by first starting the dialogue. Uh, and, and there's no better place to start that dialogue than in masjids where the majority of our community come together and, and where there is that respect for the pulpit, for the imams. If they can start that conversation, I think it will have a huge impact. Zara, if I can just add, because I'm conscious of the time, but we've got another session coming. Um, I, I just feel that what we need to understand is that we've got the climate catastrophe upon us. We've yes. got years. Um, the UN has said in, in 2030, um, you know, is the sort of cutoff point that they're saying that we need to achieve you know, uh, um, 1.5 and then you know, try and go down. But um, the thing is that, you know, we have no time. We haven't got time to think about it. We just need to act on that now. And I think it's, you know, you, people like yourselves at MCB and Islamic Relief and other institutions, I think it's about collaboration and working together and making things, um, you know, being thought leaders um, and making things things bite size for our communities marketing it well yeah yeah to understand uh, um what you know the implications of no action and the implications of you know acting you know taking uh, small steps as well as walking lightly on this earth you know um i think i think that's absolutely crucial and, and jazakallah for that for that term climate emergency we have to inject that sense of urgency jazakallah khair. thank you so much I want to thank both our uh, Dr. Husna and Brother Tufail for your presentations. Um, five, ten years ago, we just talked about climate change and everyone knew that it's something that we should be thinking about, about the emergency. Alhamdulillah, thanks to both of you, you know, we can see that the work is getting done. There's practical changes and Glasgow Central Mosque is a beautiful example of that. And I'm sure there are comments over here, people asking that, you know, where they could get resources. I'm sure if they contact Islamic Relief UK, or yourself, Dr. Husna, will be able to provide the theoretical and practical knowledge they need to help them take it further. Uh, just wanted to highlight a point by the Brother Shadim Hussein, uh, CEO of uh, My Foster Family, uh, who's a great friend of the MCB as well. And you're all part of the MCB, so you know we're all guilty over here. No one, is, no one's getting off innocent of being a member of this organization. If we go down, we're taking everyone with us. Um, so. <laughs> Why is it if we go up, we're taking everybody? We'll go up. Yeah, yeah, if we go up. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
but we're all we're all in this uh, in this uh, 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 boat together. And it's important for he he made a point. He said it's important for local council of mosques and mosques themselves and the umbrella organizations to participate in the discussions at a local level. So important because uh, often, uh, as Dr. Hussain was saying, there's no Muslim voice in that room. And if we if we take that step forward, we'll find that it's actually somewhere that people really appreciate it. It's brilliant, not just brilliant dawah, but we can actually um, uh, leverage all the positives that Brother Tapel was mentioning we have in our community. So Jazakallah Khairan, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm sure this is just the beginning, not the end of the discussion. <laughs> We're going to be starting the next session in uh, 60 seconds, which will give anyone just enough time to turn off their camera and take a comfort break. Go get yourself a cup of tea. Or if you've had your cup of tea, go to the toilet. Whatever else you need to do, we don't need to know. But just relax for a full 60 seconds. I will keep talking because um, silence scares me somewhat. So um, uh, is there anything that you wanted to add to Cesara while everyone's taking their I break? I think you've been, doing, you've been doing great. And I think, Thank mashallah, we had, that was such a fantastic um, session. I think for all, um, you know, for all of us, the conversation on the environment is so pertinent and so important. And so I was just really glad that we could make that a central part of our discussion today and hopefully a, a good source of inspiration for everybody as well. That is thinking about, um, you know, what can we do? How can we improve? And, and what are the barriers and how can we overcome them? Both Tufel and Dr. Husna are really leading um, in the space. And so hopefully though, there'll be many more as well to lead um, in that regard too, inshallah. Inshallah. And everything they've done is open source, which is beautiful, right? Like this is not like a trade secret. They're saying, come take what we've done and replicate it in your mosque. You might not want to get to the solarization level uh, yet, but there's other things, you know, steps that you can take on your way there, and they're willing to help. So that's brilliant, mashallah. Um, I think yeah, a bit of a shout out to all the moms making dal, right? <laughs> yeah. We gotta go veg. I was at that vegetarian dinner, and um, there was food disguised as meat. <laughs> but uh, yeah, did you bit in? I think there was. A, it was so, great though. So it just goes to prove our mothers were right all along. Yeah, um, so we'll start our next session on time, inshallah. Um, and I just want to introduce this session. This session is on diversity and inclusion, um, something that we really want to champion, inshallah, and take to the next level. Um, it's focusing on women, young people, those with disabilities, minority groups, and our mosques. And uh, we want to, uh, I want to introduce our session chair, that's uh, our Secretary General, Sister Zara Muhammad, and she will be taking off from here. And the main sponsor for this session today is Islamic Relief, um, who are really championing, uh, championing diversity and inclusion, not only in our mosques, but at a policy level at the UN. They've been doing some fantastic work there as well. Uh, over to you, Sister Zara. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wajid. Um, and I'm really, really excited about this session, probably my secret favorite. Uh, but I'm wearing green, so the environment is still still very much a part of, of all of it. And, and there's some stuff on safety and security about mosques, which I think will be important too. But really, this session is about amplifying the voices of the diversity in our community. And in particular, I, I think giving a space, a very much needed space for difficult conversations, challenging conversations, but also inspirational work. You know, as I've been traveling up and down the country, um, I've had the opportunity to meet some of these organizations that are really leading a path where there hasn't been one, whether that is in encouraging and inspiring young girls into sports and leadership, whether it's about strengthening the work within their own community, whether it's simply being a woman in a, a position of leadership in which there aren't very many women. Um, and I know that, you know, some of these women have had to come overcome so many ba ba barriers and obstacles, I guess, um, which I can definitely resonate to. So I'd like to introduce our first um, speaker of the session, um, Marian Hassan, who is the former MOS, MOS trustee of COED. I'll give her a quick introduction and I think she's gonna delight us with some presentation and, and I guess some of her experiences and some advice for all of us on how we can be more inclusive. And Mariam is currently undertaking her master's degree in faith-based leadership with the University of Birmingham. Last month, she completed her term as a trustee at a council of 17 European MOS. Uh, she was also a trustee at her local mosque between September 2018 to Feb 2021. And she's trained instructor for mental health first aid and a co-director of Revive VSG. 
So Mariam, you've not really had a, an easy time <laughs> in the community circuit. Uh, and certainly being a trustee um, and on ma most management boards, where I'm sure there wasn't that many ladies proved to be an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. There are it, it, it <laughs> ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we are so delighted on behalf of the Muslim Council Britain to have you with us. I'm going to hand it over to you to share, I guess, some of your reflections and learnings. This whole session is really about giving our members, our audience and our guests a real insight as to how we need to build our communities, what works, but also how we can look ahead. And, and hopefully you'll be able to add a little piece in that puzzle as to community building. So I'll pass it over to you, Mariam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Um, just to uh, say, can you see my slides? Yes, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm extremely thankful uh, to the Almighty uh, for giving this opportunity to be able to be worthy of being here. But also, I'm really um, grateful to all of you for taking the time out to, the, uh, to listen to me. I, I uh, just wanted to... Um, uh, give a brief introduction uh, and, and Zara was really kind to do so. My name is Mariam Hassam and I'm currently undertaking uh, uh, my master's degree in faith-based leadership at the University of Birmingham and I will try to use uh, uh, some of my insights uh, from my lived experience as a trustee and also from the learning of the course that I've been undertaking uh, to talk about women in mosques, the leadership roles and also just uh, sort of highlighting and touching upon the improving accessibility uh, to mosques. Um, it was around this time, three years ago, that I was wrapping up my four year term as principal at uh, Madrasa of our mosque, that I came across this opportunity um, of becoming a trustee for my local mosque. And before um, uh, taking this on, I was thinking, why? Um, uh, and, and just a sort of uh, sort of resonating and thinking about why would I want to take this up? Like when this opportunity landed, I was thinking I've been serving the grassroots for the last uh, four years and it's been really fulfilling. Um, was it absolute um, a madness or was I absolutely crazy to give this all up um, for politics, uh, to sit on the management board? Also questions like, would it be a good use of my time? Here I'd like to pause um, and highlight the important question of why, in a broader sense, there are two questions that I'd like to put out there. Why, from a woman's perspective, why should a successful woman give their time when she has a family, she may be working, studying, maybe running a household, or to be a trustee at a mosque? There are so many places to invest her time. Why consider this? And also on the flip side, on the other side, why should a mosque board consider live, uh, uh, inviting women to sit on the board? What can she offer? Is her time not well spent amongst the other tours and other roles and other responsibilities that she has? Is her role uh, more, um, more important within women, within subcommittees, um, in her home and in her career? Is there any need for her to come into the mosque space? either for accessibility or as a trustee. Personally, there was a distinct moment which helped me make up my mind. At the AGM, we had a session on addressing the gender balance. There were more than 95% of the room were male. On my table, the group had a discussion on how men had female bosses at work, how their daughters had the freedom to go to university, and how both genders shared equal rights. In the absence of female trustees in the room, was this because women didn't want to take the role on or was there barriers elsewhere? That made me pause really hard. It really made me think, I have this feeling inside me that what they was, were saying seemed to be true, but what was it that was making me pause personally and think before accepting the role? After reflection, for me, it boiled down to three, these three things. Generally, in Islamic organizations where I had worked and served uh, for a lot of years, I struggled to have a voice. I found it hard to being heard when I did finally speak up. 
And also, I sometimes felt that I didn't have choice, that I was told what to do rather than being given a choice of um, things that I could choose to do. I thought that if I wanted to make a change, I would have to take this role on and work on these things to make a difference for a wider good. On the second question, on why should board members consider inviting women onto the board? Why should it be on the leadership agenda? It is my humble opinion that one of the reasons why mosques should consider inviting women into trusteeship and address accessibility to mosques is that we have complex challenges in our external environment. Challenges such as youth challenges, mental health issues, drug use, gang culture, which are prevalent in our country or communities, and the solutions are not simple. We need to grapple with these. We need to include women in our discussions, in decision making, to value their unique knowledge of solutions and partner with them as agents of change. At our university discussions, it has been highlighted many a times that it is many times easier to build a mosque from scratch keep ourselves busy uh, as a board of trustees with the construction, with all the things that come with construction. But it, that is easier than it, it is to sit with these hard, wicked problems of our times whose solutions are complex. We need diverse teams to be able to sit and think about and try and explore what are some of the solutions to these um, issues and challenges of our day. The second reason I think it's really important for board members of the mosque to invite women onto their uh, boards is that we need to engage with women and solve accessibility challenges to re uh, because it's important for us to realize that if we want to keep mosques relevant and applicable, we need to engage with women. They are an integral part of our community and we need to constantly engage with their skills and talents as well as their challenges. We have an amazing pool of talent and skill amongst our women community. There are so many youngsters and young women whose talent, talents we don't have access to since they choose to donate their time elsewhere. If they do not belong, then mosques aren't relevant in their lives since there isn't a space for them. And as wards, this is a big loss as mosques and as communities. We therefore do need to think about um, the, the, this important, very important issue. Okay, needless to say, I, I agreed to both trustee positions. So being trustee was a learning curve. Um, I think uh, Zara very kindly mentioned that it was a lot of skills that you need to sort of um, learn and uh, use uh, to, to sort of be able to take on this role as a trustee. I'd like to highlight some of my insights and just some of the criteria and skills that I thought were really important. The first one was being uh, agile. It was really important uh, that uh, that flexibility and being able to listen and understand and therefore to be able to move in an uh, agreed direction. Another role of the trustee was strategizing with the board, looking at the bigger picture, what we need, wanted to add value what was of value, find direction, have goals, um, and a plan to how to get there. These are some of the skills that need time to be developed. And I'd like to say that we should give ourselves at that time. We won't know the answers to everything, but that's fine, we're human. Learning, evolving, and accepting and owning our mistakes is extremely empowering, but a very steep curve as well. Lots of discussions at the board level included the organization's constitution. It might, and it was quite scary for me uh, at first, but you slowly get the hang of how it is applied and then what it means in real terms. And what I've always found in meetings is that there's always an expert on the team that knows the constitution inside out. We don't all need to be experts, but we do know, need to know where it's found, how to build on it, and take decisions according to how it's sort of outlined. Exploring what is the best interest of the organization 
can be quite challenging at times. Having a board which has different views of what, how and what to do to move forward might require really um, keep, and keeping that interest of the organization at the heart of it might mean challenging conversations, which might not always be easy. I think it was really important um, having a rough idea what I wanted to deliver from my role. Uh, why was I on it was a really important thing to know from the onset. Uh, and also building on that experience that I already had on a leadership uh, role within my madrasa, within other committees, within, uh, within other things that I did outside in my life was also really helpful, I thought. So accept any opportunity to lead, deliver on projects be before becoming a trustee really helps in preparing you for some of these skills. Two of the tools that really helped me uh, was having access to a mentor, sort of being able to uh, discuss uh, and, and uh, sort of uh, bounce around ideas, around opinions and concepts, having a mentor to reflect through questions without dictating what needed to be done was extremely empowering. Having access to like-minded team was really important as well. I thought those two things really helped me on my journey. On the flip side, from my experience and learning, a skill that is important as chair or lead of the board is really creating that culture. A lot of times um, leadership means being able to hear everyone's view rather than being able to dictate. So when we do have um, a diverse team as board of trustees in our mosques and in our communities, then I think it's as a chair, as the chair of the board, and as uh, the leader of, of this group of people, it is really important to create that culture whereby everyone's view, everyone's perspective is heard um, and then the decision is created. I'd like to highlight um, uh, it's sort of some of uh, sort of what, we, uh, what I was able to do or some of those um, strategies that we were able to put into practice. One of them, like I mentioned at the AGM, was to find out what was the, some of the barriers that female were facing in leadership roles. And we were able to uh, create a survey where we had a lot of responses from both male and female to think about what it was in our communities and how could we address the balance. We looked at what an inclusive dynamic uh, community would look like by having fo focus groups uh, and, and like I said, having a, a, a questionnaire whereby we got more than 300 people respond from all parts of uh, Europe. And we were able to uh, put up a document and, and uh, sort of address some of those things that were important and that we could focus on um, as we, we moved uh, as, uh, as a committee, as a trustee group. Also, um, another project that I'd like to sort of highlight where, where I was able to make an impact and sort of just, just for highlighting that as a women trustee, we are able to make those differences that we want. But when I go back to what I said originally, would I be able to make a difference? Was I using, was this a good use of my time? When, when the pandemic hit, uh, mental health was a really important on our strategy. And we were able to um, look into projects, look into programs, look into communities and how we could help and support those around us. We were able to engage with imams of the mosque, uh, sort of train them up with mental health and the adults. So this is just a quick list of some of the things that we were able to do in that year of March 2020, from March 2020. Um, that we were able to report of thinking about bereavement, thinking about um, also children's book, uh, which was quite a nice take around questions that children might have when they were in quarantine. Um, and, and this is sort of, I, I think, just an impact or just a, a way of just showing what it is, what is available and what we can do as female trustees in our, in, in our mosques and in our organization. I just finished my role as a trustee uh, in the mosque earlier this year and in the council just in October. And as a mosque to, a trustee, I just wanted to highlight um, that this year, uh, after there was a new, uh, new team of trustees elected in, the constitution was changed and the number of female trustees required to be on the board increased from two to four women. And this is proof 
that external and internal environment influences can change our communities and the way our governance works, the way our rules work. So it's really important to, and, and that means more, more support for women out there so that there's a wider group of women that are out there that can make those decisions, that can learn from each other, that can be supported uh, with each other. So I just wanted to also highlight that um, this uh, impact that we were able to uh, do from, from internally, um, as, as well as all those external influences out there, all those voices of all those women speaking up, uh, wanting to be part of um, this journey as well. Lastly, even though I've been highlighting and talking about uh, women trustees, I, I, I'm a general believer that we need to do this journey together. And that's why even our survey, we didn't only send it out to women, but it was open to everyone because we need to hear everyone's voice and we need to be on this journey together as allies within our communities. For the young girls and women out there, I want to end with something from Brené Brown, who's a, one of those readers, uh, one of those authors that I read a lot. She always has quite a lot of wisdom and um, insights. Uh, other things that she talks about is a leading, a daring to lead, um, vulnerability, shame, trust. And as she was asked this question around, um, it's been said that all great people can have lives that can be summed up in one sentence. And what would yours be? Um, she said, I would want it to read that she contributed more than she criticized. Um, and I think that is what um, the message that I would like to end with, that as women in the community, we do need to continue contributing. We need to find those ways of contributing into our mosques to make them places where everyone belongs. And lastly, before I just end, I would also like to highlight how education and, uh, and, and university and the course that I'm on has also made, taken a really prevalent way of how I see things. I did the roles before I had the, uh, the, the theory behind it. And also for those of you who are really interested, I'd really like to give a really big shout out to the faith-based leadership that I'm on on the University of Birmingham. Uh, it's an apprenticeship and it, it is one of those courses that really highlight um, and what we need in our communities with uh, taking faith together with leadership. Thank you, Jazakallah. Uh, thank you for this. Thank you so much, Mariam. That was excellent, mashallah, and just such a fantastic insight, really honest reflection in your demeanor and sharing <laughs> what must have been a very challenging experience was brilliant. We am absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. And we'll come back to you in the Q&A. Um, but thank you again for your honesty and also for your hard work and perseverance. I'd like to bring on our next guest, inshallah. Um, I guess what we call a bit of a name twin, although it's a Zahra <laughs> this time around. So assalamualaikum, uh, Sister Zahra. Um, just to give you a short introduction, Sister Zahra is going to be talking about how to make mosques and madaris inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, Zahra is currently working part-time at Sen Cohen in Islamic School in London. She has completed a Master's in Psychology of Education at UCL and is currently also completing a Master's in Islamic Studies. She's the co-founder of Amanati and is passionate about raising awareness for special needs and disabilities within British, British Muslim communities. So thank you so much for joining us today um, and we look forward to your presentation on again what is a critical topic about making not just inclusive spaces, but ones that are really accessible and welcoming for all. I'll pass it over to you now, Zahra. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. Um, thank you so much for having me. So today I'm gonna to be talking about how we can make mosques and madrasas inclusive and accessible for individuals with disabilities. So firstly, I'm going to start off by giving a definition of disability and the, pre the prevalence of disability in um, the UK, particularly in the Muslim, amongst Muslims. And then we're going to look at what exactly is the problem? Is there a problem and what is it? I'm then going to introduce you to a survey that we carried out at Amanity. We're going to look at some real life accounts um, of challenges faced in mosques. And we're going to think about how we can move forward and what exactly mosques and madrasas can do to make um, them more inclusive and accessible for individuals with disabilities. 
So firstly, what is a disability? So the Equality Act defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on a person's ability to do normal daily activities. So I think there's two important parts of that definition to note there. Firstly, that is a long-term, so usually defined as 12 months or more. And secondly, that it affects normal daily activities that we may, for example, take for granted. Um, disability um, includes a wide variety of things. So it includes physical um, disability, disabilities, such as, for example, um, being a wheelchair user, but also medical conditions. It includes cognitive deficits, for instance, sensory difficulties, and also communication and language. So it's a wide variety of things. So to look at a statistic, a statistic, 35% of Muslims in England and Wales identify as having a long-standing physical or mental impairment, illness, or disability. So I think it is, it's clear that um, it's a lot, that is a large proportion of Muslims in um, England and Wales. And so this just highlights the importance of this issue and being able to identify what challenges these individuals and their fam families may face in most in madrasas and how we can go about um, overcoming them. So what is the problem? Is there a problem? So I've done a bit of research on this and I found that um, there are a few studies and it, you know, I think I want to highlight and emphasize on the word a few because we do need so much more um, that show that there is a lack of inclusion and accommodation uh, for individuals with disabilities in a mosque around the world in countries such as Canada, US, Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. And I just want to note there that I didn't actually find um, a study looking at the challenges that they face in um, the UK. Um, also, I didn't find studies um, looking at medicines in particular. So I think it's also something really interesting that came up in these studies were that stigma plays a really important role in um, acting as the barrier for individuals with disabilities and families in attending mosques and medicines. So stigma is to be things like ignorance of the disability or certain stereotypes that people might hold or discrimination and prejudice. And although clearly Islam holds up, um, you know, promotes positive attitude towards disability, cultural beliefs and practices sometimes override this in our community. So for example, you know, the view that um, evil spirits, you know, have caused disabilities and that can create um, stigma and a committability to boot in the community. And something also that I wanted to note here is um, something known as the perception gap, which is the difference between the attitude of um, individuals um, without disabilities and the actual lived experiences of individuals with disabilities. So this statistic is um, shows this. So one in three disabled people feel that they face a lot of prejudice, whereas only one in five non-disabled people say there is a lot of prejudice towards disabled people. So I think why this is important is that just because we don't notice the um, prejudice or the challenges that we face, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And, um, and I think raising awareness about this is the first step towards creating that change. So in Amanity, we really wanted to um, find out more about the challenges and to be able to identify them and think about how we can start improving them. So we cried out seven, and we wanted to look at, um, we looked at mosques and Islamic centers in particular. Um, and we wanted to see, we wanted to ask how inclusive um, and accessible people thought that they were. So we conducted it in summer 2020. We had just over 100 responses, so not too much, but a good amount. Um, it was very simple. We did it via Google Forms, so and it was literally like two minutes. And we, that's why we, we, we purposely did that, because we know we knew that people are busy and we just we wanted to get as much responses as possible. And we distributed it via social media and the word of mouth. And um, there were both closed end questions and open ended questions. So our main finding was that 76.6% of individuals disagreed or strongly disagreed with the claim that enough was being done by Muslim communities to make their places of worship accessible and inclusive to people of all abilities. So that is a very large percentage. And we then, uh, with the open-ended questions, we asked about their experiences, people's experiences, and what they noticed. And we found that people identified physical barriers uh, to be present in mosques, 
such as, for example, no wheelchair accessible. Also, and consistent with, with the previous research that I had done, that social barriers also exist in the form of stigma. Um, and this can be both subtle and un unconscious discrimination. So, for example, um, you know, someone entering the mosque and, you know, you staring at them. Okay, that can make the person feel very uncomfortable. And, um, and then you also have more overt form of discrimination. So for example, explicitly telling someone, uh, you know, someone's child, autistic child, for example, who might be making a lot of noise to leave, for instance. But subtle and unconscious discrimination can be um, just as bad or even worse than overt form because it occurs more frequently and is harder to identify and challenge. So we found that the, this has devastating emotional impact on disabled individuals and their families. And it meant, it, it meant that many families felt, felt like that they couldn't attend um, mosques for this reason. So I thought it would be interesting to look at um, two real life accounts to actually see in detail what someone's experience was like. So one person here says, my sister has learning disabilities and, it's, and is on the autism spectrum. When interacting with the community, whether in places of worship or generally, accompanied by my sister, I often have people ask me questions about her in front of her as though she was invisible. Sometimes these questions are hurtful. Is your sister sick? Other times they are just queries about my sister's life, progress at school, etc. but still directed to me. I think people feel awkward and or wrongly assume she doesn't understand or wouldn't be able to respond to them. More awareness is what our community is. And another real life account, someone says, when I have to use a wheelchair, my family members have to lift my wheelchair for me to enter the center as there is no ramp. The center has a ramp, but, is, but it's in a locked office, which is of no use. Then I am unable to go on the carpet, so my family members have to lay out for me to go on. All the while, people are staring at me. I also cannot pull the doors open as they are too heavy. Also, I have been unable to attend during Muharram and Ramadan for the last two years because it is physically impossible when there are so many people present and no space for a wheelchair. And it gets so stuffy that I get breathing difficulties as the woman's room is a tiny room with no ventilation or no windows. Also, once a blind girl came to our center and because everyone was so cramped, people kept touching her and she was so scared as a result. A couple of kids then started touching her more because they were intrigued, but the little girl couldn't get away because, because we're all so squashed together and there wasn't a way to move. So I think when you actually listen to these experiences, it is actually really, um, I think it's really powerful to listen to. And because sometimes you might not realize how difficult it is for these individuals, for these individuals when they feel pending on. Um, so, what can be done about it? So, first of all, it's important to note that according to the Equality Act, in the UK, public places of worship and schools, where they're maintained or independent, are required to make adjustments to reduce all kinds of barriers that disabled individuals face. So, by law, we are required to make our um, centres and madrasas accessible and um, inclusive. But more importantly than that, Islam promotes equality. And those with disabilities should be treated with dignity and respect. And we need to think about ways of reducing the barriers that they face so that they can feel more welcome in mosques and madrasas and they can benefit from the same services that all others do. So when I analyzed the data, I categorized them into four themes about how we can think about how we can reduce um, the challenges. So firstly, the first thing we can do is um, adapt our program. So by, for example, providing sign language, so using subtitles, having shorter lectures, separate family rooms, for example, or providing earmuffs to block out loud noises. Another thing we can do is educating and raising awareness in the Muslim community. And I think it's so, something so important, and this, this links to um, reducing the stigma in our community. So the more we educate and the more we raise awareness and so people are actually informed about disabilities and so that the prejudice so that the stereotypes for instance is reduced and then we can you know that is a very important step in showing that they are 
socially included and feel and they feel welcome. So this can be done, for example, in the form of courses, workshops, training volunteers and staff, or teaching sign language, for example. Another thing we can do is actually having a person-centered approach and ensuring that those with disabilities themselves are able to contribute and collaborate within the um, mosque itself. And um, so for example, the part of the committee, or um, so we really need to listen to their voices and put them at the forefront. Um, and finally, the last, um, the last thing that we can do is with regard to the physical barriers, having adjustments made. So such as using ramps, lifts, accessible bathrooms, disabled parking spaces, ensuring that indoor spaces are large enough um, and with sufficient ventilation, ensuring doors, for instance, are not too heavy, having safer heating, and um, making adjustments to the sound system. So things that, um, some of these things are obviously, you know, more simple and easier to implement and others will take a long time to actually, um, to actually do. Um, to end, and I want to, I know I haven't spoken about madrasas a lot, um, I've spoken more about mosques, but with regard to madrasas, I think the same can be applied to what we've just mentioned about mosques, the adjustments that can be made, but also when we're thinking about schools in particular, um, we move to the term special educational needs, because it's all about learning, the teaching and learning process. So special educational needs um, is basically an individual, a person that has special educational needs is an individual that has learning difficulties which require special educational provision. So, and this, and when we're thinking about including these individuals in these students um, or these children in the classroom, we're not just thinking about having them, you know, having them present there. It's not just about that. It's also about the teacher actually making changes and adjustments to the way, for example, that they teach, to their teaching methods, to the content that they are, um, you know, that they are teaching, um, you know, particular, ensuring particular learning strategies that meet the, that individual. So, and, you know, when we're thinking about inclusion, the overall aim um, is to reduce both physical and social barriers. So I think that's a really important point to note. Um, I think that is it. So I just want to thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions in the Q&A section. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jazaka, Kira, Zahara. That was uh, an excellent presentation. And I think what you really highlighted there is about raising people's consciousness. And actually, there's so many practical things you can do right now. It doesn't cost money. It just takes a bit of effort and willingness. So I really look forward to having you on in the Q&A. And thank you for an excellent presentation. I can already thank see you. some people in the chat resonating with what you're talking mm -hmm. about. So we'll certainly do thank our best you. in the end to push it out there into the masses. Um, I'm gonna now bring in our next speakers, or speakers, I should say, but we'll, we'll start with one and then I invite the other. Um, and a, a really up and coming favorite organization of mine, although they don't give me enough time in the MCB to join, <laughs> but I'm delighted to have here Sister Hafiza Patel, a board member of Muslim Sports Association. And we'll also be joined by Reha Ullah, who I'll introduce shortly after this presentation. Um, Hafiza Patel and her love for sports and understanding the benefits that it provides physically and mentally inspired to help set up the Muslim Sports Association uh, with Yasmin Harun, uh, Harun, Chair and CEO of MSA. She's an independent non-executive director at Essex Football Association and leads their inclusion advisory group. In her day job, uh, she works as an assistant finance director at City University of London. Hafiza also represents the university while acting as the governor for the City of London Ac Academy in Islington, which is the local primary school in the university which the university supports. She's also a global visiting lecturer in accounting and finance and teaches a master's program both in London and in Athens. So uh, a lot. <laughs> and today she's going to be talking to us with Rahar about um, the importance of inclusion of girls in sports um, as well as at MOS too. So I'll pass it over to you, Hafiza, and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Um, thank you very much, Zara. Thank you very much, uh, MCB, for inviting us today and giving us the platform today. That introduction in fact, sounded far better than it actually is. Uh, it just sounded quite grand. Thank you very much anyway. Um, so what we want to do today, um, I'm going to try and share my screen first of all. And can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah, great. 
Okay, um, so to, um, uh, first of all, let me introduce you to my colleague. Uh, together with Reha, we're going to be talking about um, what Muslim Sports do, how we started, what we can, what, what challenges we had when we started, what, what, how we overcome our challenges, and then Reha will talk to you uh, a little bit about what success stories we've had around the um, our journey so far, and really more importantly to talk about what MOS can do to support us in what we need to do. Is that is that coming through okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so who is Muslim Sports Association? Um, we, a group of trustees really, um, Reha, my colleague, she's here today, um, and did you want to do the introduction for her, Zara? It's probably easy if you do that yeah, I was now. Say, sorry, I thought you were speaking separately, but yeah. No, we, we, it's quite it. joint, we're together. So Ruha has a background in law and is the legal secretary at MSA. Uh, she's multifaceted skill set and leads on the safeguarding and welfare um, at the Muslim Sports Association. She currently is a project manager at British Fencing and Street Tag, as well as a part-time teacher at Lady Aisha Academy. Reha joined the association in 2016 as a trustee and she went on to become a coach for football, fencing, an activator of tennis and badminton and recently instructor for archery and boxercise. Reha was integral in setting up the girls football team by building trustworthy relationships with our players. She keeps the organization moving in lockdown by managing the MSA Sports for Good initiative. Reha was honored in the Queen's birthday honors list in 2021 and awarded a medal for her services to sport and community. Um, absolutely incredible and so delighted to have you both on and congratulations Reha. Okay, Reha you still on mute. Okay. Thank you Zara. Again a very elaborate introduction. Okay, um, so um, Muslim Sports, Sports Association really started because but Yasmin and I wanted to play basketball. We were attending a basketball club and it was great. It was just women coming together, had a safe space. The women who we were playing with were Muslim. They could take their scarves off and feel, feel comfortable. But when the organization stopped providing that facility, we still wanted to carry on playing. So we thought, okay, well, let's do this ourselves. We managed to raise enough money so that we could bring in coaches ourselves, find the right facilities, and we started running basketball ourselves. Um, it worked really well, huge feedback from the participants saying how good it was. And then next we had somebody saying, well, can we do this for badminton as well? So yeah, why we did the same model. We, we you know, we found it, we found enough participants so we could afford to pay for the trainers and then we managed to pay for the venue as well. Next, we went into football because that's what the need was. When we introduced football, that's when things started to snowball. The interest was huge. You know, if you look at the number of sisters and girls that want to do football today, it's massive. The demand was huge. We also got the attention of BBC Sports, BBT Sports, and they were interested in what we were doing as well. The FA approached us and asked us, would you be interested in training up some of our coaches? So yeah, uh, it just snowballed from there. And because our activity was there, people could see what we were doing. We then had other funding bodies approaching us. And even the girls that were working with us, they said, oh, what about, you know, archery? What about fencing? So yeah, that's how we started, quite basic, but actually we then grew. If you look at what we do today, we do rowing, we do archery, fencing, cycling, the activities that we, I certainly didn't have access to when I was younger. And we've now got the ability to provide this for sisters and um, it's working really well. The feedback that we're getting is fantastic. Um, it's again, again, you know, the different activities means we're, we have different sisters participating. So if you look at the yoga groups, you've got the elderly ladies participating predominantly in there. If you look at the karate, the, our youngest member there is eight years old. So, you know, it's it's really diverse and it's not restricted just to Muslim women, but we do ensure that the environment is safe for Muslim women. So, you know, they can take their hijab off and be comfortable doing so. Um, we'll make sure any, any of our windows that we have are, are covered. So that ensures that we still get continued participation. Let me hand you over to Reha. She'll tell you a little bit about um, our challenges that we've had whilst trying to introduce sports to women and how we've overcome those challenges. Sorry, so some of the challenges we faced um, were in fact 
sisters finding out that there are sessions going on um, in their locality. And the other, other challenges were costs. So we tried our best to keep ourselves competitive and we usually subsidize our sessions. Um, the other main concern was safety and security of the sisters. So at the, at the venue and if there were going to be any men around, so all of those were concerns and we tried our best to uh, eliminate each one. Um, and we make sure that all our venues are secure, they are private and that they have female coaches and the security guard and the venue management are aware of our requirements and they um, strictly adhere to those. Um, one of the other things that is quite a, a personal thing is that women tend to be um, the homemakers. So when it comes to them having to choose between coming on and staying active or staying back at home uh, for family chores, they choose to stay at home. So again, um, that's something that we, we still face. Um, and, and we understand that that is a responsibility women have. Um, so those are some of the challenges uh, the women face when <clears throat> trying to access um, sports and, um, and uh, other fitness activities. Um, however, we do have uh, some amazing stories come out of all the sessions that we've been um, putting on. Um, we have Yasmin Hussein, um, who started uh, off with myself as a football coach, and then she went on to coaching the uh, Frankfurt and MSA Football Club, and she actually coaches uh, most of the week now. And just last week, she was awarded um, the BT Sports Action Woman Award for Community Awards. Um, she is actually in that picture somewhere. There she is, alhamdulillah. Um, and we have many other success stories, um, women who have been uh, uh, homemakers and stayed home most of their lives, raising their children, giving up their jobs, and they've started to come out and take part in the activities that we put on, and it's really helped empower them, gain their confidence, their self-esteem, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to see these women come out of their shells and come out emerging as beautiful butterflies. We've, um, yeah, carry on. Yeah, carry on. Okay. So, I mean, what we're doing is being noticed. Um, we've, we've been put forward for a lot of awards and we've been winning a lot of awards in lots of different areas. I think but really what keeps us motivated, what keeps us driven is, is the feedback that we get from our sisters because what we're doing for them isn't just giving them an opportunity to play sports it's more than that we're allowing them to volunteer for us and that's actually them learning new skill sets and that's that's the feedback we get you know okay oh, that's great i'm running a session that's great experience for me or sometimes what we do is we train up our coaches so one of the things we found when we were running these sessions is we didn't have enough female coaches so we had to look at succession well where how do we get these female coaches how do you get these Muslim female coaches that actually understand what we want to do so we started to approach these governing bodies and now we've got to a point where actually the governing bodies are approaching us it's become you know we've become quite um pioneering what we've been doing so we asked the governing bodies to um support us get these coaches trained up. So the success story that I just mentioned about Yasmin, she was on the FA level one training course that we first introduced. And now she runs the sessions. That's given her a whole career. She, she's, she's a professional trainer and coach. Um, and we've done that with other ladies as well. Reha, I mean, she's coaches for a number of the activities that we run and that training she gained as part of MSA. Our new trustees, we, we provided um, leadership training for them. Um, what we need to do and what most of the women need to do is sort of get engaged with these national governing bodies, because the truth is there's an agenda out there at the moment. All boards, you know, board of directors need to be diverse. And that means at least 30 percent of them need to have women or gender ethnicity background around them. We're increasingly being uh, approached and being asked to represent, um, you know, either the female or the, the Muslim or the Asian person on that board. Like the sister said, Mariam said earlier, you know, grab those opportunities. It requires commitment and 
yes it does but you'll get so much back in return that's the reality so approach them get on those boards if you haven't got the confidence to be on those boards get yourself some training there's tons of training out there at the moment because they recognize there aren't enough female muslim leaders um, who have the right um, training background so get yourself onto a training course we talked about mentor get yourself on a mentor get yourself a mentor or actually if you're at my age and you're ready to be a mentor then invest your time in mentoring some of these girls that do have the time to actually spend time on these boards um, yeah, so that's really, you know, work with these networks. But when you're sitting on these boards, one of the things I've learned that we, you know, that we share is you need a network uh, of women with similar experiences. Alhamdulillah, we use the MSA board uh, to sound each other off. So the, the other day, for example, Yashmin had a, a difficult question around um, LGBT and our position around LGBT and you know to talk that through with somebody else was was useful so get yourself into a network um, which allows you to talk that through MCB was great with us they gave us some media training when we needed that because you know these because our success in football meant we were getting a lot of media attention we didn't have those skills but you know MCB was able to give us that training when we needed it so the huge mashallah network of Muslim women Muslim just generally who are professional able and it's just tapping into those resources when you're sitting on the, when you're sitting on those boards one of the things i will say is it's about winning hearts and minds not just about sitting there not just about saying what you need to say it's about getting engagement telling the person on that board actually what's in it for them you sitting on that board them providing a diverse opportunity a diverse spot open to all nationalities and all races what's in it for them well it helps their bottom line it'll help them with the demand for their their sessions their activity it'll help them gain grants because there's a lot of grants out there at the moment funding sports um so you know show them demonstrate to them actually this is mutually beneficial for both of us um, let me hand over to Reha. Reha can talk a little bit more about the MOS and what the MOS community can do to help support um, women in sports as well. Okay, inshallah. Um, I just noticed somebody's hands up. Was that an accident or did the person want to say something? Reha will take in calls at the end. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Please continue. Okay. Okay, so what can mosques and community centres do to incorporate more sports um, activities for females? Um, well, the first thing I'd like to say before I answer that question, actually, is um, unfortunately for majority of the time, we found that mosques and uh, Muslim community centers haven't been very haven't been very receptive. Um, and up and down the country, I hear my coaches on the Muslim Girls Fence project that they usually get ignored um, by the mosques and the um, community centers, if not fobbed off. And there's also seems to be um, this is not for everyone. But for, for, for the most of the um, mosques that we've encountered, uh, there seems to be a, an appetite, a enthusiasm to promote boys um, boxing, for example. But there isn't the same enthusiasm for girls' um, self-defense. Um, so that's something that we've noted. Um, and we hope that these things can change. Um, having said that, we have in London had many success stories. We've worked with Al Medina in East London. We've worked with um, uh, Ilford Islamic Center and currently we're working with Al-Ansar Masjid in Good Maids, London as well. So there are masjids who have opened the doors and they are very supportive of what we do. And they give us the spaces usually at um, subsidized um, costs because we are a charity and they want for the community what we want for the community, especially our sisters. Um, so what we really need from the mosques and the community centers is some space. Um, uh, to be part and parcel of that community, to have an area where our sisters can go and learn new skills, um, stay fit and become part of a healthier community. Um, and, and that's what we really need. And to be honest, if we are true to our faith, I think we should see women occupying seats, positions, ranks, spaces where they are qualified and experienced to hold. So um, we'd be very, very grateful if the mosques and the Muslim communities allow us that opportunity and support us in that. I'm just going to hand it back to um, Hafiza. 
So, so Sakala, thanks, Zara. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Hopefully, we've told you the importance of sports. And uh, I'll just share a story with you before I do stop. Um, the other day, we actually, yes, last night, we went out for dinner. Um, and um, the men were in one room, the women were in the other room, just as it were a second occasion. I said to my husband at the end of the day, I said, what were you guys talking about? Oh, we just literally talked about football. We kind of took the rip out of each other. And actually, there was a point where we were talking about GDPR. Okay, um, what were you guys talking about? Uh, we were talking about the meaning of life. We were talking about death. We were talking about living with emptiness. There's diversity there is what I'm telling you. You know, we think differently, getting us on your boards at the mosque, you know, we will be beneficial. It's, it's, it's quite massive. You know, what we can do together is, is a lot better. So thank you very much, Zara. Thank you, Rahul. Well, Charlie, fantastic presentations, virtual chat for you. I'm sold anyway, so um, let us persevere, inshallah. And I think we, I'm sure we'll have loads of questions for both of you on the incredible work that you are doing in the Muslim Sports Association. I can already see lots of fans in the chat as well. Um, but I'm going to move on to our next guest. Um, who represents, I guess, an, an organisation, or should I call it a bit of a movement, <laughs> um, which many of us may have had some relationship with or are definitely familiar with their work as well. And um, so next speaker is actually um, Brother Yusuf El Tom, who's from the Muslim Scouts Fellowship. And he's going to be talking about the role of scouts at mosques and preparing for today's uh, youth to become tomorrow's leader. Yusuf is currently the manager of Muslim Scouts Fellowship and an active support unit. Having previously been a member of the operations committee, Yusuf will work closely with all members of the UK leadership team to succeed in his and their ambition to open up scouting to young people and adults from all backgrounds. He's in the process of the, in, the improvement manager for a national food company. He's also the manager of um, the Muslim Scouts Fellowship, a body within the UK Scouts Association. So it actually operates within the, the broader organization. And he's involved, been involved for 16 years and has led uh, teams nationally for the past 10. So we're completely um, delighted to have him here with us. And the Scouts now have over 6,000 Muslims involved. Um, and have recently taken on a secondary role as an equity advisor to support wider scout movements become more equitable. Um, so it's really, really quite a pleasure and an honor to have you with us, Yusuf. And I think you're gonna take our audiences through um, exactly how we can be more engaged and exactly the benefits of scouting too. So I'll pass it on over to you. Jazakallah khair, Zara. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, my name is Yusuf. I'm the manager of the Muslim Scout Fellowship, as I mentioned, um, and I also work with the Scout Association, um, supporting them um, in a race uh, equity role in terms of how we can support scouting, go to more communities across across the UK, uh, learning, I guess, from the experiences that we've had from a Muslim perspective. So just to start off with, I guess, um, so I've been asked to talk about today's youth, tomorrow's future, and I thought I'd just um, throw it out there that one of the things that we firmly believe in from a Muslim scout perspective is that our youth are not necessarily our future, but they're our presence. So it's not necessarily about um, waiting or, 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 or planning for, for, for the long term. We need to engage and work with our youth now. And the slides that I'm going to take you through in inshallah, um, they're kind of uh, two different elements to it. The first part where we'll talk about the issues that we face, our young Muslims face um, uh, in today's society. And the second part is how I believe that the Scouts movement is a movement that can support um, young people uh, within, within our society to overcome many of our challenges. So um, issues facing uh, the Muslim youth. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, the next four or five slides are quite bleak they are, um, they paint a reality of where we are as a society today. Um, and they cover four to five different um, topics that I will just touch upon, inshallah. The, the first one is around social mobility. So um, we understand that the experiences um, uh, within the Muslim community uh, when it comes to uh, economic disadvantage compared to uh, other groups in the UK, in particular when it comes to our young people, um, means that our young people are more likely um, than ever to to, to face um, disadvantages in that in that space, um, and that 46% of Muslims um, live in the top 10 most deprived local authority areas. This is in comparison to only 1.7 who may live in the top 10% least deprived uh, local authority areas. Um, the high proportion of Muslim youth um, or young people live in areas with the lowest performing schools. 
Um, so not just low performance when it comes to schools, but under resource health services and little to no extracurricular provisions um, available to them. This often leads to high rates of unemployment and disengagement from uh, our young people um, and uh, insufficient role models for them to try and engage with. Another factor is around crime and criminality. Three quarters of the boroughs in London have the highest level of violence offending um, are also in the top 10 most deprived areas. There are 80% more crimes are reported in those areas of high deprivation than in areas of least deprivation. And drugs and weapon offenses are three times more likely um, in areas of high deprivation. Research in 2018 found that UK prisoners with Muslim names had received 10% longer sentences. And a um, study by the Runnymede Trust, uh, Trust in 2017 found that Muslims are more likely to receive harsher treatment in prison, less access to education and vocational opportunities, and bettering themselves whilst in a correctional facility. The next area is around Islamophobia. We've been very fortunate. We've just come out with Islamophobia Awareness Month. The Muslim Scout Fellowship is very proud that we were um, participants in that and supported the campaign uh, in, in, along with the Scout Association. Um, however, the work in this space is more important and critical now than, than ever. Um, a survey in 2017 found that 33% of Muslim students reported Islamic phobic abuse in their places of study. We've obviously seen and, and very well documented by, by organizations such as MCB, the significant spike in attacks um, after major um, uh, incidents. Um, and the, uh, for example, after the, the London Bridge incident, hate crimes against Muslim communities um, increased fivefold. The, the, the kind of the impact on the Muslim identity piece as well. So we know that um, the Muslim identity is usually heavily emphasized when there's negative reporting and often left out when there's positive reporting when it comes to um, uh, an identity. Uh, racial profiling in public spaces, prevent scheme, um, punish a Muslim day, which happened a few years ago. And these are all things that our young people are growing up against and um, in terms of a backdrop and um, there's a, you know, they, they feel suspicion and hatred around what they see around them in society. And unfortunately, this leads to more young people trying to conceal um, their Muslim identity in order to try and fit in. Um, mental health um, is another big issue. Um, so in 2017, a report found that more than half of young British Muslims have suffered from depression, depression and 32% of young British Muslims have contemplated suicide. That's compared to a national average of 16% as a whole. Um, and we also know that it's less likely for Muslims to report such thoughts. So this number may, particularly, may, may be particularly higher. Um, in a 2019 Mental Health Act report, it says also four times more likely to be detained than white peers, um, yet amongst the lowest to receive care um, from a health, um, mental health perspective. And in 2020, um, the kind of impact of COVID on young people was very, very um, 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 clear, where the Muslim Health Helpline reported a 313% rise in calls. And this is um, you know, very clearly documented and, and talked about in terms of the impact of COVID-19 affecting our community. So that, I guess I just wanted to start there with um, our why. So why, why, are we, why, are we, why do we need to do something about um, supporting our Muslim youth? Why do we need to do something about um, our young people? Why do we need to give them the right support and development that they need? Um, and what, what we can do to support them? Um, what young people need. They, they need to be inspired, motivated and empowered. Um, we need to help them to build strong positive associations to our faith and our principles and positively reinforce their Muslim identity. They need to be proud and they need to feel like they are proud in their own skin, proud in their ident identity as Muslims and also as British um, citizens. Um, we need to give them skills, life skills that would help them throughout their lives um, experiences and opportunities that they will not get elsewhere and, and also give them role models and mentors that will help them through life's challenges. We, we know that these factors all have an impact on the um, uh, academic and professional attainments of, of, of young people and provide suitable after school activities that help keep them away from all the negative subcultures that exist around them. Uh, you know, we believe that scouting can provide all of this. And we have seen that scouting can do this for so many young people. Um, in particular, um, I want to emphasize the point that 
this is not a you know this issue with with young people and 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 the youth it's not necessarily something that one um solution will fix and scouting is not the be all and end all everything that we heard about so far today and the things that we've got coming to you know in the rest of this um conference today these are things that as a as a society as a muslim society we need to work collaboratively um and collectively to to try and address I'm just going to move on and talk about what is scouting. So scouting is a system for young people. Scouting is a system for young people that helps them develop from a very, very young age. We've just launched, the Scout Association has just launched its youngest ever section, 45 year old squirrels. Um, and um, you can see there, you move through the scouting system from a four year old all the way through to an, a 25 year old as a, as a um, network. Uh, member from the age of 18 when you finish what we call explorers essentially you're an adult leader and you can provide back to your community and your society so um it's a it's a holistic system that looks at developing young people physically socially mentally and spiritually um from the age of four all the way through to the age of 18 as they become adults and in, in adults they also enjoy the journey as a network member and and take part in scouting Scouting is the biggest and oldest um, volunteer-led movement in the world. Um, globally, there are 50 million scouts across the world. And uh, it will come to a surprise to many of you to, to understand that nearly 70%, over 70% of that 50 million globally are actually Muslims. So what, we, what we've kind of learned and realized is that scouting and Islam go hand in hand. The scouting in a Muslim community, in Muslim countries, is very, very popular in many countries. And um, as a proven and balanced program, it develops young people from a young age in a very um, uh, organic manner, if you like. We've helped set up over 100 Muslim scout groups in the um, UK so far. We have over 5,000 young people and over 2,000 adults involved in scouting. So the number is actually over 7,000 uh, Muslims involved in scouting across the UK um, today. And um, in line with, uh, I guess, you know, the, the, the subjects of this session around diversity um, uh, within, within our community, uh, what we found is that over 50% of the um, Muslim members involved in scouting are female. This is, this is way more than the average 25 to 30% that exists within the wider scouting movement. Um, and we have found that scouting provides a safe space and an opportunity for um, Muslim um, females to not just be young people involved in the program, but the core leadership and the leadership of a lot of scout groups is, um, is centered around female uh, members, which is very, very important for us and for our community. So who are we as the Muslim Scout Fellowship? So um, I guess scouting in the UK really began in the early 90s. Um, we started working, setting up a few scout groups by a few leaders who, who, who were they themselves scouts when they were young people in their respective countries and they wanted to do something for young people. They engaged with the Scout Association and we set up the Muslim Scout Fellowship as a, a national body that works um, under the umbrella of the Scout Association, so the UK Scout Association, it's not a separate organization, we're not a separate movement, we are part of the UK Scout Association, and our aim is to support the Muslim community engage with scouting and facilitating for that and working internally within the association to um, ensure that barriers are removed and to ensure that we can um, create those spaces where required, but at the same time, um, working with the Muslim community to educate them on what scouting is about, raise awareness, and, and obviously um, facilitate for, for their communities to, to take part in scouting and understand that this is a long-term investment. Scouting is not a, you know, we'll do it for a year or two years. We've had, alhamdulillah, Muslim scout groups um, running in the UK now for more than 20 years. And what we're starting to really see um, as an outcome of that are young people that joined at the very, very young ages of four, five, six years old. And they are now scout leaders and they're giving back to their communities. They're giving back by running scouting. And SubhanAllah, you start to see this when you look at um, just the, the group that I, 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 I might send my son to here in Birmingham, for example, the leaders that are running the section, which my, my child has joined and attends as a, as a beaver, as a young beaver, the leaders who are running that section were beavers when I was a scout leader more than 15 years ago. So what we've seen is, is those young um, children, you know, six, seven years old at a time, and we were their leaders, uh, it makes you feel old. Um, however, they went through the system and now our children, subhanAllah, are being 
um, developed by by them and this is how it's passed from generation to generation um, and, and this is the beauty of what we see from scouting uh, additionally we provide training and advice um, nationally we organize a number of training courses to support more um, uh, from the Muslim community to take part in scouting and we also run a number of national trips to bring young Muslim scouts together international trips we've planned things like umrah um, which uh, helps uh, with spiritual development as well which is an important part of scouting and this is another reason why scouting is so popular in the muslim community when i talked about earlier the, the different elements that scouting helps a young person in terms of development it's not just about um life skills it's um it's not just about physical um, development and social development but spiritual development is a key aspect of that so we find that through scouting we can also support the spiritual development of young people in a very um, in a different manner to what they may experience from a madrasa and we see like a, we see a madrasa as a complement to to scouting um scouting will not replace um you know what young people will learn and and, and understand from a madrasa um environment and we we, we purely see scouting as a as a complement to that and complement to other factors such as upbringing and household and, and so on um and um just 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 to kind of talk about you know young people and impact on young people this is this is young people are at the core of scouting and they always will be um so here i've just got a couple of quotes from some young people who've been through scouting um so um this is from amna harun she says i have developed lifelong friends and i have been able to grow in an environment where i am proud to be a muslim and proud to share how muslim scouts have been has benefited the community Scouts has helped me through my childhood and my teenage years to grow as a person and as a Muslim. Now, as the section head of Beavers, I have the opportunity to give back to the next generation, to the next group of young people and show them the great time I had when I was in their position. Yeah, amazing, subhanAllah. Um, from another, another um, ex-scout, um, Saeed Bayan, he said, being a scout means being prepared for any challenge that comes your way and our leaders ensure that we are able to come to solutions ourselves independently using our initiatives and the last one i want to share is from uh, iman al haymari she says scouting has played a huge role in my life and has given me the opportunity to develop many essential skills the most important of them being interpersonal skills and leadership skills now i'm the head sister of the islamic society at aston university which involves an enormous amount of planning and organization events which cater for almost some students on campus i feel confident taking this on because of my scouting experience so we've, we've seen the profound impact that scouting has on on young people and um and where they could where they could um, really help with their development you know obviously the last thing i want to finish off with is um i i genuinely and i hope you share the view that scouting is the perfect system for young people and for their development and the perfect system to support your mosques and your communities to really um develop your next um generation of leaders as mosques and as as as, as a community um so um inshallah i look forward to uh, any questions later on in the in the q a session and and if you know you want to get in touch with us our website is listed here and we'll share these presentations with you later inshallah and khair. Zakalakia Yusuf, what an excellent presentation and thank you so much for taking time to join us today um i have attended um a camp organized by the scouts and it's being part of a bigger family, but there's a discipline, it's hard work. <laughs> you just put everybody through it, it's not an easy one. So, you know, everyone's washing up or, or, you know, cutting wood or whatever it is. And so thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll look forward to um, more questions with you afterwards. I'm gonna introduce um, our final session for this before we go on to our discussion. And it's one of my esteemed colleagues who's going to discuss how we can support different minority groups at your local mosque. So Sister Rashida Hassan, who's the Assistant Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. Um, just gonna add her in there. Sister Rashida uh, is an Assistant Secretary of the MCB since 2018. She led the formation of the Proudly Muslim and Black Initiative. Rashida is a community and youth worker involved in a number of community engagement projects. She's a Managing Director of Dean for Real Communications, CIC, a community organization with the vision of supporting black and ethnic minority groups to achieve their aspirations and develop proportionately within the wider society. She holds a, a bachelor's and a master's in mass communication and has an interest in research study into media representation and inclusion. 
She's a broadcast professional with over two decades of experience, both in Nigeria and in the UK, and she's passionate about using media for social good. And on top of that, she keeps herself very busy, and I don't think there's a moment of spare where Sister Rashida isn't doing something to help many other communities. So over to you, Sister Rashida, we look forward to your presentation. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so, Okay, so I would first want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very um, um, expert uh, panel and to talk about supporting minority groups in your mosque. Um, having worked in a mosque for over seven years now, um, uh, first as an administrator and then uh, volunteering in a number of roles, um, I, I, I think um, I really you know, find this as a privilege that I'm being asked to you know, share some words about how to support minority groups. So to do that, uh, first I want to say that I haven't listened to every other um, presentation on this panel, I think most of what I'll be talking about to be like um, uh, either uh, re-emphasizing or reiterating what, you know, some of the presenters have talked about. Uh, and to talk to do, um, to address this topic, I actually uh, thought it was important to, um, I, I thought it is important to look at uh, our understanding of minority, what when we talk about minority groups, what do we mean? And then also look at in the context of the mosque, um, what do we mean when we say minority groups? And then now identify the things that, um, the challenges that are faced by uh, minority groups, as well as uh, what the mosque can do to support. So, um, so when I was trying to prepare for this, I came across uh, a very, uh, interesting, uh, what I found as very interesting definition of what uh, a minority is uh, by an American sociologist who said minority is a group of people who because of their physical or cultural characteristics are singled out from the others in the society in which they live for differential and unequal treatment and who therefore regard themselves as objects of collective discrimination. Uh, and I think this um, description of uh, minority groups is actually very, very hard, especially if we look at what um, almost all the, everyone who have uh, made a presentation on this panel had um, you know, alluded to. And then it now also, I now thought it was important to look at the characteristics of minority groups. So we have unequal treatments and limited power. Often um, the minority groups will feel marginalized and we've heard about women uh, and um, uh, you're talking about women in sports, talking about women in position of leadership. Um, then there is also sometimes this technician physical or cultural traits. So, you know, with regards to this, um, you, you talk about uh, a black person, um, uh, an Asian person, a uh, member of this particular race or ethnicity and all that. And then there, there are another major characteristics of a minority group is that it is an involuntary membership of the group. So you, it, you, you don't, you know, deliberately become a member or uh, become a minority. You're just a minority, you know, by, um, by naturally or by uh, um, uh, the, your circumstances of either birth or situation. And then usually there is an awareness of uh, subordination. So everybody who falls within any particular aspect of um, being a minority would know that there is some kind of um, uh, subordination. They don't have access like every other person to um, uh, certain things that are commonly available or they are not you know, put into consideration in the context of a decision or, or in the provision of things that should ordinarily be for everyone. And of course, uh, there are different categories when we talk about um, 
um, minority groups. So we have the racial and ethnic minorities, which um, uh, uh, you know, we all would fall to uh, into whether you are um, you are an African person, you are uh, somebody with a Asian Arab background, or what have you, um, and within a country where, for instance, in the UK, where it is it, it is an English um, country, and uh, most of the people who migrated to the UK would come from, you know, different um, other racial or ethnic background. And then there is the gender, uh, gender and sexuality minority. Um, of course, I'm more interested in the gender um, aspect of this, which is talking about uh, female, male, and all that. And there is religious minorities, uh, obviously, um, in a country where you have predominantly, we have a religion uh, pre, uh, uh, being the predominant one uh, uh, that's, you know, the, the native religion of that particular uh, community. And then you have other people either through migration or through um, uh, conversion, you know, taking other religion. So you have people who are, who fall within the religious uh, minority. And then there is also people with disabilities I'm happy that today we had um, uh, the, the we also had this presentation about um, making the mocks accessible to um, uh, to disabled people. Now, having talked about the category, um, I just want to give a bit of statistics within the Muslim within the UK. The Muslim uh, population is um, uh, about 3.3 million, according to the. Uh, of Office of National uh, for National Statistic in 2018, and um, so obviously the Muslim population within the UK is also a minority group, uh, it, uh, despite the uh, what appears to be a very large number. But if you put uh, if you look at it in the context of the whole country, then you know that uh, the Muslim community uh, uh, is a minority group. Also, within the Muslim community. The Black Caribbean and Black African community um, is, you know, said to be that the people who who, who identify is either, either as a Black Caribbean or Black African uh, within the Muslim community at ten percent of that uh, Muslim population. So you can see there is another sub. Uh, minority within the minority group and then about 43 percent of asylum seeker in UK were women and children and we've talked about the fact that uh, when we when we look at the category of my uh, of minority it is also gender based now when we talk about our mosque how do we is this do we use all this criteria that we've talked about and our understanding of um um, what minority uh, minority group means um, when we look at our mosque? The, the natural answer that would you know come to us is that yes, you know a minority, but sometimes it's very it's very important to put into context, you know, when we talk about minority groups within a mosque. So the first concept I want to talk about is when we talk about minority within minority, which I've alluded to. Uh, talk in my first in my previous slide, the the fact that black people like the black Muslim community are a minority within the Muslim minority, refugees are a minority within you know <laughs> within the a, a minority, and also you have reverts and new Muslims. So this concept, when, when we talk about the mosque, you find that that uh, mosques are usually very strongly connected to the migrant communities in the UK. Um, uh, a, a lot of the, a lot, if a lot, if not almost all the mosques in the UK are you know, either established or, you know, come into existence as a result of migration. People, you know, migrating to the, knowing that the UK itself is predominantly Christian. And so when most of the mosques that are established have within them minority communities or migrant communities. So, and, you know, really linked to that is the issue of ethnic based mosque management. So for us to be able to identify as a mosque, who our minority community is, we look. There is, there would be a need to look at the issue of the fact that most of our mosques 
in the UK are usually ethnic based and that is directly also related to the fact that they are migrants so it's a group of migrants who come together and you know want to create a space for themselves and that's also you know dovetail into talking about the fact that mosques are more than just a prayer space for us as Muslims so it's a it's a community engagement center it's a cultural space it's our comfort zone so a lot of migrants a lot of people a lot you know find the mosque as a space where they can you know they can be more comfortable in a new community that they have just moved into until they are able to finally integrate very well and based on that to be able to it's not we can't talk about minority in the mosque and just say oh it's about black people refugees and revert so you can actually i for instance i i i have been working in a mosque that is predominantly uh, managed by nigerian muslims so black nigerian muslims so within that context within that context of that mosque when we talk about minority groups it's going to be those other groups who do not form majority you know membership or users of that uh, particular uh, particular mocks and so that 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 way would be able to identify that um, if it, if a mosque is for instance predominantly run by um, um, uh, Somalian community uh, in terms of its uh, management in terms of even the use of language and all that then you know that within that particular space there is also an issue of minority that needed to be uh, uh, to be to be addressed so what are the issues that minority people uh, uh, minority face at the mosque one is access to mosque space and activities so a lot of time, um, especially a, a, a good example here would be peop, uh, a female, you know, having uh, women have access to mocks. We have a lot of mocks here in the UK that only have male only prayer spaces and they don't have access for women. Uh, there is also the issue of mosque management and leadership, where you hardly find, like I said, uh, where a mosque is a, the ethnic base is, a, is an ethnic based leadership. Then you find out that there will be people who are also members of that mosque, who are also uh, users of that mosque, but who are not involved in the management and running of the mosque, and especially women, you know, who usually. Uh, not, you know, I, I, I think I don't want to say so much about that because a lot has been said already about women in. And then there is also the issue of unconscious bias and microaggressions, you know, that happen within the uh, mocks space. And I just want to talk a bit about some of those things. Uh, you have people asking um, questions to uh, people that they see as the order are you a convert? So you see a black person and just assume naturally uh, that they wouldn't have been Muslim from birth and you are asking them and it makes people feel awkward and strange and you know sometimes unwelcome when such questions are asked of them. Uh, some people Africanized Arabic names are not real Muslims name. I mean you tell your name to some people and just because you didn't say it exactly you know the way it will be said if it was written in Arabic and uh, people would make comment like oh is that really a muslim name you know so you, these are things that people and fairer skin is more beautiful now that's it's about talking about anti-blackness and you have these things happening you know all around us not it, it happens around us and it also happened within the mocks then we have uh african caribbean culture is a ram and Asian or Arab culture makes you a Muslim. So any other thing that is, you know, you, you do certain things, are you sure you're a Muslim, you're doing that? And it's just about the culture of the people. You talk about clothing and food, uh, you wear certain kind of clothes and, you know, people would look at you in a certain kind of way that, oh, are you supposed to wear that as a Muslim? You, you're supposed to be in a certain kind of garb and a certain kind of food and Muslim food and all those kind of things. Then, and then a lot of time, you know, things like uh, black Muslim people are potential criminals. So you see them come into the mosque and you're already suspicious. You're already looking at them in a kind of way, making them feel like, oh, 
not totally welcome and uh, and just because of an unconscious or uh, bias or sometimes conscious bias but you know that you don't you, you it's they, they are like my little little uh, uh aggression against the other now the other thing that issue that people faced within uh, uh that minority uh, people face within the mocks is language barrier. Uh, I've had I've had to raise this a lot, being a member of the um, um, uh, of the Old Kent Road Mocks Muslim Association of Nigeria, it, which is predominantly a um, a Nigerian Yoruba speaking uh, community. And you, you, all the time, you have other people, other minor or other ethnic. Uh, group who come to the mosque and then you know the the sermon is happening the activity is happening and you know the language is in Yoruba and there is no provision for translation although in the old country of mosque I must say uh, there is always um, uh, there's always the the inten the the effort to make sure that everything is translated into English and um, but you know we uh, there are I've attended many Juma service here in the UK where they I just couldn't understand one word of the husba because it is said either in um, you know a language that I a South Asian language that I do not even understand at all, and there is really no not much of an effort to uh, to translate. Also, um, you the, the, we the, there are, there is, there is the issue that uh, reverts and people who are newly uh, accept Islam face, uh, you know face a lot of them are. Um, when they accept Islam, they usually do lose their families, and uh, they become lonely. And you know, you find out that most of most of the time, uh, mosque at the time they are, you know, uh, accepting Islam, there is all that joy, acceptance, welcoming. But the moment they accept and they are out of the place, that's the end of it. And um, we don't remember that they would go through a phase for you know making that bold step of accepting Islam, even at celebrations, how many of us remember them? So a lot of them are usually very lonely and unsupported, you know, at that, you know, during uh, periods like this. Also, now that now leads me to now talk about the good practices because I've been asked to um, uh, talk about how to support the minority group. I think it was very important to identify who we, they are, what they face and all that. So. One of the good ways that I have seen in my experience being um, be, uh, working on the mocks and also having been an assistant secretary general with the Muslim Council of Britain is, um, you know, community engagement activities. This, this is very, very important. Like I said, our mosques are more than just prayer spaces. They are, they are, they are supposed to be a place where we can actually uh, feel at home and engage in a lot of things. So I've heard that there, there were, I think it was um, in 2018, um, I know that the MCB supported the mosque autism week. You know, this is something that actually, I, we 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 did that in, in at the old Kent Road Mox, and I know how impactful it was, and how grateful, you know, uh, a lot of people who had um, um, autism as an issue within their family were that we actually had that. So, and you could have also refugee support programs. These are schemes that you know, as mosque committee and as mosques or um uh, as most as a as a as a community center uh we uh, good practices that people can uh, that mosque can uh, engage in then you could have drop-in sessions surgeries um I, 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 it was really very uh, we at the old Kent Road mosque there was a time we had our mp do the uh, mp surgery within the mosque and i know how very very impactful that was and how people felt that the mosque was actually addressing their need and then there is also the use of sign language in mosque i was very happy when i attended the um east london mosque and you know i could see uh, uh the use of sign language in in uh, in the in when the sermon was going on and i noticed that somebody put in the a question or something in the uh when this session started that why is it that mcb is talking we're talking about uh, inclusivity and we do not have um you know something like that in place uh for an event such as this i guess we're all improving and that's why we're doing this today talking about why 
uh, what we need to do uh, to, to actually support uh, minorities in our communities, in our mosque. Also, um, another very good practice that I have uh, come across is children and women engagement activities. So if you have women engagement activities and children engagement activities in your mosque, then that will bring women into it will, it will facilitate and encourage the participation of women. And there, from that, we'll be able to actually identify a lot of skills and potentials that can, uh, you know, that women and children and young people can bring into our mosque. Then, of course, inclusion of women in mosque management and leadership. Um, that is something that is very huge that um, I, I think the MCB has been very much at the forefront of promoting this, uh, and um, uh, inshallah, I look forward to you know many more mosques you know adopting this uh, good practice. Uh, where I, uh, I, my own mosque, the Old Kent Road Mosque, is an example of a very good practice of um, inclusion of women in mosque management. Although I still have a bit of reservation because I think there are, I don't think I've ever seen a female. Um, uh, a female president for the Old Kent Road Mocks. I look forward to seeing that. Now, what are the support uh, that practical steps that our mosque can take to actually uh, support minority groups? We should have prayer spaces for women. That cannot be said enough. It's something that is very important and uh, a good, it's something that mosque can actually look at to encourage uh, uh, the involvement. I, I met someone who told me that they've lived in a particular area for 30 years here in the UK, and there are more than 10 mocks on their street, and both the, the person and her daughter have never been inside any of those mocks to pray, because there are no space for uh, uh, female uh, uh, female uh, users. Now, accepting the accepting also another thing that is very important for our most to do is actually accepting this need for change. There is a need to actually recognize and accept that we need to do something. So a lot of time people didn't feel like, oh, well, what's there? There is nothing. We are all one group. We are Muslim, Muslim, Muslim Muslims. There is no issue of um, distinguishing between a black person and this and that. That is what we want. But until we are able to actually you know, support the people that are obviously minority, then we cannot just say, we cannot just sweep it under the carpet. So there is a need to accept that there, we need to change. And then of course, that would also lead us to now include diverse, diverse voices from the member. I mean, I've been told by a black Muslim brother that and uh, at a university, people said they were not going to pray behind him when uh, he was uh, selected as an imam just because he's a black person and he wouldn't recite. Uh, uh, his recitation would not sound, you know, as it should sound according to them. Now, conscious attitude do not change at home, social gatherings and other social interaction spaces. So it's very important for us to have these difficult conversations, to talk about it, to make people aware. So, you know, uh, Alhamdulillah, the MCB started the um, racial justice workshop uh, last year, and we're still going to have it. Um, uh, sorry, we started it this year, actually. Uh, we're going to have it next uh, next year, inshallah. So that is something that you know we need to do. Conscious attitude and change, and reaching out to promoting volunteering in mosque activities by including minority groups. Uh, disabled access and inclusion in activities, minority inclusion in mox management and leadership. And I said, you, you must can also try to consider getting the MCB refugee booklet, which is very good uh, to engage the, um, um, the refugee community. So finally, I would like to just uh, stop by, um, I would like to conclude by sharing, you know, this up, this are popular, um, uh, verses from the Quran. Amongst the sign is the creation of the heavens and the hearts and the differences of, our, of your languages and culture and color. There are, there are indeed signs in that for those who know. So the, 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 these, the, the, the reason we are in that, in we have different colors, we are diverse in uh, ethnicity and race. It's not 
for anything but just for us to know ourselves and the one the the the, the, the real pious people amongst us are the god-fearing ones so it's not about our color it's not about our um race or anything and then whosoever according to the, there's an address of the uh, of the prophet who said whosoever possesses in his heart prejudice even to the extent of a mustard seed god will raise him on the day of resurrection with the bandiers of the pre-islamic period so it is actually you know it, it, and it is the during the period of jailia that you should have things like you know prejudices that we still have now and we need to you know go over that and Finally, there is strength in our unity uh, and there is a lot of beauty in our diversity. Thank you very much for you know, giving me this platform and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sister Rashida. And I think such a pertinent presentation as to what we really need to do, what are the issues, but also how do we actually tackle them? And I think some of, those advice, some of the advice that you've given is really, really practical and yeah. something that we can all completely do now so what i'm going to do is i'm going to invite all of our speakers if you want to come back on camera i don't know if um, our tech team can spotlight everybody um so we can see you all i know that we've only got around a very short time but five to ten five to seven minutes and i'm going to push if we can add everybody into the spotlight and i think i'd probably take this opportunity first of all to thank you all for really not just inspiring presentations or, or if any, nobody ranted actually, which was great, but actually um, critical, thought provoking and practical. I think every single presentation here today offered advice on, hey, this is what we're doing that you can just take and apply. Here's some of the experiences that we've been through, but also if we don't work together, we're not gonna actually help the people that need it the most. And so I thought instead of asking you all individual questions, I just bring you all in and ask maybe for you to conclude with some final reflections on some of the things that our members and our audience have asked about in all the respective things that you've shared here with us today. Can we also get Zahra on as well in the spotlight? Um, you know, and particularly maybe starting with yourself, Mariam, and in the same order that we all spoke, you know, this is a very challenging topic, getting Muslim women fully engaged it was a question about you know how do you how do we access more spaces I know at the MCB we are having this conversation I've been touring the country speaking to Moss and bringing up this point so I think if all of you can maybe just conclude in a minute or two and just really share you know the the what's at stake if we don't change and one practical way that we can all change you know and take benefit from the respective issues that you've spoken about and if you would like to begin Mariam that would be great. Thank you, Zara. Um, I've been looking at the question and it's a really, um, like you said, it's a pertinent one. And it's one of those I think that falls under the whole governance and how is it that we can influence uh, change at board level, at constitution level. Um, an article that uh, we were sharing at the university was around how internal environments and extern external environments have uh, throughout history made an influence and have has pushed for change. I think it's that voice continually um, being able to express. And I think it's those allies. So it's not only the women speaking up, but the men in our families and friends and in our networks uh, choosing. Also, what the, another big thing that we have is choice. If there's one mosque that doesn't allow, then maybe as a family, we should move to another. Like uh, we, we should use our feet and our sort of voice in that manner. So if if they're not accommodating to the women and then if there is no space then maybe we should find another space where we can attend as a family so it's i think small things that will put that in external pressure that change is just so important because we're missing out on talent uh and and everything else that we've mentioned thank you short concise just what we love to hear and to you zahra you know you said so many inspiring things and um, you really made quite a pertinent point that, you know, it's not just about including us, you've got to make the access to the logistics are important too. So is there one final message that you'd like to leave with our audience about what they can really do today um, to get involved or to help? I think that everyone plays an important role. And even if it's something really small, like just talking about the topic um, with, you know, someone, you know, in your mosque or um, like a leader or speaking to an Islamic scholar about raising the topic in their lectures. Um, and, you know, small things, I think baby steps in order to make big change, you know? And I think that that's just how it's gonna happen. And we, what's at stake if we lose, um, if we don't do this? Well, um, I know many families who go to mainstream services in order to get um, their, you know, to get the 
the support that they require and you know they're losing out their children are losing out on this essential on on you know gaining an islamic education on you know reading learning to the quran and it's such a shame um so we really need to make these baby steps in order to um, achieve the change that we want to see inshallah mm -hmm. excellent completely agree you know we are we're an ummah we're a family we shouldn't leave anybody behind reha and nafiza you know you told us i guess about courage and bravery taking big steps and 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 slam dunks and and, and sweeps and sleep, i don't know all the sports metaphors just insert in this and um, it took i guess both of you a lot of bravery and courage stepping forward we've talked about what's at stake exclusion and what do you think is one real practical way that mosques and, and communities can get involved now um, give us the space, not just the physical space, but the opportunity to come and talk to the girls, to explain to you the benefits that sports will bring to the girls. And it's going to be mutually beneficial for both of you. Trust me, happier wives at home will be happier families. <laughs> yeah. What's at stake is the safety of our girls. Let's just put it bluntly. Racism is a real thing. Islamophobia is rife. Um, and if our girls are not equipped to defend themselves, protect themselves, they don't have to fight. They just have to have the mentality that I'm able to protect myself. Brothers, husbands, you know, dads are not always going to be around. They need to be able to fend for themselves. And part of what we do is encourage sisters to feel safe all alone. Just have tawakkul on Allah and go for it. And, you know, that's what we want for all our girls. As they feel safe and strong, right? Um, Thank you so much. And Yusuf, um, I know the Scouts have been you know, a phenomenal force. And as you said, so many are actually Muslim. And I know actually a lot of our organizations here have been so pivotal through the pandemic, but just how important can the Scouts be as a lifeline to engaging young people? And I guess your recommendation to everybody here too. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think there's no shortage of young people that are interested in getting involved in Scouts. I think it's actually about communities coming together and, and identifying and, and working and planning to help establish more scout groups. Um, we've seen um, the impact that obviously COVID's had and the pandemic's had on the Muslim community. And we've, you know, just today we've got events to re-engage the Muslim community and the Muslim scout groups to get them back on track and, and re-engaging their young people. I think the, uh, the big opportunity that scouting presents is that these young people are also um, part of a wider movement. They're part of a, a wider national movement. You know, I didn't talk about the numbers in the UK, but there's half a million scouts in the UK. Um, you know, we're already a small percentage of that, but we also have an opportunity to influence people's views on Islam and on Muslims and, and work with within the movement, if you like, to, to, to change perceptions. And, and that's something that we're really, really working hard to do. And we need more Muslims on board to really do that at all levels of the organization, from the grassroots work, working with young people to um, UK uh, leadership and, and, and trusteeship. So, you know, my, my message really is we, we need more Muslims engaged and involved in scouting. We want to work um, in, in, in as many Muslim communities as possible. And it's, you know, the journey is not easy. It's a long-term journey. This is an investment in young people. It's not a, as I said earlier, it's not, it's not a, a one week or a one month or a one year wonder. This is from, from a long, a, a prolonged period of time we're working with our youth to, to develop them. Brilliant, thank you. And then final word from you, Sister Rashida. You know, we spoke about the migration crisis, refugees are coming. I know we're still learning the lessons mm -hmm. of integration and, and including all. How do we overcome these racial barriers and why is it so important that we do, especially with new communities coming? Yeah, it's it's very important because um, uh, we 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 just have to make sure that everybody is carried along, and everybody do have a sense of belonging. And uh, our mosque are our they are like our special spaces. The the mosque leadership and management needs to understand that, and uh, they need to engage with that fact, and you know do everything possible to support minority groups, uh, uh, whatever kind of minority uh, we're talking about here, whether it's racial minority, disability, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of um, minorities that we have talked about. So there is a need to ensure that, you know, they have a voice and they are represented adequately and their issues are engaged with. Fantastic. Well, look, what a delight to be on a 
all women panel with one <laughs> one man one man for a change um mm -hmm. you've seen them you've heard them and they've all given you some fantastic advice the mcv is completely committed to inclusion diversity we've got projects coming up in the new year hopefully don't launching our mld women as well to celebrate the achievements of the women and all their contributions to sport industry and, and, and communities and i just want to thank everybody you know i think you've provided us so much insight you're carrying the weight of responsibility for all of us, and I'm sure many others are also on this call. So JazakAllah Carol, I accept all of your hard work, um, Amin, and thank you for joining us for this excellent session on diversity and inclusion. And hopefully the most that are listening, the community groups will all take benefit and heed. So JazakAllah Carol, you guys can all uh, slip away now. Um, as we come on, just before our break, I'm going to quickly, we're gonna play a video on a really important um, survey that is being launched um, and I think the tech team have that ready to go and this is actually an important piece of research that the Cardiff Centre for Islam is, is for Centre for Islam is conducting it's a three-year project and it's the largest academic study of British imams and the MCB is part of the advisory group since the inception of the study and the survey and um, but now we really need your participation to support and provide some of your perspectives and experiences of taking part engaging and participating in MOSA all different spaces so we're going to play the video now which I think will give you a little bit more information um, but thank you on behalf of myself and for all of our guests and then we will take a break for lunch and salah. Have you ever approached an imam for help or guidance? If so, what was your experience? What do you think the role of imams should be in modern Britain? How much should an imam be paid? How important is it for the imam to engage with wider society? These are some of the questions being explored as part of a new nationwide community survey. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Dr. Riyas I'm the principal investigator of a major three-year research project called Understanding British Camps, based at Cardiff University. Entirely funded by the Jamil Research Programme, the study is community-focused and completely independent of government. In the past two years, we have surveyed more than 2,000 imams and interviewed another 40 imams all around the country. Now, we are turning to the British Muslim community at large with a new survey. We want to hear from women and men from all walks of life and backgrounds, whether you regularly attend a mosque or not. What can your community do to help the imam do their work better? Should the imam's salary be more or less than ministers of religion in other UK faiths? How well do you feel the imam caters for women's needs in your community? And many more questions. Your answers will be vital to British Muslim organisations and educational institutions and recommendations will be presented back to Muslim communities to support their development. Rest assured, everything you say is anonymous and confidential. So please take some time out to complete this survey. Jazakallah care for that video. So we will post in the chat. It's a really, really important survey and hopefully will contribute to the improvement, the opportunities, and I guess some of MCB's work on standards and MOS and governance and practice. And so I think we'll post it in the chat. Please do get involved. It shouldn't take too long to fill in. We're now going for break and we will resume. Um, so please come back here for 10 past one, I believe. Is that right? Um, if everybody can, yep, yeah, 10 past one. So um, feel free to go get a cup of tea, bit of a stretch, highly recommend it. Uh, and certainly pray your salah, which is very important. Uh, we're gonna take a little break here and we'll stop recording and streaming, I think in that time. And when we come back, we've got a really, really important session on more safeguarding, security, finance. We've got a really incredible array of speakers. It will also have a presentation from Islamic Relief on their upcoming critical emergency campaign in Afghanistan. Um, I think, I'm sure everybody hopefully has been enjoying the program. We've had an incredible turnout and some really excellent guests as well. So I'll stop there um, and inshallah, we'll see you all back at 10 past one. 
uh, and I'm sure Wajid will be hosting again. Uh, he's probably gone for his uh, coffee. Um, and why are you still there? All right, you having a uh, samosa chat now? What's what's <laughs> what's no, up? Nothing, <clears throat> nothing, nothing at all. I'm nothing at all. Right. Yeah. So apparently, we're representing um, a certain color scheme <laughs> or certain. <laughs> the colors today are very good. Do you like my jacket, Wajid? Yes. Yes, it's much more colorful than mine. Um, I was trying to channel the, my in, in, inner Imran Khan, even though I'm Indian. <laughs> that's, it. that's what I was thinking. But the whole Indian nation is like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Have you, you enjoyed it? was a Malaysian conference that I was at last week, and they actually, it was a virtual conference, and they gave everyone a link, and they said, if you click on this link, you can get uh, Just Eat to deliver your lunch. So they, they actually had lunch, even though it was virtual. But I think that's because Malaysia lives in like 2030 and we're still here in 2021. Oh my God. I actually spoke at um, an international conference, which I think was in Indonesia. Um, and it was their evening and it was our morning. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it was all kind of totally different mood. But anyway, we yeah. are here. We're doing so, so next so year, I'm off, inshallah. You Hopefully we'll get you guys meals coming to your home, even if it's virtual. Yeah. But inshallah, it won't be. Inshallah, if we all wear our masks, then it will be in person, but no, one no, definitely in chill. Have you enjoyed all the conversation and all the discussion so far? Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. I mean, where else can you learn from so many different people and um, get so many different ideas and experiences? So, uh, you know, if uh, if I was running a, a mosque, you know, I, I, there, there's so many different areas that I could think, okay, there's actually this one small thing that I could do here. There's something I could do over there. And it's the practical tips. I mean, we know that there are problems, but if there's a practical tip saying, actually, if we just educate our community, we do a khutbah saying, guys, don't stare when someone comes into the mosque. It makes them feel incredibly unwelcome. That, that could it just be that one small thing, but it's a step in the right direction. That's what we need. Yeah, no, I think actually that some of the, some of the things that our panelists shared, particularly around just physically looking at someone and you know the language that we use or sometimes not even talking about people in a very positive way. It, you know, in our spaces, someone made a point that what about highlighting women in our Friday sermon, local women and their achievements, and you know, the language that we use about women in our spaces, or as you said, just that accessibility. I know in my travels to Leicester, meeting some, some really incredible women talking about disability, that that way, that stopped all of their access to madrasa and to mosques. So imagine, mm -hmm. you know, things that we take for granted, but um. Okay, shall we take a break too then, Wajid? Yes, time for Zahur, inshallah. And we'll see everyone back at 10 past one. Um, and the next section is next session is on safeguarding. Um, so you don't want to miss it because this is incredibly important for us um, to prevent uh, current or future disasters from happening. So inshallah, you know, I would recommend tuning in then. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu everyone. Catch you soon. From Bye. sunny Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah okay it does, it does, i don't know what you've done with your lighting because it looks darker over here in london and sunny in glasgow so the world seems to be turning upside down but there's a few modifications <laughs> to create, <laughs> create a, a very bright jacket just in case exactly exactly okay Bye.
a little bit too fantastic for Brenda to fail uh, because uh, I asked my wife what's for lunch and she said it's uh, falafel. And I said, yeah, but what else? And she said, no, did you not listen to Rosedale's talk? We have to go meat free. And I was, uh, so I, uh, I think it was a little bit too effective. But khair, inshallah, I'll forgive you for that. Not for the Liverpool thing, but for this anyway. And um, Alhamdulillah. if you could uh, in, in, uh, do an introduction, inshallah, to your, to your segment. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Waj, thank you very much. Allah bless you and uh, bless everyone at MCB um, for giving us the opportunity to talk today about a very important uh, appeal and, and message. But uh, just before we start, if we could uh, just play our, our video, is that okay? Thank you. Twenty-three million people in Afghanistan. Twenty-three million people in Afghanistan are facing acute hunger. The country is on the verge of famine. Food packs like these that Islamic Relief are distributing on the ground in Afghanistan are lifesavers. In each pack, we have twenty-nine kilograms of rice, sixty kilograms of flour, fourteen kilograms of pulse sugar, salt, oil. We're also distributing non-food items, which include female hygiene products, soap, toothbrushes, toothpastes, buckets, etc. In a few weeks time, Afghanistan will be covered in snow. Hundreds of thousands are expected to die. Time is of the essence. We need to reach as many people as possible. Please donate now. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Am I, am I okay to speak now? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, not enough is being done to cover the unfolding crisis in Afghanistan. This, uh, this could be the world's largest humanitarian crisis. I, I, I quoted a figure that of 23 million people, 50% of the population in Afghanistan are facing acute hunger. And... The media, has, the media, the international community, the world has turned its back on the people of Afghanistan. When I came back and I shared the videos, people were shocked because they said they didn't know anything about the unfolding crisis there in Afghanistan. I was there, as you saw in the video, I returned last week. I was, six, I was there for six days in Kabul and in Bamiyan. And what I saw will live, me, will live with me to the day that I die. I've, honestly, I've, I've been to crisis areas before, but... What I saw, what I, what I heard there, it's, it's a crisis on another level. And one story that I think encapsulates the crisis on the ground is of this man here, Sarwar. Sarwar, um, who lives in probably one of the most desperately in need communities within Afghanistan. That's saying a lot because over 90% of the community of Afghanistan are dependent on aid. Um, it, he lives in Bamiyan, which, uh, and amongst the community which are known as the dwellers of the caves. These are long um, sort of uh, IDPs that have been there 30, 40 years and that have settled in caves uh, in and around Bamiyan. Sarwar used to be a laborer and he used to be able to go out. Life was difficult for him anyway, uh, but in the, in the last couple of months, because of the economic crisis, he's not been, he's not been able to earn an income. And he, so he slowly but surely, has, his, his family has started to suffer. He now is reliant on his neighbors, and his neighbors are, all, are also in need. He's reliant on his neighbors for, for handout, for food. He cannot, that's the only way that he can get food. You see three of his children here. Sarah has five children. Two of his daughters, he had to give away because he couldn't afford to feed them. Think about that, just for a second. He had to give away his daughters because he couldn't afford to feed them. He was telling the story about when uh, the, the, younger, the younger of the two daughters were, were leaving and, and he, she broke down and she was saying, like, I, I don't want to go. I don't know this family. I, I, they're strangers. And he relayed the story. He said, look, he just said to her, you, you can't stay here. There's no food. I can't feed you. At least they can feed you. This is a story that we're hearing time and time again in Afghanistan. In another case, two ladies, widows, within a couple of days of each other, and turned up to our offices in Kabul and Bamiyan, literally within a few days of each other, and were hysterical and were crying and were saying and said to our officers, 
please take my daughters because I cannot afford to feed them anymore. The country is on the verge of famine. Families like Sarwal, mothers like the two that I just described, are watching their children literally die in front of them because they cannot afford food, because they cannot get food. The whole country is in a crisis. Now with the winter months arriving, if we don't act fast, we could lose hundreds of thousands of children. It is estimated that 50% of under fives will be severely acutely malnourished at the end of this bitter winter. We need to act and we need to act now to save lives. Islamic Relief is on the ground, has been there for 20 years and has never left the people of Afghanistan. Despite the challenges, we've never left. We, alhamdulillah, are on the ground. You saw that there, that there was a food bank distribution there. We're helping through that food, distrib food bank distribution, 13,000 families, the most neediest families across Afghanistan. We've done a needs assessment. We've identified those families. We're in the process of distributing those food packs. We're also distributing non-food items. And we're also, we also have health projects across the country that are supporting people in need. We're ready to support. We're ready to, we have suppliers lined up. Our teams, we have had a surge capacity. We've had teams, we have teams on the ground that are ready to distribute. We need funds. The problem is nobody is talking about this crisis. Our Muslim community doesn't know about this crisis. Nobody in social media is talking about this crisis. We need your support to help people, to help save lives in Afghanistan. I quoted a figure of 23 million people, and it's very easy to become desensitized with these figures because we, we're hearing them all the time now because there's so many crises across the world. But behind every figure, behind every number, is a human being, is a mother that's crying because she's watching a child starve in front of her is a mother that's so desperate that she feels that she needs to give her children away to families that can feed them. Behind every number is a child that is crying because of the pangs of hunger, because of malnutrition. Now you know, please help us to save lives in Afghanistan. You as a community, you are leaders in our community. You have masajids. This, in this next two weeks, during the holidays, let's do all that we can to raise awareness and to raise funds for the people of Afghanistan. Our teams are ready to come and to support any, any collections, any fundraising initiatives. Please help us to save lives in Afghanistan. Jazakallah khair. Maybe watch it, please. It might be useful if we can share a, an email address or a telephone number uh, with, 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 the, uh, with the attendees of the conference so that they have somebody that they can get in touch with to help with raising funds for this very important appeal. Well, uh, I'll put that in the chat, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan for that heartbreaking testimony. Um, uh, first person testimony that you went there and saw it yourself. Um, I, I, I wanted to also thank you for sponsoring and historically for sponsor, being our main sponsor today. Um, and we really hope that those who are attending will, will amplify this message because obviously that's what we want. We want people to support the people of Afghanistan. They are our brothers and sisters, just like everyone else is as well. And we can make a difference, inshallah. Okay. Thank you so much, Brother thank you. I also wanted to highlight um, one of our other sponsors, Bates Wells LLP. It's a uh, law firm that's best known for their expertise in advising charities. They've got a large, dedicated charity and social enterprise team here in the UK. And uh, they're also one of the sponsors for um, uh, the conference today. Uh, I would like to introduce Sister Yasmin Surti as the chair for our session on safeguarding. Sister Yasmin is currently the secretary for the Federation of Muslim Organizations in Leicestershire. She um, has a huge amount of experience, mashallah, in the Muslim community, over 35 years of experience in the local, regional, and national level working with the voluntary sector, education sector, independent sector. And she's trying to bring about change to improve the lives and experience of people with a range of disabilities and vulnerabilities as a frontline practitioner, a commissioner, and a manager and a trustee. But mashallah, she's you know, someone who's been a very big supporter of MCB as is uh, FMO Lester. And we, I would like to hand over to her uh, for this session on safeguarding. Jazakallah khair, Sister Yasmin. Jazakallah, brother Wajid, bismillah, um, and um, thank you for, for allowing me to chair this really, really important session 
today, uh, you know, you've already talked about the importance of safeguarding. And at the end of the day, um, you know, our masjids, our madrasas, those that attend them are, you know, an, our manner. And, and so we have a responsibility besides all, all the external um, issues that, that, that you described, inshallah. So, um, inshallah, I'm going to um, start the session by introducing um, our first speaker, um, Brother Augustus de la Porta from, from Bates Wells LLP. Um, as uh, Brother Wajid uh, already said, Bates Wells LLP are sponsoring this uh, segment. So, Jazakallah khair, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, much appreciated. So, over to you, Brother Augustus. Uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, please let me know if you can't. Um, Assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today about this very important subject, um, slightly sobered by the very powerful presentation by DeFail just now. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so I, I'm a partner in the uh, charity team at Bates Wells, uh, working with a number of um, Muslim charities, including mosques. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about safeguarding in 10 minutes, which is uh, quite a task because it's a big topic. Um, and what I'm going to be focusing on are the sort of legal and regulatory perspectives of safeguarding. So what do we mean by it, uh, both in a legal context and from a charity commission perspective? Charity commission obviously is the key regulator for charities uh, in England and Wales. Some examples of risk and harm which charities should be alert to in the, in, in the Chad Commission's definition of safeguarding. Um, and following on from that, what your duties are as trustees uh, of charities in relation to safeguarding uh, and a few practical tips. So I'm gonna try and squeeze all that in 10 minutes, starting from now, well, even, even less than 10 minutes because we, we, we've got a few, few other great speakers in, in the hour that we've got. So in terms of safeguarding, uh, conventionally, when we look at think about safeguarding, this is about protecting uh, children and vulnerable adults, and um, so also known as adults at risk. So, if you work very closely with children or vulnerable adults, um, this is known as regulated activity, and uh, this triggers compliance with uh, statutory safeguarding regime. So, an example of that could be. Uh, if you're teaching or caring for children for more than three days, a 30 day period, uh, or in terms of vulnerable adults, if you're um, driving a minibus on behalf of the mosque to enable elderly or disabled worshippers to attend prayers. Those are just a couple of examples of what would then be regulated activity, and that triggers compliance with the statutory safeguarding regime. And what does that mean? Well, that includes things like uh, carrying out high level uh, DBS checks disclosure and barring service checks, uh, and ensuring that your charity doesn't engage with individuals who are barred from working with children or vulnerable adults. And it also means you have to inform uh, the DBS if there is a safeguarding concern amongst other agencies. Um, that, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the, the sort of legal definition. Um, but one thing that you may well be aware of and should be aware of is that the Charity Commission following the recent safeguarding incidents, which um, as you've alluded to earlier, um, so for example, Oxfam, um, Save the Children, others have been, uh, there was the international um, issue around safeguarding. Following that, the commission has uh, defined uh, safeguarding much more widely, and it's a real hot topic, as you can imagine, for the Charity Commission. Um, so the commission states that as part of fulfilling your trustee duties, you must take reasonable steps to protect from harm the people who come in, into contact with your charity. Um, I'm just trying to get the slides uh, on my screen so I can move them. Um, apologies. Augustus, is it because you're sharing a PDF possibly? Yes, I can't see it on my screen. Um, one of the technical team advice? Perhaps uh, stop sharing. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing and then maybe start try reshare on the specific tab. 
or um, Brother Shazad, if you've got it, can you share it on uh, instead? If, is that easier? Let's try that. I think if Augustus shares now, it should work because okay, he's on. Okay, yeah. Let's try. <laughs> Go for so, it. So I should share again. Mm -hmm. uh, apologies again, it's just disappeared from my screen. Uh, okay, then Dr. Shazad can try. If you give me access, I'll do it. Uh, so who can share? I've said all panelists can share. Okay, great, Dr. Shazad, please try now. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So if you could uh, move on to the uh, the one after this one, sorry. Okay, so um, thank you very much. So the commission's guidance goes on to state that safeguarding means the steps taken to protect people from harm, including beneficiaries, staff, volunteers, and other people who come into contact with your charity and any partners you work with. So whilst uh, safeguarding principally refers to prevention of harm, it encompasses practices to handle incidents and, or com and complaints as well. So breaking this down, um, this includes you know, who, who works for and behalf of your charity in any capacity, so that's staff, volunteers, trustees, anyone who comes into contact with your charity, so worshippers, children who come to, uh, for, 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 um, for, for, for lessons at the weekend in the mosque, uh, people who benefit from your charity's work. So if you give uh, out grants to individuals. So it's not just about applying to those um, children, uh, children or uh, vulnerable people that we would traditionally consider to be at risk. The commission's definition is much wider than that. And from the commission's perspective, it's a key priority for all charities, regardless of size or type of income. Um, there is guidance, which was in that previous slide there, but if you just tap in Charity Commission um, Safeguarding, you will find their guidance on this subject. And it's very important that trustees um, have access to that and read that and understand that. Um, it's In terms of what your charity does and who it works with, I'll come on to some examples of that in a moment, but just very quickly, it's worth highlighting that um, the Charity Commission is a very uh, has always been, but is an increasingly hands-on and active regulator, and safeguarding is very high on its agenda. It's issued regulatory alerts for charities, for international charities, but also domestic charities. Uh, it, it updates the safeguarding guidance quite regularly, um, and it's very active from the clients that we see in this area around safeguarding. So, you know, they do have a number of powers that I'm sure you are aware of. So that can be just from issuing regulatory guidance to you, opening a compliance case, which could be published, uh, issuing an official warning, again, which might be published. They can appoint and remove trustees. They can disqualify trustees. They can institute an inquiry. So, you know, it's worth noting that, you know, they do have powers uh, if they um, feel they need to exercise them. On the positive side though, as I said, they do have a wealth of, of guidance, including safeguarding guidance. You can uh, um, sign up for alerts to get the latest. The other piece of guidance I would recommend all trustees to read uh, because it does build, I mean, safeguarding is a specific aspect of something that you need to be thinking about as a trustee, but it is part of your duties as a charity trustee to, um, to be protecting the assets and the people that you work with in the charity. Safeguarding is a part of that, but understanding your wider trustee duties is really important. So the essential trustee, what's called CC3, is a really important set of guidance that you should uh, read and understand, all trustees should. Um, there's been a recent update to the safeguarding guidance from the Charity Commission, particularly around operating online. So if there are any activities that your charity does uh, around operating online, with individuals, particularly uh, that, that could include children or vulnerable people, but just generally, then do look at that guidance for the updates uh, on that issue. The next slide um, 
sorry, before this one, I think, uh, there is a list of this one here. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this just gives you an idea of some of the types of risk and harm which charities should be alert to. So as you can see, there's a lot here. It's quite widely drawn, deliberately so by the Charity Commission. Uh, if you could just skip to the next slide. So the Commission has said, um, and, and, and we've seen evidence of this, that it will hold trustees to account if things go wrong. It will check trustees have followed its guidance and the law, and if necessary, will make referrals to the relevant safeguarding agencies. So, you know, its position is protecting people and safeguarding responsibilities should be a governance priority for all charities. So moving on to some practical tips here in the last couple of minutes, um, how, how can trustees uh, do, you know, put, Im implement safeguarding in their organization? So um, promoting a fair, open and positive culture and ensuring everyone feels able to report concerns and confident that they will be heard and responded to is really important. So that's part of the culture. Um, it's not just about having a policy and procedure, that's obviously important. Um, and any policy and procedure that you do have, you need to make sure that is followed by staff, trustees, volunteers, and beneficiaries, you know, in terms of people being aware of it, and those people that are there to implement it um, can do, and they have the training to be able to do that. Having uh, proper uh, and clear referral and reporting systems in place, so that uh, if anything does arise, um, any suspicions or, or safeguarding issues are identified, that everyone knows what to do. Um, thinking about what the risks are and how those risks are managed in a risk register can be very helpful. Um, any new roles, any new activities are risk assessed. Um, and in terms of individuals, does that person need a DBS check? Is it basic or enhanced? There's some very good guidance on a website called um, Strengthening Faith Institutions, SFI. Um, and that has some really good guidance, um, particularly for, for mosques actually. So you can, and it breaks it down into the different roles within a mosque. So um, that's really good guidance for you to look at and get some ideas from. It's not legal advice, but it does give you a very good idea of what you should be doing on, in terms of checks. Having a clear oversight over how safeguarding and protecting from people people from harm are managed within your charity is important. So monitoring performance, uh, conducting periodic reviews of safeguarding policies, having a safeguarding, having safeguarding as a standing item on trustee meeting agendas can be very helpful too. Um, if you have a lot of individuals in your organization, having a spreadsheet where it's clear um, who, who has got what check and when, it, when it's been done is really important. Obviously, if you have a, if you're a school, then you have an obligation to have such a document. But even if you're not, it's very good to have something like that in place uh, and someone who's responsible for it. But on, on that point, you know, some, sometimes people think, oh, well, there's some, some person is responsible for safeguarding. I don't need to worry about it. The commission's very clear that this is um, a collective responsibility. Every trustee is responsible for being aware of safeguarding risks and issues. Okay, I'm just gonna move on again to some last, uh, last sorry, the slide before this, uh, a few more practical tips. So, um, you know, as I said, having a policy and procedure is great, but putting it into practice is really important. You may need some other policies that build around that. So these are some examples of those there. Fire code of conduct, that's something which sets out your charity's culture and values and how people in the charity should behave, um, you know, staff, volunteers, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, I've mentioned also about your policies, reviewing them regularly and making, making them proportionate and tailored to the activities that you're doing, not just cut and pasting from some other organization, their policy that may not be appropriate. And actually when it comes down to implementing it, you realize that this is not actually gonna work for your organization. Making sure the policy is appropriate to what you're doing is really important. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that this is not just about your organization. If you're funding other organizations, uh, you do need to make sure that the, the money that you're giving to them is being used uh, for appropriate purposes. And if, if you're giving a lot of money, for example, for activities that are gonna involve um, helping children, vulnerable people, or more generally, the safeguarding definition of the commission, um, 
you know, is, that charity is going to be coming into contact with vulnerable individuals or people who could come to harm. You know, make sure that you do find out what that organisation does in terms of safeguarding and it has appropriate safeguarding procedures in place. So that is uh, in a snapshot what I wanted to give you in the space of 10 minutes or so. Um, there's a lot more that I could say, but I hope that gives you um, an introduction to the topic. Um, and, and, you know, it is an important one. I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of it already. There's a lot of guidance out there. Uh, and if you have any questions after this, uh, do feel free to contact me. My details are on the next slide. Thank you so so much, Augusta. Some really, really important messages there. And, you know, as we said before, safeguarding our, uh, yourselves, our institutions, people that attend those institutions is so important. And I didn't have time to do a proper introduction in the interest of time, but, you know, you've worked across Palestine and Syria. We know people send money abroad. So, again, lots to think about. Um, team, I assume we'll be sharing the slides with attendees. Shala, so you, you, can, you can get the information and we will pick up questions and answers after everybody has uh, had the chance to present. So thank you again. And I'm going to move on to um, Samar Mustak, um, who's a head teacher and trustee um, at Neil Mosque and a safeguarding trainer. Um, Jazakallah for joining us today. Jazakallah Yasmin and uh, Jazakallah to Augustus for that wonderful presentation. Um, you have covered quite a lot of what I was gonna say. So. 10 minutes should be should should be easy for for me i'm just gonna start with a a presentation hopefully you can uh, you can all see this yep so just by way of uh, background i'm a head teacher of the nili mosque madrasa and a trustee there and i've got a background in the the science industry as well where i worked widely on behavioral safety and just safeguarding issues in, in general. Um, the, the definition of safeguarding provided by Augustus, I think that's a lot more comprehensive than what I've written there in a nutshell. So just to protect from harm or damage with an appropriate measure. Within the, the context of our mosques and madaris, focusing on young people, one of our mottos is to educate and inspire young people in a friendly environment so they may become active members of our society. Now, I'm speaking as a, a safeguarding trainer, a head teacher, but also as a, as a parent as well. One of the things that I look for when I take my children to a mosque is can I actually visibly see? Um, signs of safeguarding having taken place. For example, can I see who's responsible for safeguarding at the, at the mosque? Is there a youth club over there? So just little signs. And if I don't see any of these, I, you know, I will raise questions. You know, why is the designated safeguarding lead not displayed anywhere? Because that's something that would make children feel safe as soon as they walk into a mosque, wherever they are. I don't need to be with them at all times, I would feel safe and they should feel safe as, as well. All of this, it comes from the Prophet وسلم, who said, uh, Anas bin Malik said, I have never seen anybody more merciful to children than the Prophet Unfortunately, we have seen cases, very, very disturbing cases within the, within, within the UK. There was a case of an 81 year old former grand teacher who was convicted of historical sex abuse cases and he was jailed for, for 13, 13 years. Uh, a respected grand teacher within Oldham who abused two, two children. And the last one I've listed over here was a, a person who wasn't actually um, a Muslim, but one day he just decided to, to change his name and work as a volunteer and then went on to abuse children at the, at the mosque. And we can never allow this to, to happen. Fortunately, I think safeguarding overall has, has improved. Um, and what's improved it? Maybe I've, I've tried to sum it up with it within one squiggle, let's just say. 1986, um, some key events that took place were corporal punishment was, was banned. It was unfortunate that 
within schools there was corporate punishment when i went to school there was corporate punishment and it was very prevalent within the the madrasas and the mosque systems as as well so shortly after 1986 it was banned within within mosques as as well 1997 crb checks which are now called dbs checks uh, in the year 2000 it was victoria columbia <clears throat> And after this, after all the abuse that took place and the fact that she went through various agencies, there were major changes to, to child protection policies. Uh, the Working Together guidance was first published in 2010. Shortly after this, the local authority designated officers were appointed. But one of the things I want to focus on is we have a curve and we've brought it, we've brought it down. But well, what seems to have happened is that it seems to have come to a plateau. And what this represents is a small number of cases. And the question I want to ask is, you know, is this acceptable? We have done a lot and we've progressed, but there's a still, you know, we haven't got a watertight system where we can guarantee no cases happening at any point. And the question is, how can we continue to improve? I've summarized it in three different sections. One is as a, as a madrasa, a place of learning. I'll define the madrasa just more widely as well. Within mosques, we have tuition centers, youth clubs, um, babies, toddler, toddler clubs. So whenever we have young people there as a madrasa, I'll focus this section on them. We've got another section just as a mosque, as a whole, what can we do to improve and as a, as a community. So as a mosque, we can undertake safeguarding training. Oh, I wouldn't limit it to the basic safeguarding training that's usually offered. So level one safeguarding training is fine, but as a bare minimum, I would recommend the child sexual exploitation training as well, and then ensure this is updated on a systematic basis, regular basis, which is documented as, as well. Policies and procedures are, are important. We can base most of what we do on the working together to safeguard children, um, as well as DBS checks. It's critical that we don't just do DBS checks, but have a wider range of safeguarding procedures as well. So one of these as a minimum should be reference to reference checks and then competency checks within their within the role of people dealing with their, with young children. Teacher training where teachers, I mean, for those who are not familiar with the, the madrasa environment, we generally have highly qualified teachers within the subject that they're teaching. But generally speaking, they may not have undertaken teacher training as a teacher within a school setting. So teacher training must be taken seriously. It must be carried out on a continue, uh, continuous basis UKM offers this. I'm going to leave my details at the at the end. But wh whatever you are teaching, as well as the subject skill, we need to ensure that there is a teaching skill that is present, and that this is continuously developed as well. So, well, when I started my teaching career many many years ago, autism wasn't uh, so prevalent. Well, it wasn't within my madrasa. But as soon as the, the first child who was slightly autistic came in, I undertook, and the, the whole of the madrasa undertook a, a comprehensive autism training program. Behavioral management, prophetic teaching techniques, all of these should be done on a continuous basis. If I was going to choose one thing, I think, which could improve, which could be the biggest improver of safeguarding, of the safeguarding environment, then I'll probably say it's an independent audit. Um, I'm part, Nili Mosque is part of UK Islamic Mission, which has over 35 mm. mosques and madrasas across the UK. And we have a rigorous auditing process. It's completely independent. And the focus at the beginning is always on, on safeguarding. But we can bring in independent organizations as well. One of the ones I'll recommend is the National Resource Center for Secondary Education, which has a nationally recognized quality mark. And there's lots of good examples of this. Um, one I can highlight is Abzal Nazir. He's the chair of the Catholic Church Safeguarding 
Standards Agency. And even though we're in a mosque, we can employ anybody who's going to be independent and give us a, a realistic report. Within the mosque itself, just the wider, the, the wider mosque, we have to ensure that we have a, a safeguarding culture. We have to be aware of disguised compliance. Now, there, just a couple of months ago in September, there was an independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. The report was called Child Protection in Religious Organizations and Settings. And one of the things it highlighted was this concept of disguised compliance, where it was a tick box exercise for, for trustees. And this should never be the, the case. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. Every trustee, every, every employee. Trustees have to be, have to be trained. And bear you to Augustus's presentation for, for that. He covered that fairly comprehensively. Designated safeguarding Brother, needs. Brother Summer, uh, yeah. five, five minutes. I'll, I'll wrap up soon. Uh, designated safeguarding needs, these need to be visible so the community knows who they are and they should be accessible as, as well. People we can approach at any, any time. Gender and disparity, I mean, I can't do any better than Mariam Hassam, so do refer to her presentation on women in mosques and for the, the youth, refer to the scouts in mosques presentation by Yusuf Eltham this, uh, this morning. One of the things I'd recommend is that the participation of youth should happen throughout our mosque system. So within the, the madrasa environment, we could set up a student council and the mosque itself can have a, a young person's council. The mosque should have a link with the, the local authority designated officer. Whenever there's issues, they should be the first point of, uh, of contact and they're there to assist us. Some of the things that I'm going to mention now in terms of the, the community, they're taken from the independent inquiry into sexual abuse. And it, you can read this. I'm going to include a link of that in my, in my presentation. One of the things that was uh, prevalent was this concept of victim blaming. And we have to be clear with this. The victim is never to blame. The blame rests 100% with the, the perpetrator of the, of the abuse. Another thing that we've mentioned is that discussions of sex and sexuality, they're not really covered and people don't feel confident to, to go to the, the imams. And I'm really thankful to the new generation of imams, such as Ajmal Masroor and Imam Abdullah Hassan, and they've paved the way for these types of discussions to, to be held. Abuse of power by religious leaders. We should respect our leaders, but they should never disempower us from asking questions or for offering criticism of, of them. Another thing that was uh, reported on was mistrust of external agencies within the, with, within the community. In many cases, concerns about external involvement, they're connected with a desire to protect the reputation of a religious organization. But we shouldn't have any, any fear. I've had to work with the, the Lado in the past and they deal with things in, as much with as much professionalism as I've ever as I've ever seen. And forgiveness. I mean, the need to forgive is a central teaching of all of all religions. It's part of our religious organizations. And pressure sometimes can be placed on victims to forgive the abuser. But this is, I mean, this can be a barrier to abuse, but we need to educate the community that this is not any barrier to, to abuse. We're not going to go through this forgiveness. Uh, approach. We're going to work with the with the Lado and follow the procedures as as required. One advice I want to leave uh, leave you with is this concept of minor minor issues. Whenever we see something minor, we for example we've got a teacher and they might have made uh, a student face the face the wall. For me, that's a safeguarding um, issue. They've they've made a child just stand outside, you know, where there's there's, there's nobody else there outside the classroom. Anything can, anything can happen. It's really a major, major issue. Don't consider the minor issues as minor issues. For me, they're major issues. We have to try to minimize these as much as possible, work together. So where one teacher sees another teacher, you know, using a, tech, um, a technique which isn't proactive, then they can report this to management. And management 
of the, the madrasa, the head teacher, et cetera, the wider, wider masjid must take it seriously to make sure it's eliminated. Because if we eliminate the, the minor issues, we will definitely have fewer major issues. And if we have few, fewer major issues, I think we're not gonna have any failures to, to safeguard. And that's our aim, I think, as Muslims. We should never have any you know, failure to safeguard issues ever. And that would be the ideal environment. Zakhlaqair for listening. I've left a few links to the, the documents that I've referred, referred to. And, and inshallah, I'll stick around for, for questions at the, at the end. Jazakallahair, Brother Samar, and apologies for, for rushing you, but um, really, really important topic. Um, Augustus, if you could also share, if possible, some of the links to the resources you talked about and the websites you talked about, that would be great. And um, just before I move quickly on to the next speaker, um, certainly at, at the FMO in Leicester, we managed to um, instill a, a safeguarding madrasa project within our organisation to support all our local madrasas. And that's funded by the statutory agencies. And, and I'm sure if you wanted to learn more about how we went about that and, and share resources, we'd be happy to do that if you want to get in touch. But Brother Summer has also put some wonderful links there. Um, I'm going to now introduce our next speaker, speaker Brother Abdul Rahim Said, who is the CEO at Al Manar, um, who's going to talk about mosque finances and increasing financial income of mosques. And uh, we know that during the pandemic, our masjids were particularly hit um, because of the lack of of, of the de donations, uh, Jumma donations, etc. So uh, I'm sure it would be of interest to to many people listening. Jazakallah, uh, Brother Abdul Rahim, over to you, Abdul Rahman. Even sorry. I think you're on mute. Yeah, Abdul Rahim, Abdul Rahman are all the same, so no problem. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Uh, my name is Abdul Rahman Said. My background is in public sector, in working with communities, in community development and community engagement. And uh, it always involved uh, some kind of uh, a check in on organizations that we fund uh, their financial health, uh, especially when it comes to accountability and finance management. So, uh, generally, I'm not a finance uh, person, I'm not an accountant, but as a manager or in my previous roles as a community sector officer, it involved a bit of uh, understanding of uh, uh, finance management. So, I'll be talking to you a bit about that in the next uh, 10 minutes, hopefully. Uh, if I may share my uh, slides, uh, uh, let me just see that. Okay, that's the slide, I think, yep. Okay, I hope you can all see it. Um, so that's me. Currently, for the last five years, I've been working as a CEO for the Almanar Mosque. And apparently, Almanar has more than uh, one uh, name. Officially, it's the Muslim Cultural Heritage Center and uh, Al-Manar is the center within that institution. Uh, but uh, last four years, because of the Greenfield uh, fire, people started to identify us with the Greenfield Tower and some others also with the Duchess of uh, Sussex or the former Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, and our uh, involvement with the royal family and their charitable work uh, with us. So some people call us, or the Daily Mail at least, once called us the Duchess Mosque. So they're all uh, names we're uh, proud of and they do reflect us and where we belong, inshallah. Now, in terms of finance management, uh, what do we mean by finance management? Why do we need finance management anyway? Uh, what are the risks associated with finance management or lack, lack of it? and diversifying sources of income generation. And then that will conclude, inshallah, my presentation. And I'm sure you've heard some of this, what I'm going to say in previous presentations. So I'll not uh, spend too much time on each of them. Uh, in terms of what finance management might entail is just to have proper checks and control mechanisms in place, having written and understood finance management manuals highlighting uh, relevant roles of treasurers, uh, trustees, CEOs, finance managers, uh, staff, volunteers, and so on. And I emphasize the word understood. Uh, simply sometimes you can have all sorts of written documents in place but they may not be uh, fully understood or equally understood by every member 
of uh, staff or trustee who are involved in one way or another in the finance management. So it's very important our induction processes, our uh, training processes include some kind of uh, uh, checking that these manuals are properly understood so they can be effectively implemented and managed, inshallah. Um, they should also include uh, those manuals levels of authorization. So who can authorize what amount? Uh, it's very important. Uh, and uh, so all the responsibilities do not fall uh, with uh, only one person, whether that is a chairperson or a treasurer or a director or, or, or a manager of some sort. So it's always good to have like um, uh, categories of uh, authorization levels. So every single uh, person involved uh, in the finance management or finance transactions uh, can understand their roles and uh, the amount of authorization they're entrusted with. Uh, trans transactional procedures uh, like purchase orders, invoices, receipts are always important to have in place and to have them also properly uh, documented and recorded for later on any auditing and other uh, purposes. Having uh, processes for regular recording of income and expenditure from petty cash to major transactions uh, are also important uh, factors of what makes uh, good finance management, inshallah. Now, the question is, why do we need finance uh, management? Obviously, most of us, or I think I can say all of us, are faith-based organizations. So it would be relevant to us uh, to highlight that we do have religious uh, duty, uh, as well as other uh, professional and legal duties, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, but there is also that religious, uh, extra-religious duties that we are always aware of, that uh, Allah or God is watching over us. And so we do our uh, businesses uh, properly and uh, we do it to the best of our ability. And these are all a religious uh, requirement. There are some verses that I've uh, tried to quote from Surah Al-Ma'idah, where it says, oh, you who believe, uh, fulfill all your contracts. So when you're employed uh, or you're elected, um, you have a contract, whether that contract is written or it's not, it's still a contract. You have a responsibility towards those who have appointed you or elected you uh, to fulfill. So uh, that's what the Surah Tanisa, which I can relate to this uh, area, could be related to others as well. Uh, Surah al maid I mean. And Surah Tanisa, verse uh, 58, indeed Allah commands you to render trust to whom they are due. And when you judge between peoples and so on, the, to the end of the uh, of the verse. So again, uh, there is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill our uh, trust uh, towards our uh, those who entrusted us with the uh, money or with the institutions that we lead on. And in Surah Al-Nahal verse 91, again, another uh, commandment which says, and, and fulfill the covenant of Allah when you have taken it, all believers, and do not break oaths after their confirmation and so on uh, to the end of the uh, verse. And another verse in Surah An-Nisa is also uh, about who you entrust to. So do not give the weak-minded your property, which Allah has made a means of sustenance, uh, sustenance for you. So when you're appointing uh, people to uh, run your business as trustees or managers or uh, directors, uh, then uh, do that with a proper consideration for their competencies, abilities, and uh, and uh, qualifications and hopefully experiences as well. So you can make sure there is that <clears throat> know-how in place to, to manage the, the, the property or the finance, inshallah. So I can go on and on to quote the verses from the Quran and the Hadiths, but there are plenty which makes it really a uh, religious obligation upon us to ensure our finances are managed properly. Um, the other one uh, equally important uh, is the uh, legal, professional, and the good practice requirement. And that is for accountability purposes, including to our members, to our donors. Um, it's very important that we always make sure our donors are well informed of the finances that they've given us or the money they've given us and how we've spent it. Uh, most donors would have uh, given us uh, money to spend on a specific purpose and they would have the right, even if they don't ask for it, that they their money has been used for the purpose it's been 
uh, donate it. So to prove that, one way is to have that management system in place so we can make sure uh, we can present it to them with all the evidences if, need, if needed and so on. And uh, second is for submission of independently verified or audited accounts uh, to government uh, institutions such as the Charity Commission, Companies House, all this would require us to submit our uh, uh, verified, examined, uh, audited accounts uh, every year and not doing so would be obviously breaching uh, our obligation towards uh, um, the legal, legal requirements of our, of our businesses as a charity, as charities and so on. So it's, it's very important you have a proper management system in place so you can account for them and present the reports in good uh, ways and in, in good time. Um, to analyze uh, variances during the financial year, how good or bad are we doing? It's always good to uh, do that when you have a proper system that you can monitor every week or every month, every quarterly, and you can make sure if there is huge variances between um, the income and expenditure against your budget, then definitely you may need to take action. You don't have to wait to the end of the financial year, but you can take some actions while still early on, and it's better and easier to hopefully uh, resolve, inshallah, if it's a major uh, variance and so on. So it's always good to have that kind of like a finance management system in place, so ways of reporting. Uh, management accounts every month, every quarter, uh, and then those uh, can show you whether you're doing well or not. To forecast the future budget, uh, it's always important to rely on uh, whatever has been going on over the year or the past year or years, and so you can use that as a kind of like benchmark to to see how uh, how better your forecast is in terms of uh, uh, realistic or uh, uh, other measures that you need to make sure uh, they are attainable. So you're not forecasting huge income or huge ex expenditure, but based on your past experiences, you can make sure that your forecasts are closer to, to, realis uh, to realism. Um, to fundraise and manage projects, again, uh, these are also very important when we are uh, managing. It's not just about the mosque or the center, but we may have different projects uh, that requires a different setting of um, uh, uh, recording so we can show uh, records uh, of transactions against each project. Uh, one common one is the endowment projects. So people might uh, give you donations for specifically uh, an endowment project. So you need to make sure you have a proper recording for that endowment project. So all the income comes, does not get mixed up with other uh, income and expenditure. Otherwise you would run up into difficulties. And then at the end of the year, uh, it would be very complex to uh, and time consuming to even separate them all together, if you can at all. Uh, so it's very important that um, you have uh, those uh, systems in place that reflects also the different projects and they don't get mixed up. And that's also one way of uh, accounting to specific funding or donations for specific projects. That's how you can show that by keeping different or separate uh, records. And then to keep finance uh, records safe and for longer periods, uh, sometimes even if we had the audited accounts and all submitted and uh, in good order, but it's still good uh, to keep them. I think nowadays about six to seven years, you have to keep the files uh, in good order. So in case at any point in six, seven years time, uh, you're required to show any evidence of uh, previous transactions, then you have the means to do that without uh, running into uh, difficulties of finding those uh, uh, records. Uh, but always it's good to keep the records, especially nowadays, it's uh, very much like digitalized and therefore it will not be difficult to keep records for longer periods of time, inshallah. Um, there are def uh, definitely risks associated with finance management or lack, lack of it. Uh, there are so many, but uh, I'll just run through some of them. Uh, failure to account, which can lead to legal action and penalties, especially those of you who have submitted to uh, company's house, uh, you, would, you would be aware of uh, the kind of penalties they impose on failure even uh, to submit within the deadline, there, there is a cost to it. So there is a financial cost as well as uh, other uh, legal uh, costs. Um, it can open uh, the door, not having a proper finance management system can open the door wide open, wide open to mismanagement and Allah forbid to corruption, abuse, misuse, 
uh, especially when handling regular cash donations. And within our mosque sectors, it's normal that we do handle uh, cash uh, every week, especially on Fridays, but also outside Fridays uh, through the different uh, uh, donation boxes that we collect the money. But this has to be properly recorded. Yes, the donors may not be identifiable um, when they put their uh, cash on, on our boxes, uh, mobile box or that's a static box either way, uh, but still uh, the records must show uh, money collected from uh, the Friday collection, for example, money collected from the donation boxes, they all have to be uh, shown and accounted for by submitting them to the account, to the banks, and then uh, using them in the proper way that you, you should. Um, number three, not having qualified, experienced, or adequately paid finance officers and managers uh, can uh, render the organization uh, or uh, uh, lend it to high risks uh, simply because uh, you need to run finance with someone who is uh, competent to, to manage it. Uh, not having those just simply to save money or not seeing you or appreciating the importance of finance uh, officers or managers uh, can cause you so many problems. And one of which, uh, of which would be uh, not being able to manage finance properly in the way you should. So uh, it's very important to pay attention to the importance of the role of uh, finance officers, managers for those who can afford it. And also the roles of uh, treasurers within the board of trustees and others who would have to handle uh, money in, in one way or another to make sure they do understand their roles and they can uh, deliver uh, properly and effectively, inshallah. So that's very important. And I always say uh, paying adequately is one way. Once you have the experience and competent, qualified uh, person in place, the next thing to think about is that they're paid properly and adequately so they can be uh, there for longer periods of time. They can also be satisfied uh, to do the job happily and, and, um, and, and in, in a very motivated way. Um, I do understand within our uh, religious sectors, we expect people mainly to be motivated by their religious duties, which is fine, but also life uh, uh, issues can uh, also take its toll. So people would have to move on if they're not paid enough, and that would not be uh, good for uh, the way you manage your finance. Um, the fourth one is loss of trust by the community we serve, the donors, the funders, which can lead to financial crisis and uh, other uh, problems. So these are the kind of risks we can run into if we do not have a proper financial management systems. And uh, my final point is about diversifying source of income. Now it's good that we have a community donation, Friday collection and endowment uh, donations and so on. These are the main two areas of income for most mosques and Islamic centers. Uh, but uh, mosques and Islamic centers uh, also provide other services to the community uh, or different segments within the community. So if I may say without sounding, too uh, irreligious uh, monetizing uh, the categories uh, of services we put uh, forward to our communities is quite important and it can generate us some income, inshallah. So one way of doing it is we have the youth, the elderly, women, and other categories of our uh, community. All these people uh, have uh, services or projects that can uh, be accessible to them. And uh, if we try to link those projects to our uh, funders, including the local authorities or any source of funding and making sure they do meet the criteria, which is again possible, then that can generate us income in forms of uh, fundraising, commissioning or contracting. And if I may example, uh, uh, quote uh, or uh, uh, mention a, a quick example of from my previous experience is the Indo-Chinese elderly project in, in Deptford. Now this project uh, runs an elderly uh, luncheon club. And uh, in my time when I used to work for uh, the area in a local authority, uh, they used to generate uh, income through contracts from more than three Southwest Lon Southeast London uh, uh, local authorities. And uh, through that, they were running an effective uh, service to the elderly community, fully funded through contracts from different local authorities. So, and we do have uh, elderly members of our community who come to the mosque to attend the daily five prayers. Uh, but those people, we can also give them extra uh, support 
uh, whether it's a, a tea club or luncheon club or whatever you may wish to call it, and then also try to connect this uh, service to the local authorities who may have a legal uh, duty to provide services to the elderly community. And therefore, this could be one way of uh, seeking their contract or subcontracting uh, to generate income. Another way is um, uh, creating uh, social enterprising or vocational training um, programs, whether in partnership or on individual basis, uh, to facilitate uh, and improve employability within the community. The third one is um, establishing professional counseling. Now, within the mosque sector, we all know people come to see our imams for advice and religious guidance, but also some of them would come for even just give them some kind of comfort and support. Um, so it's very important that A, our imams are trained to understand symptoms of um, trauma, depression, uh, all sorts of mental health issues, um, but also uh, to have a professional counseling service within the organization uh, is very important. If I may mention here now, again, another example. Brother oh, Abdurrahman, just yes. half a minute, if that's okay. Half a minute, okay. So the Almanar Counseling Service, which is run in partnership with the uh, Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and the NHS, and that has been running uh, successfully for the last three plus years. It generates income from the local authority, but also we do have the professional clinical supervision support from the NHS, and that's been going on uh, effectively. So it serves the community while still generating income. And I think with that, I will uh, conclude without having to summarize. Thank you for listening. And uh, thank you also for those who organized and managed this uh, session. Jazakallah has some really, really important tips and, and guidance there. Um, I'd urge uh, Masjid to, to really pay heed to, to Dr. Abdul Rahman's slides when we share them. Um, and a very, very um, helpful reminder about the skills of the trustees that you know that we bring uh, to oversee the masjids inshallah to make sure that we can fulfill our, our duties jazakallah brother abdul rahman okay so our next uh, speaker is uh mohammed khazbar who is from finsbury park mosque um uh, who is going to be talking about protection and security of, of, of masjids and mosques and sadly as we know uh, in recent times um, there have been um some some quite severe attacks on, on uh, masjids across the country. So um, thank you very much, Jazakallah, for coming to talk to us. Over to you, Brother Saik. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, MCB for this uh, wonderful uh, conference uh, and for all the speakers who uh, already gave their insights about different issues related to mosques and, and the Muslim community in general. Uh, my name is Mohammed Kozbar. I'm the chairman of Finsbury Park Mosque. I'm sure many of you heard about uh, the mosque, about the history of this mosque or visit the mosque. Uh, well, it is one of the most uh, uh, profile, our high profile mosques in the, in, the, in the country because of its history. Uh, Alhamdulillah, now the mosque is, is uh, uh, open for everyone and uh, everybody welcome uh, and alhamdulillah and uh, uh, the work of, 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 of the mosque uh, talk about itself so uh, I'm just here to, to share with you some of the um, experience we have because of the of the history of the mosque you know we've been uh, subjects to different issues uh, security issues uh, islamophobic issues um, the latest one was in 2017 when uh, this terrorist attack happened uh, uh, in the area so uh, I'm, I'm not probably the most uh, experienced person uh, to speak about security i'm sure many of you probably better than me on this but uh, it is about sharing experience uh, uh, and stories uh, on this and and learn from each other on that inshallah ta'ala so brother brother Muhammad, sorry can i just interrupt if you could share if you could do a slideshow we can see your whole screen then inshallah oh, all right uh, at the top if you just press where it says slideshow is it uh, okay? that's okay. perfect. perfect good great um so yeah um i mean uh, we, we are all facing uh, security challenges uh, because of the 
a rise of Islamophobia because of different issues, the media talking about the Muslim community 90% um, of in a, in a negative way. Uh, unfortunately, this is the situation. And th this put a, a responsibility upon us, the management, the security in mosques and the Muslim institutions in general, uh, to make sure that we minimize the uh, security risk uh, in our institutions. Uh, we cannot avoid risks and the risk will be there all the time, but to try to minimize the risk. So uh, as I said, challenges and difficulties is there and, and Islamophobia is one of, of, one of the main issue why uh, mosques being attacked and uh, physically and uh, in, in different, different type of attacks, which we are going to uh, talk about. Um, so the first question is, are, mosque, are our mosques at risk? I, I, I guess everybody agree that yes, we are at risk. Uh, our mosques are at risk, and not just only our mosques, but our institutions in general. But here we are talking about uh, the mosques. So um, we are at risk. And, and we have to deal with it. Um, so uh, what kind of risk we have? This, that, that I mean, list of uh, uh, risks, which, which, which I think uh, it covers most of the uh, security risks in our mosque. So the first one is the telephone threat. Um, many, many of us uh, get sometimes phone calls uh, people uh, threatening uh, the, the mosque, threatening the community that they will do this, they will do that. Some of them, they even put a, a death threat. Some of them, they say that uh, probably you have you have a bomb in the mosque, or we we coming to uh, to attack you, we coming to kill you. We we hear this. Uh, I mean, at least in our mosque, we hear it uh, often, uh, unfortunately. And and this is a quite um, a quite uh, important to. Uh, make sure then so when somebody call uh, and and uh, put these threats uh, in front of you how to deal with it first you need to make sure that you get the time right if you can record the the the, the, the telephone call um, um, make sure to take more details if it is serious because it might be it might be right it might be a fact and and something might happen uh, and, and it might be just only some some people trying to um, you know uh, to um, uh, threat threat the community without without doing anything just only to frighten the, the the mosque and the community so we have to take it serious of course and we have to deal with it properly and call the police uh, of course to to let them know about it the, the second one is uh, well bomb letters uh, by post many of us receive uh, uh, letters uh, sometimes uh, with 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 um, uh, white powder, for example, uh, you 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 will see these letters. It's quite strange with no stamps on it or uh, the, not, not the right uh, address, only the name of the mosque or to the imam or whatever. Uh, sometimes you might see wires coming from these uh, letters, for example, or thick letters. Uh, which means there is something inside this. So please be careful how to deal with it. Each one of these, there is a policy. Uh, to deal, how to deal with it. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, you can you can find these policies. It, it is it is there, and uh, probably we can help if if, if people want help on that. Uh, so uh, we need to be careful how we handle these letters. We need to be careful how to deal with it. If something like that, especially if it is wires and bombs, we need to stay away of it and and try to call the police away from these bombs, either from a landline or even uh, if it is from the mobile to keep it at least uh, 20 meters away from, from that because it might be linked to a, a, a mobile or, or whatever. So this, this is quite serious as well, which we, 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 we have to be careful how to deal with it. The third one is the improvised exclusive device, which is we, we call it IED. This is as well, it's, it's a quite important uh, uh, methods. Uh, people, people use it to, to bring, for example, person with a uh, rucksack or with uh, a briefcase coming to the mosque. So here, the security uh, guards should be very careful on how to deal with it. First of all, if they see these people are strange, they are not from the community, um, they can ask them to check the, 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 the rucksack or the, the suitcase just to make sure uh, it's uh, it, it, it's it's fine. Uh, if you if they found one left in the mosque for for some reason they they 
get away and, and get inside the mosque and put it there, then they have to deal with it as well in, in a proper way, uh, lead the community to keep them away from it. And uh, as I said, call the police as well. Um, don't touch it, call the police uh, uh, from a landline if possible. If not, stay away at least 20 meters uh, in an assembly places or whatever and call the police from there because it might link to uh, a uh, the, the telephone device or whatever so this another another uh, uh, important important methods which we, we we need to be aware about um, the fourth one is the vehicle attack um, this type of attack, they might have a bomb in the in the in the in the vehicles in the car outside the mosque or whatever, or uh, run uh, into into a group of people as it's happened in Finsbury Park uh, uh, area uh, in 2017 when, as you remember, somebody hit uh, worshippers uh, and dur during Ramadan killed one person and and injured many. So. Again, here we, we, we need to uh, make sure that uh, we deal with it in a proper way. Uh, we need to make sure if, if there is a vehicle with a bomb uh, uh, as well to make sure that we um, uh, evacuate the mosque and uh, um, in, a, in a different uh, exit away from the bomb and call the police again, the same things as, as we mentioned before. So this is a quite uh, important issue and it happens. So it might happen again. Uh, th therefore, we need to be uh, very careful. The, the, the last one is the uh, marauding uh, uh, terrorist attack, which is, again, um, the, there's, there's different types, uh, either by guns or by knives. Um, we've seen the Christchurch uh, terrorist attack uh, by guns. This type of things is, is happened. Alhamdulillah, here in the UK, we don't have... Um, uh, arms and, and uh, weapons in the hand of the people, but still uh, some people, uh, they, 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 uh, they, got, they got that and they try to harm others. So this is something which we need as well uh, uh, to make sure how to deal with it uh, in terms of uh, keeping the community uh, safe. So inshallah, in the next slides, I'll, um, I'll speak about if in case uh, an attack like that happened, how we deal, how we deal with it, how we should deal with it, and as I said, this is a responsibility of the uh, mosque management on the security uh, guards, and and uh, uh, why it's important for us as as managers in the mosque to uh, to make sure that these six categories happened. Uh, uh, the first one is, well, whoever is in charge, if they are the the, the security guards. Uh, mainly the security, they have to uh, stay calm and, and don't panic. Uh, because if they panic and they are the people in charge, imagine what would happen to the congregation or those who will follow their instruction. So everybody will panic and it will be a disaster. So staying calm is, is very important, uh, not to panic and, and be confident, lead your community in this very difficult time. And here it comes to uh, when we talk about, about training and about uh, the drills and so on. So uh, the second one is we always hear it from, especially from, from the police, run, hide, and tell. So run when, when, when you can run safely. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not talking here about the, the, the security or the people in charge to run. They need to lead their congregation to run and 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 uh, uh, be in in a, in a, a safe uh, safe place whether it is inside the mosque if they can't go outside for some reason or outside the mosque so this is the responsibility again for the security in in particular so run if you can't run and and leave the mosque then you must hide and everybody must hide. And again, this is the responsibility for the security to lead the community and also for each individual to try to hide in somewhere safe in the, in the mosque. So this is a quite important. The third one is still when, when we have to uh, call, for example, the police and uh, let them know about that. And this we do it after we, we are safe, somewhere safe where we put our, our telephone in silence and, and, and speak uh, quietly with the police to give them the details. So this is why we come to the third one when we call 999 straight away 
uh, after we do these this, this, uh, things before. Um, so calling the police and giving them the details is a quite uh, important. And as the police will ask different questions. So you need to be specific sometimes in your, in your questions so they can deal with it properly. Uh, keeping first aid uh, kit is very important because if, if there is injuries or whatever, so you can deal with it at least until the ambulance or the, the emergency services uh, come to the come to the most to help on, on that issue. Uh, keep evidence. Uh, don't touch the evidence until the police come and they deal with it. Otherwise, it will damage the, uh, the investigation uh, in the future. And uh, finally is uh, to have a witness uh, if, if, if that's possible uh, in case of, uh, of uh, death or whatever. So you need uh, witnesses who, who witness what's happened um, uh, during this, uh, this uh, incident. Um, there is less serious attacks. These, these attacks which we talk about, it, it will um, affect lives, it will affect people, uh, injuries, uh, death probably. Uh, there is much less uh, attacks which might have less harm, but it is still very serious and very dangerous, which we should deal with it. Uh, swiftly and in, in, a, in a proper way. Um, uh, throwing stones, for example, people sometimes they um, they throw stones on, on mosque, uh, breaking glass uh, glass or whatever, or fire bombs try to set a fire in the mosque. This usually happens when the mosque is empty. There is no one there. They try to uh, do that and run away um, and during the night mainly. So this is why it's very important to have your CCTV uh, in place and, and the other stuff which we're going to talk about it later on. Um, the social media attack, we all receive attacks on Facebook and Twitter and out in your website and, and so on in this Instagram. So uh, you need as well to deal with it, to contact the police and report this uh, incident as a hate crime or as Islamophobic uh, um, attack. So uh, the, the, the fourth one is the verbal attack. People con contact the phone, uh, contact over the phone, uh, the, the, the mosque, and, and speak uh, to you and start swearing and, and you know, uh, very offensive sometimes. Uh, this is what we received in our mosque. And sometimes on, on the congregation, on the individual, especially women, because they think they are vulnerable, they are um, um, they, they can't defend them themselves. Probably they think they think that, and 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 unfortunately, most of the women, uh, of these attacks are on women uh, more than more than a, a man. Um, the, then we come to how to prevent such scenario uh, in a short term strategy and long term strategy. Um, when we come to the short term strategy, um, first of all. We, uh, we need to make sure that our staff, the security staff and the staff in general are trained. This is a hugely important uh, training uh, the security regularly, not just only one off train. So uh, training, it, it has to be a regular training at least probably uh, twice, uh, twice a year if possible. Uh, different training, there is different training there. You can contact the police by the way uh, and the police, they can come and do training for the security on these issues. And it is quite useful. Uh, and there is some security companies as well which you can contact to, to do the training for you. Uh, our security forget, they are human beings in, in, the, in, the, in the end of the day. If we don't train them, they will forget about certain steps and issues when something like that happens. So we don't, we don't want that. We want, them, we want to keep them updated uh, and therefore training is uh, quite important. Security policies and places, uh, uh, on, on, uh, security uh, policies in place and updated. This is hugely as well important. We spoke about, uh, my colleague spoke about uh, um, safeguarding policies and security policies is uh, quite important as well to have policies in place. And if we go back and seen what's happened in the uh, Manchester Arena, um, uh, you know, uh, inquiry now, this, is, well, this was one of the very important issue about uh, security policies and if, if there, if there is policies in place or not. So something like that. Brother, is... Brother Mohammed, just two minutes. Okay, so this is quite okay. important as well. Uh, we need to deal with it. The CCTV doors, locks, windows, it has to be fit in purpose. And you, especially the CCTV covering inside and outside the mosque, doors are quite strong. The locks are quite secured, and and so far, so so on the the, the windows as well. A regular fire and emergency drill is quite important to do drills regularly every every month or every two months. Uh, 
uh, for, for your congregation to for, for them to get used in case of emergency so they know what to do uh, you can do it during the weekdays during the weekend in the morning in the and the evening when you have a school for example for children so it's important to cover all all the congregation you have uh, finally the induction to uh, new staff and volunteers if you have new staff make sure that they, they you give them the induction about that the long term strategy and I will end with that uh, inshallah strengthen the relationship with your community stakeholders, your own community stakeholders, whether they are in the Muslim community, your beneficiaries, uh, all, all, all of the, your donors. So you need to make sure that relationship with them and you have to be <coughs> transparent with them, honest, and, and as well to show them that you care about them. So they can, they can be partners with you with you in this and uh, support you, when, you when, when the mosque is under attack like that. Manage any conflict. If there is any conflict within the community, please try to manage it and deal with it straight away. Don't leave it until it become big and there is, then there is a lot of issues in the mosque. And we've seen many mosques around the country what's happened when they leave conflicts between, uh, it starts small and then it become big to deal with build a strong and stable relationship with your other stakeholders other stakeholders we're talking about the police the council mps uh, faith uh, faith uh, leaders or faith community uh, and and uh, and others so try to uh, strengthen your relationship with them because these are the people when you are under attack, when we are in 2000, I'll, I'll finish by that. When we are in 2000, 2017, uh, when we had this terrorist attack, then uh, actually it's, it's, yes, it is the next day when we have 500 people from our local community, mainly non-Muslims come with flowers, with uh, uh, letters of support, with uh, donations to show solidarity with our community hugely important to, to, to deal with it and, and, and to make sure that your neighbors, especially your neighbors, are not disturbed, you are looking after them, uh, your, your local community, the same things, because these are the people who will defend you and support you when you are in crisis. Uh, there's many other things, but I think the time is up. So thank you very, very much for listening and um, I look forward to your questions. Jazakallah, Brother Mohammed, and thank you so much. Um, I think it's it's no no uh, secret that uh, Finsbury Park Masjid has been subject to unprecedented um, uh, security threats. So you know we make dua for for your uh, safeguarding, inshallah. And the point you made about relationships is so so important. So Jazakallah for for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to go across to my final speaker now, Brother Khalid Sofi, who is a charity law specialist and a partner at Lee Bolton Monnier. Um, uh, Brother um, Khalid, sadly, you've just got five minutes and then we need to go to questions and answers. When we do, if I can ask the panel to all put their cameras on um, so that uh, we can take uh, questions from uh, our audience, inshallah. Over to you, Brother Khalid. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallah. I will be, uh, I'll be sh sharing some concerns about regulatory compliance. So I hope you can see my screen. Can I, can you see my screen? Yes, yes perfect. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. So, I mean, we, we start with... Again, so, sorry, Brother Khalid, if you can press slideshow, we'll be able to see the full screen. In the yes, that's fine. Okay, so uh, we start with charity commission purpose, because whenever we talk about regulation, we talk about charity commission. The purpose of charity commission is to ensure that charity can thrive and then aspire trust so that people can strengthen, uh, uh, improve lives and strengthen society. So uh, charity commission basically regulates all charities, which means accepted charities, exempted charities, registered charities, and unregistered charities. The point I would like to make here is that there are some mosques which have not registered. Despite the fact whether they are registered or not, they are subject to charity commission regulation. So I would, I would advise that those mosques who are not registered should register, and it is a duty that they should register. Okay, so I can't go on to the second one. So what attracts the regulator? The accounts, 
their complaints, their filing, filing obligations, and reports for other regulators. They are the reasons when a regulator will come in. So what were the issues in 2021 for the reason for regulator to, to intervene in some? Non-compliance with governing document, failure to maintain records or fundraising issues. So how do you avoid regulatory concerns? The one and the main one is poor decision making. Poor decision making is a crucial one. Late filing of accounts and annual returns or non-compliant accounts. Sometimes it gives commission a reason to look at it and there may be reasons. Complaints about misapplication of money, inadequate safeguarding radicalization is another reason. The complaints can come from anywhere. They can come from public, they can come from MPs, they can come from other uh, professional donors or professional regulators, uh, as well as professional advisors. Internal disputes. Internal disputes also can be a reason why the commission may get involved, although they don't deal with internal disputes, but it gives them a reason to look at it because internal disputes may uh, allow uh, uh, the organization not to function and there can be reports from other regulators. So what do trustees need to do? The first thing trustees should do is knowledge is power. They should know, Sister Mariam gave a uh, presentation this morning, they need to know who are responsible. They are the people who are responsible and ignorance is not a defense. So they need to know what the risks are. They need to know what the governing document says about the organization, whether the finances are, what the policies are. So governing document, what should be they looking into the governing document? What are your objects? What is the scope of objects? What powers do you have and what restrictions are there? On finances, you had a big presentation from Brother Abdul Rahman. Basically, yes, you need to understand the financial basics, get regular financial reports, see bank statements, see budgets, review budgets, and say no or stop where needed. In terms of policies, what trustees must have? Trustees must decide what policies are needed. Uh, they, they should sign up the policies. They should read and understand the policies. They should have them available at meetings and they should review them on rotational basis. And risks are not just financial, they can be reputational, they can be safeguarding, they can be growth. Growth sometimes too fast can be a risk. You need to assess why we are growing so fast, why we are receiving donations. It can be too slow as well. Inception review of projects or over delegation without strong oversight can also be a reason. So what do trustees need? They need skills to administrate the charity. They need, uh, they need, need to understand the governing document, need to understand financial basics, to set and know policies, to be clear about delegation, to write off and sign off, to, uh, sign, off to, uh, sign off their annual report and to make informed decisions. There are my five top tips and then I will stop. Policies, risk, safeguarding, delegation, trustees, benefit, and code of conduct, knowledge, know your charity inside out, board based skills matrix on the trustees board, record keeping. Keep all the records. Make sure that you can show in an audit trail that how you have taken the decision. And finally, challenge, challenge the, uh, the information, test the information, challenge the data, and, and ask questions so that you are aware. I think those are the five top tips, top tips I would say for trustees to be aware of when they are looking at avoiding regulatory compliance. And with that, I, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Shazakaraha, Brother Khalid, that was record time, which has brought us back in, in line with, with where we needed to be. If I could ask all the panelists to put your cameras on, please. Um, so we can go into the final segment, which is uh, uh, just a question and answer panel. So uh, hopefully we've got everybody back on the screen. Brother Abdul Rahman, um, Augustus, uh, uh, Brother Summer. Alhamdulillah, let, let, let's, let's begin then. So um, we have one question that's come through. 
um, which says many mosques do not have any arrangements in place, CCTV, security guards, letter handling policy, etc. What are the barriers to certain mosques and institutions to have the correct security measures in place to deal with these risks and threats? And what support is there available for small mosques? And that's from a brother, Masoud Ahmed. Who wants to take that question? Brother Mohammed? Well, I'll, I'll take that. Um, yes, probably uh, before uh, acceptable in a way or another when when mosques are can you hear me first uh, yes we can hear you um so it, it was acceptable before probably uh when when most didn't have a cctv or or uh, security or whatever and now it's not acceptable um and now the situation is 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 uh, becoming worse and worse and we really need to have in every mosque whether it is small or big, uh, we need to have security uh, measures in, in place, especially CCTV, because if anything happened, how they're gonna report it to the police, what is the evidence, how they can see what's happened, who is the attackers and so on. So CCTV is a hugely important for the, or each mosque. Now, I know there, there is some obstacles, especially financial obstacles for small mosques, probably they don't have the, the, the 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 money or the fund to to do that i think there is different ways of doing that uh, you know asking the community their their congregation the community to uh, help funding for that uh, uh, probably going to some charities who might be interested to do that uh, we have a lot of charities uh, they might help and uh, finally the government there is some fund from the government for for secu for security especially cctv so i think it is very important for these small mosques not to leave their mosque like that because we've seen some attacks in a small mosque and, and the consequences of it. So it's hugely important for them to do that as soon as possible. Very, very helpful. Okay, uh, so we are heading uh, for, towards Asa Salah. So I'm just going to come to each of the panelists in turn um, and ask you, what's your key tip for everybody based on the advice that you've given us today? So if I come to yourself first, Augustus. Um, well, my key tip would be to uh, not just have a policy, but actually uh, make sure it's a policy which is implemented, uh, that everyone understands it, is trained in it, um, it's practical, it works for your organisation, uh, and you publicise it and are transparent about it, and the culture reflects what that is in that policy. Very succinct, thank you. Um, I'm going to go over to Khalid, your top uh, tip today. Yeah, I mean, my, my key tip would be to make sure that you have compliance as part of the culture of the organization. Uh, it's not an extra option, it is a must. Small or big is not, uh, is not an issue. You just have to comply and comply with the law. It's not an extra option. Most important thing we all must follow. Jazakallah, very important. Um, Brother Summer. Um, one advice would be, no matter how good you think you are at safeguarding, is still to have an independent audit carried out. If you've had an independent audit by one organization, try an independent organization another a different independent organization and just be open to what they what they have to say um brother abdul rahman finance finance is the nerve of every institution in arabic we say without finance you cannot have cctv you cannot have anything we want to do so make sure you take finance management seriously more seriously than ever before Jazakallah, very important. Um, okay, um, we are going to break for Asa Salah and back again, I think at 2.45. Um, again, Jazakallah to everybody who's uh, contributed today, everybody who's joined the session to listen in as well. Again, to um, uh, Bates and Wells for sponsoring this uh, segment. Um, and inshallah, I shall let you all um, get a bit of a, a break, a cup of tea, make your Asa Salah. And I believe we're back then at uh, 
Somebody remind me what time we're back. We're supposed to be back at 2.45. It is 2.47 now. So we should give at least 10 minutes for us, prayer, inshallah. Inshallah. So just so, after three. Just before, uh, just before three. Just inshallah. before three, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Like some. Thank you, everyone. Well done, Sister Yasmin. That was excellent, Mashal. Oh, really good session. Jazakallah. Time was running away with us there. No, no, really, Some really Excellent speakers, Mashal. Yeah, fantastic contributions. And I think a really nice kind of, I mean, nice. <laughs> Some of it was very, uh, <laughs> very, very critical. And I guess um, about Muhammad Kuzbar's real life experience probably was a bit frightening for all of us to know that mm. these are some things that we have to think about. And thank you, Augustus. Really fantastic presentation. Thought you kind of really added some some high level <laughs> things to think about but also simplified them too did you in, <laughs> and hopefully i think all the attendees will be able to benefit from some of the advice and guidance sent too and i know i think i think even on just the experience that the mcb's had in the past couple of months we've had some really big national stories in which yeah. more security has been really really critical mm. i don't know about yourself augustus i guess lots of people are coming to you with with certain concerns and issues yeah not, not so much on that side of things but yes on uh, on safeguarding on um uh, you know sadly you know you get a lot of disputes within mosques that we uh, people come to us and ask us for advice around um, governance issues or lack of governance um but you know i think there's been some improvements and you know this conference is just really great um it's a real pleasure to come and speak at it um, because I know that it makes a difference. Uh, definitely, I think we're always looking for opportunities to be able to share with our mm -hmm. members and affiliates what mm -hmm. support there is. And I think that's often yeah. the question, how do we do it? Um, yeah. So we're really grateful to you and we just shared uh, yeah. some of the work that we do. So if anybody does want to get in touch, um, yeah. There's some really good, way, easy ways to do that. And I guess all emails will be coming to you, Augustus. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's great. No. Um, but at some point, it'd be lovely to catch up with the rest of the panelists. I'll, I'll reach out to them and, and also to, to meet you at some point, Zara. To of course. Yeah. yeah. Great. Definitely. Yeah. No, definitely. That would be that would be my pleasure, and I'm sure we can catch up post this conference. Are you um, based up in Are you based up in Edinburgh? In Glasgow, Glasgow. Um, but you will find me kind of wandering around <laughs> sometimes uh, in London. Because <laughs> my, my, my dad lives up in Edinburgh, so I go up there from time to time. Um, oh. Yeah. Well, you can come to the better city next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't do I'm sorry. How, how far is it? It's only like 40 minutes, an, an hour know. on the train. It's not far, yeah. but um, yeah. I feel like I'd be giving ground away if I was to... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if my Glaswegian friends would be very happy if I conceded here. <laughs> but I know, thank you. I'm sure people will be in touch. Yeah, yeah great. Really okay, well, I hope the rest of the conference goes well, and thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And a pleasure to, to meet you, Yasmin, as well. And you, thank you. Really thank helpful you. and interesting. Assalamu yeah. alaikum. Alaikum salam. Okay, great. And uh, this is just another one of our sponsors, Simply Commercial. So you can get in touch with them as well if you need any insurance needs or some things around uh, commercial stuff. Um, I think they're really an excellent organization. So you can have a little look at some of their information too. And I believe we're also going to be playing a video next. So I will stop sharing and pass it to our tech people.
23 million people in Afghanistan are facing acute hunger. The country is on the verge of famine. Food packs like these that Islamic Relief are distributing on the ground in Afghanistan are lifesavers. In each pack, we have 29 kilograms of rice, 60 kilograms of flour, 14 kilograms of pulse, sugar, salt, oil. We're also distributing non-food items, which include female hygiene products, soap, toothbrushes, toothpastes, buckets, etc. In a few weeks' time, Afghanistan will be covered in snow. Hundreds of thousands are expected to die. Time is of the essence. We need to reach as many people as possible. Please donate now.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you so much for uh, persevering with us throughout this conference. And I hope you know people have found it enjoying. We're coming towards our penultimate section, uh, session of the conference, which is about supporting our elderly and families of the deceased post COVID through our mosques. So, uh, just a quick word for our sponsors. Uh, our main partner this evening is Islamic Relief, who are doing fantastic work on the ground right now in Afghanistan. Please look at the comment section for how you can donate and who you can contact if you want to organize a fundraiser in your community. Every little bit helps. And our other sponsors include Bates Wells LLP, Euro Quality Foundation, Simply Mosque and Communities for All. Each of these organizations have a track record of being involved in the Muslim community and trying to uplift the mosques in, our, in the whole of the UK. So do look them up. Bates Wells LLP, Euro Quality Foundation, Simply Mosque and Communities for All. So this section is about something that's uh, very close to my heart because for the last two years, a lot of my time has gone into uh, trying to coordinate uh, the community response towards COVID in the MCB, uh, along with many of our partners. And the impact that this has had on our elderly and the families of the deceased is something that we really need to spend a little bit of uh, time thinking about. Our mosques are best placed to help them. And we have a number of expert panelists who will be able to speak to us about this really important issue that can be often overlooked. I mean, uh, I went recently to a, a graveyard, uh, the Gardens of Peace in London, and I was shown an entire new section that was filled of not one or two, but thousands of people who have passed away from COVID only in the last year, subhanAllah. So I, I want to bring on our first um, panelist is Dr. Shuja Shafi. Dr. Shuja Shafi has had a lifelong career in medicine. He's been a former director of pathology and public health um, and has also been a consultant in medical microbiology. He has an interest in infection prevention and community health pr uh, protection, which is why he's also the co-director of the London-based Mass Gatherings and Global Health Network. And he's got a special interest, especially this is useful when it comes to Hajj and looking at global health with regards to Hajj, but also across all other religions as well. He's been involved in organizing conferences and leading research on that. He's done research, put, uh, done well over 90 publications uh, Dr. Shuja, I don't think I've actually even read 90 publications so far, so well done you for writing them. Um, and of course, he is a former Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain um, and uh, a chair of the Research and Documentation Committee, specifically associated with the elderly and end-of-life care for Muslims in the UK report that was published in 2019. A groundbreaking report. If you haven't read it, please read it. Please have a look at it. But over to you, Dr. Shuja. Um, I'd be very grateful if you could speak to us uh, for the next 10-15 minutes on the role of mosques in supporting the elderly post-pandemic. Thank you, Brother uh, Bawajid, uh, and assalamu alaikum, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Bismillah rahman rahim um, I will um, talk to you about uh, the elderly, um, the, the needs of the elderly, and how the elderly have been affected during the pandemic but also give you a background of what the issues are. So if I can start with the first slide, how do I share it? Um, if we've got it, we'll sh we could share it. Otherwise, you, if you've got it on your screen, there's a share screen button at the bottom. It would be helpful if you could, okay, I'll, I'll just check share. Talk team if we can share it directly, that might be, it might be a little bit easier. Let's have a look. Would it be possible for you to, okay, let me just, um, no, there you I, go. No, if you could share it, I think that would be helpful and I would operate the slides if that's uh, okay. I will double check. Um, yes, Shazal, can do. Would, yeah, I'll do it now. Yeah, Shazal, do. Just, just let me know the presentation, to Dr. Shuja, and we'll, we'll share it in the background. So you just, you, you, you make a start and we'll be sharing it, inshallah. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah. So you, need to, you, you need to okay. tell us when to to switch and we'll switch this slide. Okay. So I can start off by saying, you know, let's just pose a question, who are the elderly? Who is an elderly? The definition and attributes. People find it very difficult to, to uh, properly classify it and find the right wording for it. According to the WHO, the commonly accepted age for senior citizens is most in most nations is 65 and above. But with the increase in life expectancy, uh, this is now a fast growing category of the world population. And uh, there are different terms being used uh, uh, for them because not all elderly cannot I have the same characteristics and their needs and requirements are different. So there is at least one type of classification called young old, middle old and old old. Now, maybe not necessarily the right terminology, but it gives the impression of what the different categories are within subcategories of the elderly. And it's important to realize that because not all elderly are consumptive, they actually even provide a positive role. Um, and, and that I think needs to be appreciated. But um, if you're going on from there to just see what the background of uh, work is relating to the elderly um, and um, and I take you through very quickly this Marmot reviews. The Marmot, Sir Michael Marmot, is somebody who has been uh, who is an expert on uh, addressing health inequalities. And his main uh, re sort of you know argument is that you cannot address health inequalities without addressing the social determinants. So whether it's housing, um, uh, you know, employment, and all these things that make up society are all very relevant to, um, to address health inequality. He makes the point that health inequalities are preventable and therefore, uh, you know, all that needs to be done is um, to take care of the social determinants uh, in addition to the health inequalities that uh, the health services that you provide. Uh, a report, a landmark report was produced, um, published in 2010, making all these points. And that landmark report was again uh, followed up with a 10 year, uh, a decade of 10 years on what has happened. And their findings were really uh, worrying. Um, no change. In fact, he said that they got worse and made the point that inaction is not, cannot be afforded and human economic cost is too much. Now, soon after the publication, the next report came up, which is the um, COVID related uh, uh, impact. And there it certainly addresses the issues of not just all the people, but also the elderly, uh, definitely. And uh, he makes the point that uh, the value should be given to the people who work for older people. So that is where the, that's the context in which we will be discussing now. Uh, and I should like to say that, you know, we've been fortunate in uh, having one of our research documentation committee me, uh, members, Dr. Meherunisha, who was part of this team who produced this report. Um, the, the next few slides we will take through uh, to say that, you know, the numbers of uh, elderly is increasing from 110,000 in 2011, it is expected to go almost four times, increase by four fold uh, by 2036. So we need to do something about it. So what is the, the next one, please? So what is the status of the elderly? Uh, this is uh, information derived from the MCB's British in Muslim Numbers uh, document. Uh, based on analysis of the status uh, of the census data of 2011. Uh, it just shows, for example, the health status of the elderly women is bad and just shows comparison uh, between on, on the right, the elderly women, uh, all elderly women compared with Muslim elderly women. And similarly, you can see that, you know, uh, the, the medications, which is a, a surrogate uh, for, you know, the health status, a uh, lot more much higher proportion of Muslim elderly Muslims are on medications. Uh, in terms of reduced ability to, of, to living, mental health, all these factors are actually uh, uh, bad in terms of uh, uh, the Muslim elderly. 
then this is just an extract from the elderly and an end of life care report that Dr. Vaidya referred to. And this is just shows a range of things that uh, uh, are really important for the Muslim community and the elderly. Next, I'll skip to the next slide. Again, a whole, yeah. Now, one of the identified um, um, sort of needs was that the housing and care for elderly people is very uh, is something that uh, we have often not considered and uh, thought that you know that is not a problem. It's uh, housing is for uh, for the elderly, for the Muslim community, is the, the families can take care of. That is no longer. Uh, um, sort of uh, credible, and uh, and I think uh, we have now uh, a, a an APPG, um, the all party uh, political uh, group, on housing and care for older people, and we have in it a co-chair, Lord Best, who is a good champion of uh, of of housing options for the elderly inspect specifically the BME communities. And there, there are certain, uh, there he, he emphasizes on the importance of uh, taking care of the elderly and the housing needs. And uh, the APPG also has a target of new homes to be developed. And clearly the government and the providers are very, very much far behind the target. Next, please. Um, there's a range of choices of, uh, for the older people for housing, uh, from the mainstream housing where people can um, accommodate and improve their, uh, the conditions in the home, specialized housing and care home. And so it's a range of it, not one size fits all. And therefore, I think uh, one should be aware of and take uh, and, and, and be conversant with this wide range so that uh, we can find the right uh, option. Next. Um, the role of faith communities, I think this is something that is so important and it has been uh, recognized uh, certainly by the church and uh, the Bishop of London, uh, Sarah, was actually the uh, once the uh, chief nursing officer as well. And she's made the point that the NHS is under considerable pressure. And it, if it wasn't for the faith communities and the work that they do, uh, it would have been a much worse uh, uh, scenario. Next. Um, faith communities have in the background over the years done an awful lot and this is actually evidenced by the range of publications and this is no one particular faith community, all faith communities have identified the need and the work for the respective communities. Thank you. Next. Um, We've talked about so what we have done since the publication of the uh, of the elderly care report is engage with uh, people who specialize in uh, housing and Brother Abdulaziz Rawat uh, is a main contact and source of uh, help for us and part of the research and documentation committee of the MCB. But we have also engaged with other organizations like Age UK, Marie Curie, and while we were trying to work out uh, the needs. Um, and see what uh, impact or contribution you can make to the development of the social care bill and policies making. Um, the, the COVID um, set in and uh, we have uh, directed in the last 18 or 20 months our attention towards uh, looking for the experiences of the Muslim elderly uh, along, along with Aid UK and um, the experience of uh, Muslims with uh, life limiting conditions uh, with Marie Curie. My the apologies, it's a two, two minute warning, sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, the next, maybe just next very quickly, just let's go through. Next slide, please. <laughs> There's a lot of work and um, resources available from uh, and advice on how you could work with the uh, communities. This is from the Birmingham, you know, Birmingham Council, uh, Council of Mosques and the PHE. Next one. Um, this is an awful lot of work. Great work has been done by uh, um, the Muslim Co uh, Council of Britain and other faith communities. And here is one of the uh, collection of slides of work in next. 
from the MCB, uh, also on uh, end of life care by the National Council, National Burial Council next. Um, then uh, stepped up, the Muslim, uh, Muslim communities have stepped up their work in, in the light of in COVID-19. And here is the mosque in Bre Birmingham who has set up, which has set up pop-up vaccine clinic. Next one, um, um, in East London, and then uh, next, and then walking mosque. Um, and I can just share very quickly, please, yep. Yeah. Um, the Woking Mosque uh, has had experience uh, is that, you know, the, the recipients, the, the, the beneficiaries of that, those who participate, recipients are 40% of those who attended um, were Christians, non, and Muslims contributed to just about 25%, a quarter of the population which attended, and there are other faith groups. So it is not faith-based. So the mosque, this particular mosque's experience is that it's provided services for non-Muslims as well. Next. Um, and again, ethnicity, a wide range of ethnicity, but under half of those were uh, white um, British um, um, uh, people. Next. Um, so what should we be do? What should we be doing? Uh, uh, the mosque should, I think, you know, should invest in the um, infrastructure. Council of mosques provide a very good uh, way of, uh, of doing that. Next. Um, capacity build themselves and I think what I would do is just say that you know there's so much of this work done and the action should be really capacity build uh, i.e build an appropriate infrastructure make elderly care an important part of the mosque's agenda housing options to be addressed with seriousness uh, collate coordinate the work that is undertaken by mosques up and down the country and share good practice, engage with local and social capital, local government and social capital, aspire to be elderly friendly mosques, dementia friendly mosques. Dementia is a very big issue in the community and there's a wide range of resources available. And I've got in my slides some of the things that can actually be done, but I think the main point is that we must capacity build ourselves, work with the communities and work with the local authorities because they have the reason, uh, they have the duty of, uh, um, of providing these services. We have a duty as a community to work with them and hold them to account and make sure that the local resources that they get are used for our communities. Um, that's, that's all I would like to say. I'll end up there. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Shuja. Such an important presentation. Uh, we're a very young community, the Muslim community here in the UK, but we're getting older. And th this kind of work is something that is so valuable rather than waiting till uh, things become a crisis. So I hope that we can take a lot of this on board. And I've shared a link to the report in the chat as well. So uh, thank you so much. And our, our next speaker is Morgan Vine. Morgan Vine is the uh, head of policy and influencing in the UK Commission on Bereavement. Um, she's worked for many charities, including uh, Age UK, RNIB, uh, Parkinson's UK, and Versus Arthritis. She's an active member of several coalitions and is former chair of the Continuing Healthcare Alliance and the Prescription Chargers uh, Coalition. She's a trustee for Age UK, uh, Bromley and Greenwich. And uh, you know, she was uh, started on her journey by helping a relative navigate the, the social care system, which, you know, to be honest, even as a doctor, I've struggled to work out what's going on half the time, which is which is frustrating, unfortunately. So thank you so much for joining us. And I just wanted to uh, add that our uh, Secretary General, Sister Zara, is actually a commissioner for Marie Curie, and they're doing a survey on bereavement. I know we we used to always come to you guys, you know, the community with a begging ball asking for money, and now we're asking for your data. And I'm I'm hoping that's a step up because we're going to use that data for good. But over to you, Morgan. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone for inviting me today. Um, so as was said, I felt a bit like that was this is your life. Um, so I'm I work for the charity Independent Age. Um, we are a national charity that support people over 65 
we have lots of free information and advice we provide services but we also do policy which um it sounds like you're all very well versed in in terms of trying to get change happening at the top to benefit everybody else basically and um, once you get that change to happen um so independent age is a national charity but we've partnered with Marie Curie with Cruise Bereavement Care who provide counselling in this country for bereavement um, with the National Bereavement Alliance and the Child Bereavement Network and we have established um, a UK Commission on Bereavement um, which as was said Zara is one of the commissioners which we're really delighted about. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk to you about that commission, what it's for, why it's there and how you can all hopefully get involved if you, you would like to. Um, so as I'm sure it will come as no surprise, at, at independent age, we hear from people a lot who have been bereaved. Um, normally, sadly, that's partner bereavement because the people we support are in later life, so often they've lost a partner. And I'm sure for those of us that have been through bereavement, it comes as no shock that the systems just aren't there to support people, whether it be practical things like registering a death, organising a funeral, um, or whether it be needing emotional support for dealing and processing your grief in, in a way that is, is healthy and allows you to move through that grief. So we know at Independent Age it's a problem for the people we support and the other charities on the on the commission know that it's a problem for people of all ages. So I should say, although we support people over 65, the UK Commission wants to hear from people of all ages and all types of bereavement. They're really, really interested. I also want to make it clear this isn't just about COVID. Um, we're really aware that COVID has made things worse, but we know that things weren't very good before that. So the, the information gathering exercise, which is happening at the moment, and I'll pop a link in the chat for people so that um, we can share the links. They're asking for people to share their experiences over the last five years. So if, if people are willing to do that, that's, that's one way you can get involved, sharing your own personal experience of a bereavement that has um, affected you over the last five years. Um, in terms of a bit more information on the Commission itself, so it's across the whole of the UK and we're hoping that we can um, come up with recommendations that would improve things in each nation. I think it's fair to say each nation is quite different um, and has you know different levels of support in place so we want to make sure that we're tailoring our recommendations to, to the nation as appropriate. Um, we also have 15 commissioners from a really broad spectrum of society. Um, the bishop, um, it was actually mentioned earlier, Bishop Sarah Mullally, who was the uh, former um, chief nursing officer, she's the chair of the commission. And then we've got a range of other commissioners. And again, I'll pop a link in um, so that you can read more about them, but they really do cover the breadth and depth of bereavement in this country. So people who work for business, people who work um, with children, who have been bereaved with older people so there's a real range um, and hopefully we're, we're, we're going to be able to get insight from lots of different communities when we're doing this work um, to give some context which I thought might be helpful just because I know when you're dealing with bereavement individually it can feel it's obviously a very very personal thing and I thought giving some overarching context of the bigger numbers might, might be helpful here so some of the research that we've done in the commission said that nearly 40% of bereaved people have difficulty getting support from friends and family. So as you were mentioning earlier, um, it's not a given that family members will be able to step in or friends. And part of that's been because of COVID, but you know, there can be obviously other situations and problems why that just isn't possible. So we know that people are often struggling potentially alone or with a small group to support them through a bereavement. So that was one thing that really stood out to me in our work. And um, also at Independent Age, we did some number crunching about the number of people in later life. So people over 65 who have been bereaved of a partner during the first year of the lockdown. And it was over 300,000. Now, that is not just because of COVID, that could have been for any different reason, but it's happened during the pandemic, which we know has really emphasised things like not being able to attend a funeral, be with the person that you care about at the end of their life and gain support from friends and family. So I thought those numbers might be useful just to put into context why we know that bereavement is really important and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support people who are going through it. Um, in terms of what you can do to support, so as I said, there is, there's an individual survey 
And that is seeking responses from people across the UK, um, anyone who's been bereaved over the last five years who is willing and able to share their story. That survey can absolutely be anonymous, so you don't have to put your contact details if you choose not to. That's absolutely fine. Um, if you do want to share your contact details, it will mean we can contact you if, if we need to at some point, but you don't have to do that. There's also... Um, a group of organisations who are giving evidence. So there's an open call for anyone who works for an organisation or a faith community, whatever it might be. If you want to give evidence on behalf of the community that you support, there is also um, an evidence call for that, which is open until Christmas. And um, both the surveys run until the end of December. So I'll pop some information about that in the chat for people. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to say was if anyone on this call is struggling with bereavement, um, Independent Age does have free resources. So we've got information on coping with the bereavement, how you might navigate the system, um, what benefits you might be entitled to, because bereavement can be a huge trigger for people to fall into low income when they might not have had that before. Um, so if that's helpful to anyone on this call, then I'll pop a, a link in the chat. But I think that's everything. I'll, I'll take a look at the chat in case any questions have come in and I'm happy to stay on the call if there are any verbal questions later. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it was really useful for you to share. It's just nice knowing that this is available out there because uh, I mean, I can't imagine how lost people feel at those kind of times. and. You, you, you almost feel like you're drowning and you need something to hang on to. So thank you for the work that you and your colleagues do and <clears throat> providing that lifeline um, for people who need it really badly. Thank you so much. Um, before we go to our last panelist, um, I'm, I'm going to share a few words myself. Um, and that's on COVID. So we know that we're sick and tired of COVID, but it has to be said that things have changed and we need to take this a little bit more seriously. So what do we need to do? Omicron's here. Unfortunately, the bad news is it looks like the first two vaccines are not as effective. The first two doses of vaccine are not as effective against Omicron, but having a booster dose is useful. Uh, fortunately, so far, Omicron doesn't seem to be something that's um, as uh, virulent or as, um, as serious as maybe the Delta variant was. But what does this mean? Let me be very honest with you. Even if Omicron isn't as bad as, it, we, you know, as, as we think it may be, a small number of people going into hospital, extra people going into hospital right now in the winter, when the NHS is full, when the intensive cares are full, when people already have other illnesses like chest infections and flus, just an extra one or 2% here is enough to bring things to a standstill. We have enough death. We've had enough of it. We have enough children who are being orphaned. We have enough people losing their parents. We don't need any more. All you need to do is put on this mask. Start off here. It's very simple. It doesn't take much work. Look at how easy that was. It didn't cost me anything. We all love a 50% you know, off offer, right? If you go to the shops and there's 50% off, even if you didn't want that thing, you'll end up buying, you'll buy two of them because it's 50% off. Well, this is 50% off COVID. Why wouldn't, you do, why wouldn't we do this? Why do we need the government to mandate it? The government doesn't need to tell us that if you wear this, you're going to help save people's lives. They don't need to tell us that. And we definitely don't need to be fighting back. So please don't tell me about where it's not, people don't wear it or nobody's wearing it on the tube or nobody wears it in the club. I'm not interested. Wear it, save somebody's life. That's all, number one, start off with the mask and wear it properly for God's sake, don't wear it like this. It's not a joke. It's not funny like 90% of people do, just wearing it over here or wearing it like that or taking it off and on all the time. That's not, just wear it. It's not, it's not hard. Our sisters who are in a club do it all the time. If they can do it, you can do it. Number one. Number two, help encourage people to wear it. How do you encourage people to wear it? People forget. We're all human beings, right? So when you turn up to the mosque and, uh, and people are not wearing masks, number one, tell them to wear a mask. That's it. If you tell them to wear a mask, 
most of the people who aren't wearing one will, will fish one out and put it on. Number two, for those who forgot their mask, go around giving them a mask. There's very, very, very few people in this world who, after you tell them to wear a mask and you give them one, who will say, no, I'd rather not wear a mask. And if, if they are those kind of people, then unless they have a valid exemption, then you have every right as a mosque, because you are responsible for the health care of the people who are there at that time, you have every right to ask them to wear a face shield or a visor. There's always a way. Number two, we would advise to keep the ventilation going. I know it's freezing. I know it feels like we're Antarctica, but actually we're not. We're here in the UK. We can manage. As our Scots, Scottish friends tell, I went and complained about the weather in Scotland, which is a big mistake. And my Scottish friend told me off. He said, there's no bad weather. There's only inappropriate clothing. So wear the right clothing and open the windows. If you get, the, if you get air traveling through, circulating through, you reduce the viral load. I literally, I freeze throughout my working day because I have the windows open and a fan running all the time. And finally, get the COVID vaccine and get the booster. I mean, Alhamdulillah, the Muslim community is not anywhere near as bad as we thought it was going to be. There were st statistics right at the start that were saying that literally only 30, 40% of the community get vaccinated. Well over 70% of the Muslim community is vaccinated, but that's a lot of people who still aren't. Speak to them, talk to them, don't have a go. Speak, educate, don't dictate. That's what we're here for. This is not North Korea where you're just going to tell everyone you're going to get jabbed or else. We, we talk to people, we educate them, we, we, we encourage them so that they can get the vaccination as well and get the booster. Each one of us has that opportunity to do that. Uh, I'll finish with one last plea because um, I don't know if many of, you, many of you know this, but East London Mosque, which is one of the iconic mosques in, in the UK, um, in the apartment building next to it um, lives, lived a person who I'm going to use for my next quote. It was none other than Joseph Stalin. Uh, so Joseph Stalin, the man responsible for the death of tens of millions of people, uh, including multi, you know, multi, multi-million Muslims, um, lived next door to East London Mosque when he used to live here in the uh, way back when. And it, one of his uh, sayings, which has a lot of sense, he said that the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of millions is a, is a statistic. So let, let me focus you on the death of one person. Very recently, I went to the janaza of one of my friends who passed away from COVID. He'd recently also lost his father. And he, he was a doctor, unfortunately. He caught COVID in the line of work and he had passed away. He was young. And I, I just want to tell you right now that I don't care. I don't care how many arguments you have for not wearing a mask or not getting the vaccination. But my arguments are his two boys standing at the edge of his grave watching their dad being lowered in all by themselves. And I have no idea what to say to them. Why it's come to this. So we don't need to see any more orphaned kids and we don't need any more heartbreak. We have enough of it in this world. Please take it seriously. And especially in the mosques, you are the trendsetters. If you encourage people to take it seriously, they will take it seriously and they'll pass it through. If you tell them that this is important, you might, you know, you've, you've done this before, you can do it again. Let's show an example to everyone else how seriously we take not only our own health, but that of our wider community, our country as well. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass over because if you don't, unfortunately, if you don't, if we don't agree with what I'm saying, then you're going to have to be dealing with my next panelist. Uh, unfortunately, you may end up dealing with him and that's Brother Muhammad Umar. Brother Muhammad Umar is um, a board member and co-founder of Gardens of Peace, one of the largest Muslim, the mar largest Muslim uh, cemetery in the United Kingdom. He's also the chair of the National Burial Council, an umbrella body for all Muslim communities dealing with burial and deaths. He's a member of the Burial Cremation Advisory Group at the Ministry of Justice. He's also a trustee of the Big Issue Invest and a chair of Oak Park's High School in Ilford and an executive member of the Federation of Red Bridge Muslim Organizations. Um, but to, most importantly for me, he's there for us, him and his team 
uh, Gardens of Peace and the wider uh, uh, National Burial Council are there for us when we need them most. When we're burying our loved ones, when we're doing their whistle, when we're saying goodbye. And he's involved, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say this, he was, you know, he's involved from the beginning to the end, literally at the burial site. And he gives reminders and he holds their family close and uh, it, it just makes the most difficult time in the world just that little bit easier. So, uh, Brother Muhammad Umar, if you could share with us how can mosques help support and speed up the process of burial after death and uh, introducing bereavement counseling at mosques at the end of life care for Muslim patients. Thank you very much. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Wajid, for all your wise words. What we're discussing today, I mean, already touched upon Dr. Shuja, touched upon by Lady Vine, uh, by yourselves. Um, please take it from me. This particular virus is for real. And if you don't believe it, come to the cemetery and I'll show it to you how many burials we've done in one single year. It's double than what we normally do every year post pandemic. So you tell me, even if the most conspiracy theorist is there, if it's not real, can you please explain to me why was the doubled in numbers? Are they NHS killing people? Or if there's a spike in some other specific um, illness nobody knows about, it will account for 10%, 20%, 50% at maximum. So therefore all the precautions which we take are necessary. And it is only for our particular benefit, but the benefit for everybody else as well. Remember our religion teaches us that you should be not a harm to anybody else. So you should protect yourself so before people are safe from you. And just like it's been mentioned by Dr. Shuja, we actually wanted to pass the message in such a manner to give people an understanding that this is for real and can kill. We had three pop-up vaccinations at our cemetery, giving them the message that if you don't and protect yourself, you might end up in this cemetery. That was the message we wanted to give. Having said that, mosques have got a vital role to play for end of life, plus for elderly, and also for bereavement. There is a bereavement, just I'm sure, Lady Man, you may not be aware of it, but we have got the largest Muslim bereavement support service in the country. We set up nearly six years ago for the specific needs for women who actually had a loss of a child, had a loss of a stillbirth, as well as the loss of a loved one. And they were not really having the support from the mosques. And therefore we had to set up a Muslim bereavement support service so that their particular needs could be catered for. From a religious perspective, I totally understand that we've been told that you came from God, you returned back to God, and therefore you should exercise patience. Yes, but we are human beings. At the same time, we need to address that issue as well. And mosques need to find that they should have some sort of bereavement support for their congregations. Why are we very quick to provide everything else from the mosque? You want a wedding hall? The mosque immediately does it. You want some other things from a personal perspective, from a, uh, for, a, uh, for a person who's just been born and you want to give his akika, you immediately cater for it. Why aren't you catering for this? This is an important element of it. And this has been more and more difficult and more pronounced because of the pandemic. So many people, has already been alluded by my previous speakers, were not able to get the closure during the pandemic. They were not able to hold their loved one's hand when they were passing away in hospital. They were not able to attend the funerals of their loved ones in some cases. And they are now going through so much traumatic stress. They are going through so much mental illness. Who is going to be assisting them? Surely a mosque is not only a place for praying your five times salah. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the mosque used to be the hub of the community. Any issues you had, you could go to the mosque. And I urge the mosques that they should open up their doors for a variety of issues which face the community. So they can go there in a safe environment, knowing fully well that they will get the advice from a religious perspective, but also from a practical perspective. This is what as one aspect would be bereavement support. Secondly, I would also urge that people, like already alluded to for the elderly, when the elderly become widows or widower, where do they go to? 
I have so many people who come to the cemetery. They will come every single day. And I ask them, why did you come for them? Why don't you stay at home? They say that I've got nowhere else to go. At least if I come to my loved one, I have a place where I can be, where I can have some peace, when I can have some tranquility. We need to have some catering for the elderly. This is not like back home. This is a new culture in the UK. Extended families do not live close by. Extended families are, the, are, are different places of the, of the country. They need support. And the only family or extended family inverted commas would be the congregation they need at the mosque. Let's do something for the elderly. We also need to make from the mosque, we need to make people aware whole funeral awareness courses, whole courses whereby the community can be advised what needs to be done when somebody passes away, what help is available, both from a bereavement perspective, from a financial perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a practical perspective, all that can be done from the mosque. It's very easy, it's not difficult to do so. If you are struggling in this field, there are people, there's a few local funeral director in your area. If you don't have anybody, come to us. We will try and assist you because we want to make this journey, which is the final journey and the most difficult journey for families to cope with. We want to make that as easy and as peaceful as possible. This is what our whole aspect of it is. Bereavement for the Muslim community really starts when you bury somebody. And that is why it is most effective when you are at the point of when you're burying somebody and you give that words to that particular family at that time, that will really stay with them and that will help with them. Just as Dr. Wajid has mentioned about the doctor, I happened to conduct that seminary. I was there with the young children. I had to console them. I had to hold them in my arms. Why? because I know that this is what they need at that stage. This is important. It is not to be, uh, this is very, those words which you give them at that moment in time will help them heal, not completely, but it will help them heal. Also, I would urge mosques, I'm, I've been told to the volunteers, train your volunteers, just as the pandemic showed that literally elderly people were giving, washing the ritual wash to the people, always elderly people, but God sent us another way in pandemic, in the sense that elderly were told not to watch the bodies because of their risk. And what happened? A new generation of volunteers came up. We need to encourage volunteers. We need to encourage youth to take over and be more, more active in the mosque. I have to say this with a heavy heart. In the last two months, I have had to deal with six stabbing stroke murder cases of young family members. Now the mosque has to play a part in that. We need to give an opportunity for the youngsters. Otherwise, they may end up tragically involved in gang or whatever that may be and end up at the cemetery. And whenever anybody says you're, you're burying a young one, believe me and you, when you're burying the young one and the person who's passed away, the parents are then going to be living a life of misery and a life of death themselves. Because for them, they will be to say, well, what did I do wrong? This is something which the mosque, the community needs to get together. The community, Alhamdulillah, as Dr. Wajid said, Alhamdulillah, financially, yes, we are all fairly comfortable off in that aspect of it. But what we have not focused on is the practical aspects of what our community needs in this day and age. Just as Lady Wine has mentioned, when somebody is elderly, they're worried about it. They come to us and say, listen, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I want to make sure that I do not wish to be a burden on my family when I pass away. Could you please take the money so that if something should happen to me, you are there to ensure that I get a, a burial which is in accordance with our religious requirements. This particular elderly people should be able to go to the mosques as well. They are after all, the local congregation. We should try and help them out wherever possible so that they do not feel alone. So they do not feel that should something happen to that, nobody will be there with them. This is such an important message that we really need to understand. You all know during the pandemic, very apparent, part of the reason why the, our community 
suffered adversely was this inequality in, uh, in health to the communities. Our mosque should be there, promoting good health, getting in to ensure that we educate our community as well. This is something which we can do so that, you know, we have a better lifespan. We have a better understanding of all the health issues which, are, which happen to be in our particular community. And as already been uh, done in the statistics, you can go on the ONS website, the majority of the COVID deaths, which occurred with underlying conditions, the contributory factor was either diabetes or to do with heart conditions. And we all know for a fact, the Asian community is highly prone to diabetes. So we need to educate our community in that aspect of it as well. On a positive note, during the pandemic, I can say with hand on heart that had it not been for the mosques and the volunteers, which actually rose to the occasion, we as a community would not have been able to cope. That's a simple fact. And the, the way the community came together and was already been eluded by Lady Vine in the sense that had we not been able to process all those people who sadly succumbed to this uh, the virus, there would have been a backlog of so many people who would be in hospital mortuaries or public mortuaries who have not been able to have been buried. This was a testament. We married so many people. I can even allude to it in January itself, in January itself of this year, at one point, we were burying 16 people every single day for 30 days consecutively. Now, this was not done because we were wanted to be famous or anything. Now, this was done so that we could ensure that every family member did not have to wait long. They were buried as quickly as possible. And all this comes from faith. You need to have faith in the Almighty to ensure that he will help you. When you reach out to him, he will listen to you. And I'd like to end. I know I'm already over my time budget. I do apologize. But one, one last thing I need to share, because we are talking about in this sector about mosque and faith. I would just like to share two stories with you. Firstly, is of a young man, 26 years of, of age. He, he did not take a vaccination and he contracted the virus. The entire family were vaccine hesitant. The very next day, the entire family decided to take the vaccination. So why do we have to wait for somebody from our family to pass away before we do that? We shouldn't. Secondly, this is a really a faith story, a really faith. Those who have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or your maker, there was, in three weeks ago, we had a case of a family whereby the husband and wife were both diagnosed with COVID and both of them were life support machine and both of them were told by the doctors that both of you will not survive. Lo and behold, the wife died and the son came to us. They only had only one son. He came to us and pleaded with us to say, can you please reserve the grave next to my mom? And we say, we don't do this as a general rule, but he said, please, if you don't mind, because I know that we will only be able to last a day or so. And we, uh, we accepted his uh, request and you will not believe it. 10 days later, the husband was discharged from hospital and he came to the grave of his wife to make a prayer. Therefore, you should always have faith in the Almighty. He is the best planner. Do not lose hope. Just as a community, we should not lose hope. Yes, we have a lot to learn. Yes, we have to do a lot more work. But at the end of the day, we should also have faith in the Almighty that may he guide us on the right path. May he take from us, both the MCB and whoever is supporting the community, the work which we have been told to do for the community's sake so that we are able to discharge our responsibility. Inshallah, may Allah give us that ability to do that for the community with nothing but to pray for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum Thank you so much, Brother Muhammad Omar. It's very useful uh, reflection. And I just, I know that we're a little bit uh, behind time, but it's nearly coming up to Maghrib. So I'd like to finish on a, on a note uh, to the panel um, asking you, what would be 
a reflection that you would like us to take away from you know you, the experience that you've had? This has been a, 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 a experience that's life-changing and that has made us reassess our priorities. What's a reflection that you would like us to take away or a practical point? So if I could go to you, Dr. Shuja, first. Yeah, I think uh, I would say that uh, there's a great deal of constructive work that gets on within our Muslim communities and in mosques in particular. We should not underestimate the potential that we have and we should work hard to make sure that we realize that potential by cooperation and by working not just between ourselves, but also with the people who provide us the resources, whether government or, or other community organizations. Thank you, that was very well put. And uh, Morgan, uh, any thoughts from yourself? Yeah, I mean, just listening to the, the other conversations, it's clear that, you know, you're all hubs of your communities and you're hearing on the ground how people are experiencing bereavement and as somebody said in the chat it can be really different for everybody and um, somebody could go through a very traumatic bereavement but actually cope quite well and other people could have a bereavement that's considered expected and it can be absolutely horrendous so I guess what, what I think could be really helpful is just making sure that resources are being signposted for people gently um, because not everyone will will want them and not everyone will think they need them but hearing from their communities in our research we actually found out that people who were connected to a faith community felt much more supported um, and did look to those faith communities to provide them with with support and information so I think anything people can do to just gently signpost support that's out there would be really helpful. That's, that's a really good point, actually, and that's, some, that's a role that we can play as MCB, signposting to all the different uh, resources out there. And Brother Mohamed Omar? Yeah, I would just simply say to echo uh, during this time is to please try and uh, follow the guidelines uh, for COVID at this moment in time. I don't want to be busy. I would rather not be burying anybody at all. And, and I would really urge every one of you Whoever is listening, and please, if you are not here, pass on the message. We should follow the government guidelines. And lastly, but most importantly, there should be better cooperation between mosques so that we can provide a service which is befitting for our community. There is no need for each mosque to provide everything, but if a hub of mosques could get together and specialize in some of the issues we've discussed today, that would be much more beneficial to the community and will be making better utilization of the, of the money which the public pays, uh, public donates towards these institutions, and that's best way. And obviously, if you don't support the MCB, then you've got only yourself to blame to say that way is the Muslim voice. Jazakallah, thank you so much, and especially for that plug. Uh, Sister Zara, uh, right, can you just give me the money afterwards? I'll send you my thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Brother Mohammed. Glad to ride through that way. <laughs> so you're after you. Um, I just wanted to humbly and sincerely thank you all. Such poignant reflections, Brother Muhammad Omar. I think you've made us all emotional, and Dr. Wajid as well, Morgan and Dr. Shuja. The work that you have personally been pioneering on um, and working on are these areas that we are we struggle to talk about the difficult conversations, but they impact every single one of us, no matter what age we are. We are going to come into contact with bereavement. And it's a very difficult journey. So I want to just really appeal to everybody on this call. Uh, please do take part in the UK Bereavement Commission. This evidence will help us improve resource access services and really um, paint a clear picture of what is going on and how it impacts our communities. Um, for those in this call that are on the front line of providing services, please do continue to support. And as Brother Mohammed Omar said, we have to show unity of purpose and really deliver here because it's everybody all over our communities. And as Dr. Shuja said, it's an ongoing process of care strategy, it's commitment, and you know, it involves all of us in a partnership-led approach. And um, so just thank you sincerely on behalf of the Muslim Council of Britain for taking your time this evening. And um, I know back to Dr. Wajid, I think we need to break now. Yes, it's now time for Mughal prayer which everyone has 10 minutes for. I want to, this is the end of the session. And the next session will be the Mosque Awards, uh, the OMOF Awards. Please do come back for that at four on the dot. It gives you a good nine minutes to pray Maghrib, to pray it nice and comfortably. And I just want to make this last point. I know there's a lot of us saying mosques need to do this, mosques need to do that. And that can be frustrating for mosques, but 
the community is not separate from the mosque, just like our affiliates are not separate to MCB. We're one and the same. So when we're saying that mosques need to do this, what we're really saying is we all need to do this because the mosque is part of our community and we are part of the mosque as well. So this is a responsibility for everyone. And uh, thank you to all my panelists. And uh, I hope you all stay safe. And we'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Take care. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. I'll just mention our sponsors again. Islamic Relief um, is our main sponsor for this uh, event, as are Bates Wells LLP, Euro Quality Foundation, Simply Mosque, and Communities for All. So please do um, look into them. They're doing great work to support mosques in the community. Um, and uh, if you want to find out more, please let us know. Thank you for joining us all and thank you so much Morgan for coming on. Take care everyone.
Assalamu alaikum, brother Salim. We meet again. <laughs> How are you keeping? Oh, you're on mute. Yes, yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Are you all right? I'm well. How are you? Nice to see you on this side of the world. <laughs> I know you're right. Um, I thought it's time I, I got involved a bit more in sort of the MBC, MCB stuff. And when, when this came up, I thought, alhamdulillah, brilliant. I, I can sort of actually in, 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 get sort of introduced to all the members there as well. And, and mm. it's amazing all the fantastic work that everybody's doing. Absolutely. Wajid, are we ready to go or? I think so. I'm just checking if we are back on Facebook live. Going live now? Uh, yeah, we're good. Okay. Alhamdulillah, wa alameen, wa salatu wa salatu wa salatu wa salamu ala shufu al-anbiya muslimi nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa alayhi taslim min jami'an kathira. Thank you for coming back for our final session, the MCB OMOF Awards 2021. I'll hand over to our uh, chair for this session, our Secretary General, Sister Zahra Muhammad, to introduce the awards and uh, hand them out virtually, of course. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wajid. And I guess this is the, um, the most exciting part of the night and probably one of the hardest um, challenges for our team because it's our first uh, Our Mosque, Our Future Awards. And we had the, um, well, some of us on the judging panel had the very challenging task of trying to decide who we should give these awards to. We had over 160 uh, nominations, mashallah, and with over 500 affiliated organizations, uh, so 140 nominations, you can imagine the challenge it's been to actually award and shortlist. So I'm really glad that we'll be able to share who we're shortlisting for these awards and also who is one. The processing of judging, it was a, a panel of independent judges who assessed each nomination that you submitted, as well as supporting material. Um, so we really did look at the facts and the evidence and most notably the impact that you've all been making throughout this. And I should caveat that there are plenty of mosques that didn't get nominated or, or you know, maybe perhaps missed that these awards were happening. Um, so we still pay tribute to everybody. And I think this is really just a, an amplification of the great work that's happening, but definitely not a limitation to it. So I'm going to begin um, with the first award of the evening. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Islamic Relief who is sponsoring this award. And that is the MCB Changemaker Award. And the award for this category is for an initiative that um, people felt uh, a mosque or Islamic organization has delivered that has had the greatest benefit to wider Muslim and non-Muslim communities. And we saw such an incredible range of activities and events, whether that was delivering um, food banks on the ground, feeding the homeless, whether it was the interfaith work that you were doing, and um, most notably during the pandemic, there really wasn't anything that Muslim communities weren't doing. But, you know, I want to congratulate firstly our finalists in this category, Masjid Ibrahim, Aliman Center, Azmat Islam Mosque, Al Hidaya Croydon, and the British Islamic Medical Association. Um, I feel like there needs to be a little drum roll, <laughs> but um, what I will say, are you gonna drum roll Brother Wajid? <laughs> what I will say in this introduction- I've, I've got a drum roll audio somewhere. I'll find it. Okay, you get that ready and I'll introduce, uh, I'll do the, I won't say the name yet, but I will introduce the, why they have won. So the winner of this award in particular is an organization that has truly saved lives across the country. It started off with a handful of mosques and over the years, this annual event has grown to over 300 mosques and even actually is international worldwide and has been taken part in countries globally. And this organization has helped train thousands of people over the years to help save lives themselves and going from strength to strength and its impact is cross community cross faith and cross background with over 15,000 in attendance and um, so I would like to congratulate why did you got the drum already <laughs> the winner of this award uh, which is the British Islamic Medical Association congratulations and as you can see here what an incredible array of work that they have been doing. I've got so many friends, colleagues, relatives that have actually taken part in this incredible, um, incredible award. So I'd like to bring on um, someone from BIMA is going to be speaking uh, to uh -huh. accept this award. 
Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, hi guys, I'm Amira. Um, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum guys. Um, Jazakallah khair for this award. Um, we're really, really privileged to be receiving the Changemaker Award today. Um, it's a great honour. Um, I just want to give a huge thanks to the Lifesavers team, um, to the Executive Committee and the Council um, for the part that they played in supporting and shaping Lifesavers. Um, it's helped to go from strength to strength and, and to grow um, across the nation. Um, and Alhamdulillah, you know, as um, mentioned earlier, we've grown internationally as well, which is an amazing thing. Um, I also want to thank each and every volunteer, um, every mosque committee and mosque um, that has been such an integral part of this astounding success. And, you know, we really couldn't do this without the mosques and the masajid, like um, they play a pivotal role in opening their doors um, and they've really helped sort of um, make this what the success that it is. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and also we've been able to propagate this um, through the mosques as well um, and play our part in saving a life and saving mankind as well. So it's a huge honour. Um, we pray that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts our efforts, um, the efforts of the volunteers and rewards them abundantly for their hard work and their dedication. I mean, and on a personal note, like I just love being part of this process. So inshallah, I hope I can continue to be part of this as well. Thank you. Jazakallah Kara, thank you so much, Sister Amira, and congratulations to everyone on BIMA on our behalf. Um, okay, I think we're going to move on to the next award. Um, and I'm just going to switch over. I think our tech person is just going to yep, share screen for us. Uh, so the next award that we have is the Community Empowering Award. And this award category is for the initiative that members and attendees felt, um, sorry, those who are voting, uh, nominating felt um, is an organization that has delivered the greatest impact for minority communities um, and the minority that includes ethnic minorities, black communities, those with disabilities, refugees and any, any other groups. So really what we wanted to highlight as the MCB is our organizations that are really inclusive, accommodating and accessible and I think that was part of the earlier theme in the day. So it gives me great delight to share the shortlist here today, a number of organizations that we're very proud of in their incredible work, Anahuna, Cosmos, Al Manor, uh, Finsbury Park Mosque and Kisra Mosque, who have done astounding amounts of work in terms of local community engagement or actually pushing the boat and starting up their own organization to take care of the needs of those uh, most vulnerable in their communities. And the winner of this award is a mosque in the UK that has supported refugees, those traveling from the UK to Cali that's provided hundreds of clothing items and um, supported the needy across their communities, has even pioneered weeks like Autism Week. And they've also facilitated, as you can see, clothes for the homeless and so many other org, um, initiatives and events. So I would be delighted and honored to congratulate the winners of this award to Finsbury Park Mosque. Um, who also kind of did a presentation today on not just all the things they've been doing for communities, but also the things they've been doing to strengthen their own mosque and keep everybody safe. Um, so Brother Mohammed Kuzbar, are you here to share some words? Or I believe, sorry, somebody else from, um, is it Sister Aswa? Yes, that's right. If you would like to unmute. You're on mute, Sister. Can you hear me? There is a little bit of feedback, so it could be that maybe your phone is near your laptop or um, something is interfering with the signal. Shall we give it another go? Sorry, sister. I believe it's it's uh, Brother Muhammad Kuzbar that is taking this award from Finsbury Park Mosque. Is that right? We're having. Some yeah, it's Muhammad Kuzbar. Yeah, Brother Muhammad Kuzbar, are you there? Gosh, the technology just doesn't want to support us today, does it? 
السلام عليكم. Maybe. I think that's just uh, no. Apologies, sister Asma. I think it's just uh, the, the we we called you at the wrong time. We were, ca we were calling Brother Muhammad Kuzbar, but we're trying to get him onto the program. I'm sure he's here. What somewhere. I would suggest is there he is. I've got him. Oh, you got him. Okay, great. There we go. Just to promote to panelist and. Uh, I think you might need to accept it. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hey, Sorry, Brother Mohammed. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Congratulations. Uh, well done to Finsbury Park Mosque. You can add it, your, well, add it to your trophy case. We will give you something in person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, this is around for the MCB team. It, it is an honor uh, to receive such uh, an award, actually. And it, it is, I'm, I'm really glad and happy that now we have some recognition for many mosques who are doing great job out there for, for the community, uh, uh, from, from Scotland to, to Wales, actually, for all, all over the country, alhamdulillah, a lot of good work, positive work from the mosques. So recognize uh, uh, is, initiative and I, I I hope that this will uh, be like an annual uh, awards inshallah ta'ala for uh, different mosques uh, uh, in, in the country who as he said doing a great job uh, just uh, in terms of uh, about our awards alhamdulillah I mean we all uh, watch what's happened two weeks ago uh, the, the, the tragedy uh, where our, around 27 uh, people died in the sea, um, uh, trying to cross the, the, the channel to get a better life here, away from uh, war, away from uh, um, conflicts and, and so on. So um, it's a break heart. You, you break your heart when you see such things happening. And uh, for us as a community, it's in our responsibility and our duty to help these people who came of them. They came without only with their clothes on them because they came by boats and nothing, nothing else they can take. So it is something which we have to work as a community, as mosque to help them, not just only um, uh, to keep it for other, others to help, which is great, but we as a community, because many of them all, therefore it is our responsibility to do that. And we will keep inshallah ta'ala helping and supporting uh, on that and working with other charities. So is that khair for that and uh, uh, all the best for the other uh, winners, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and inshallah, we'll move on to the next award. And we'll look forward to seeing you in person to deliver that. And of course, I think you're providing the tea that day, uh, inshallah. So I'm going to move on to the next award now, inshallah, which is the, the Community Champion Award. And this is an award that is really about uh, an organization that has really had the greatest um, impact. Sorry. Um, yeah, this is our, for the poor, needy and the homeless. And I think and we have had, again, an incredible range of organizations that have really pushed the boat when it's come to championing our community, some of which we've heard today. So I'm delighted to share the finalists. Uh, the Masjid as Sajideen, Gardens of Peace, Masjid Ibrahim, Bolton Council of Mosques and Kezra Mosque as well. Um, and I know that actually one of the things that is really part of our faith is giving back and making sure that those who are most vulnerable and destitute um, are always given someone to, to lean on and some support and kindness. And um, this award is sponsored by Euro Quality Foundations. So we'd like to thank them. And the winner of this award is an organization that has helped the homeless and the needy over the years starting with support from food and drink to the most difficult times of their, and, and supporting people in the most difficult times. They've buried over 2000 people in a year and have provided advice to the community on how to deal with guzzle, a burial for the deceased from COVID. And they've also arranged a, a burial fund and what maybe spoke about today, um, issues around bereavement and support too. They are the largest Muslim cemetery in the country and they're open every day of the year, supporting Muslim communities at their most difficult. Um, and they've continued to provide that necessary outreach. And I guess I'm very humbled <laughs> to congratulate them on the vital work that they do. 
and, and of course the winner is Gardens of Peace and I'm delighted Brother Muhammad Umar hopefully you'll offer some positive words this time <laughs> as opposed to uh, uh, the heart wrench uh, heart wrenching stories that you shared uh, previously but I think this is maybe just a small token of appreciation for all Muslim communities to you um, for the incredible work you have been doing especially during this pandemic so over to you to share a couple of words uh, I'm really delighted to accept this award from the MCB on behalf of our chair, Mabu Patel, and the entire team. This is not an individual award. This is an award for the entire organization. We are truly very proud and humble that you've recognized what we are trying to do for the community. We're not trying to seek any fame or fortune from that, but certainly it has been a very difficult time. The last two years has been extremely difficult. Our motto has always been is to help all those people who are vulnerable, be it at the time of death or be it at the time of their personal lives as well. And unknown to a lot of you that Gardens of Peace did and have worked for several years with the local community in terms of homelessness. Every year during the Christmas period, we have always supported them with food. We've supported them with warm clothes. Uh, we've been with them as well. So we, as Gardens of Peace, just want to ensure that there should be nobody in this country who are not buried on time and is a Muslim faith should not be, uh, should not be buried without the issue of funds. Funds should always be secondary. We as a community should ensure that whatever, can be, whatever conditions they are in, they should be fully afforded their ritual rights. And that is what we have to do. And lastly, it is only possible what we are doing is with the guidance and the du'as of the entire community and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. I can tell you quite categorically that the numbers of death we did, none of the other cemeteries would have been able to do so. And we were only able to do so because of the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and that is something, that's why our faith it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And I also pray at this time that it is a, a really good initiative on behalf of the MCB to start recognizing all those mosques who are doing a wonderful job and they want encouragement and they want recognition, not because, but they just want to be appreciated that doing something which is being contributing to the society and to try and ensure that the Muslim community is a giving community, not a receiving community. And that's what we should be doing all of them. So thank you very much once again, and Jazakallah khair. And as I said, I take this award, not on my personal day, on behalf of my entire team who have worked relentlessly during this particular COVID period. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. And I look forward to delivering that to you, Inshallah, with a giant box of chocolates, which we can both share. Um, you know, <laughs> after getting through this call. And, and, and I promise, inshallah, that you come back alive and I'll send you back alive as well, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you shouldn't speak to funeral directors. <laughs> the jokes are so dark. Um, just like I care. No, thank you for that. At least you made us laugh after making us cry. Um, and the next award, inshallah, is the MCB Community Kindness Award. And it's actually in that spirit that Brother Muhammad spoke about that we wanted to recognize the efforts that our community is making. And this, um, this award is really for an initiative that you felt has delivered the greatest impact on supporting the elderly community. And you know, when we talk about the, the concept of kindness in Islam, it's really about the very little kindness that we do in, in giving our communities that support. And sometimes our elderly are often left behind. And so the finalists for this award um, I'm, I'm really, you know, humbled to see our Old Kent Road Mosque, Hounslow Muslim Centre, Frenzy Park Mosque, Masjid Sajdeen, and Kisra Mosque, all of which have provided fantastic outreach to the local communities. They provide space. They also supply, uh, provide, uh, provide that pastoral care and support for those who have been, I guess, sometimes forgotten and sometimes are very lonely and isolated. So the winner is an organization that has supported hundreds of older men and women from the, their own older age group that have been um, attending the mosque or part of. They, these include supporting them uh, with their needs from the local council, having one-to-one -one talks and seminars, a tree or shrub planting session for relatives of the deceased, 
They've held gardening sessions where the elderly attended to water plants and look after the environment. They arranged a chai and nasha session, as well as a, a newspaper reading session where people have been able to come together and socialize. They've had um, worked with wildlife trusts and go on walks together. And they have regular Islamic programs on different topics, including wills and inheritance. They also provide food packs, um, table sports and other community initiatives and good work. And uh, finally, they, you know, as the list does go on, they have really brought together their local communities and provided a source of care and support. And so I'd like to announce the winner of the MCB Community Kindness Award as Masjid Issa Jadeen. Um, and I'm very delighted to have Brother Salim Sadat, the chair of Masjid, um, to come forward and take this award. I actually personally met, I should say, Councillor Salim <laughs> on my travels and visits to Blackburn and was so impressed by the work that they were doing. I'm really delighted that we're, I guess, getting to meet again today um, and really kind of provide you, I guess, with this award. Yeah, Jazakallah. Sorry, I'll just stop my video. I forgot that. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Sister Zahra. Asalaamu Alaikum. It is great honour to receive this award on behalf of all the members and volunteers at Masjid al uh, I'd also like to take, this, to take this opportunity to thank the volunteers uh, who helped out, who helped throughout all the masjids throughout the country. I think without the volunteers, all the masjids would not be able to work as they do now. Uh, and I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them in this world and the hereafter as well. Um, as the chair, I think we have to take our role seriously uh, and with a lot of passion as well to make sure that we achieve all our aims and objectives. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity, I think, to thank sort of the MCB and all its executive committee members for a very interesting seminar on all the work that has been carried out throughout the country. Uh, and inshallah, I think um, from us up north, we would like to do a lot more with the MCB in the future as well. And Jazakallah khair for everything from the MCV. Oh, thank you so much, Brother Salim. Thank you for being wonderful hosts in my visit. Um, and we've enjoyed some very good tea together, didn't we? Uh, so my congratulations to, to your mosque, to all the volunteers, and inshallah, I hope to visit as well uh, in my second trip. Uh, and exactly. look forward to seeing you then, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Well, okay, we're, we're on to our final award, and this is the MCV Star Mosque Award. And again, to align with our conference objectives and wider strategic approach, really wanted to highlight a mosque that was working to deliver the greatest impact on supporting women and empowering Muslim women, especially in terms of leadership, access, responsibility and engagement. Because we know it's not just about having a space, but it's actually the, the change in culture and approach to inclusivity that is really fundamental here. Um, our finalists include the Old Kent Road Mosque, Masjid Ibrahim, Leeds Grand, Leeds Grand Mosque, and Hounslow Muslim Centre as well. Um, and, you know, I think the award winner for this uh, particular award is a mosque that has um, really done a lot in terms of in inclusion with a wider community. Um, I think actually the finalists there's one finalist not on this list, um, which is probably good then when I announce the <laughs> award, uh, you will really be surprised because um, they're not in our finalist category. So um, uh, accepting that omission, the, the grand winner is a mosque that has had um, exclusive relationships with the royal family. They've set up a, a kitchen to support women after a very notable Grenfell disaster. They've had women lead initiatives. They've had a food festival, which has really been led by Muslim women as well. They've shared, they've shared um, with local communities. They've worked with local councillors, organisations, had online sessions with Christian Backer, a famous revert. They've had a famous hub community kitchen, which also produced a very famous cookbook. And they've had women uh, participate in all activities from leadership to general volunteering. Um, and I must admit, visiting the centre myself, it truly is an inclusive place um, where you're always met with a warm and cheery smile. I myself stayed there during a student conference overnight um, and I just thought the place was incredible. So I'd like to announce our award winner, which is the Almanar Muslim Cultural and Heritage Centre. And you can see that there isn't a day that goes by where they aren't actively housing <laughs> people actually sheltering the homeless as well as having this incredible kitchen in which they've helped women some of these women have actually gone on to start on their own businesses 
and to provide and sustain themselves. So congratulations. And I'd like to invite Almanar um, to maybe share a couple of words um, and take this award. And I believe it's Sister Asma. Pending your microphone is working this time around. Oh. Yeah, it seems that maybe your microphone doesn't like doesn't like the session today. Um, I don't know if um, Brother Abdurrahman is also maybe still on and maybe he could share a couple of words. But if not... Um, he, he's there. He, he's there. Yeah, Brother Abdurrahman, are you there? Maybe you could share a couple of words. Uh, just in case, uh, Sister Asma, if you have any phone or if you have it on two different devices, yeah, that's yeah, when there's yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I have no, 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 oh, okay. uh, uh, sh Shall I sign quickly in my phone? Hold on. Yes, it might be an yeah, idea. Sure, why not? Yeah, why not? Um, whilst that little technical issue is being overcome, I probably just wanted to share a award that I'm sure there's many. I mean, look, we have over 500 affiliates and we had uh, five awards today. I know there's one special award coming up as well. And um, of course, we would like to take a moment. Or I would like to take a moment to personally thank all of our organizations, our mosques, our Islamic centers, our charities. The work that you do sometimes is not recognized. Uh, and certainly this is a step in the right direction for us to be able to recognize it. But truly all of this work is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think what's really wonderful about this evening is that we've heard from community groups that are really trying to make a difference. They're really working on the ground, they're dealing with the best of it and the worst of it. And what we thought of the MPD um, under Dr. Shafi was really to think about how should we a small token of thanks. And I don't know, uh, Brother Abdullah, you're here. So perhaps you could maybe share some words while Sister Asma gets her microphone. Yeah. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and uh, apologies for that um, technical problem with uh, Sister Asma's uh, mic. Um, I would like to appreciate and thank all um, uh, management at uh, MCB. And for the award as well of appreciation, I do that on behalf of our trustees, uh, staff, volunteers, and the very women who have been really active participants in our community activities. And there's so much to be said about them, really. Um, they're always at the forefront when it comes to uh, overcoming uh, calamities, uh, whether it's the Greenfield fire or even the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, especially the initial lockdown last year. They were very active in supporting the NHS uh, staff and um, uh, pop-up clinic uh, volunteers and others. So thanks goes to them and inshallah we'll be happy uh, to celebrate this uh, award with them as well as uh, others who are stakeholders in this center inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much Abdurrahman and our apologies that Sister Asma was not able to to speak due to technical problems. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, um, your smile <laughs> alone is just so uplifting by the other man, I think. Thank you. Mr. Do you want to give it another go? Should we try? Do you want to see if it works this person? Well, I'm really sorry, Sister Asma. I think unfortunately your uh, microphone is not working. But uh, inshallah, we'll come down and we'll give you, you the award and we will take a special moment for Sister Asma to share what she was going to share tonight. Um, but we'd be happy for maybe if you leave a message for everybody on the chat facility today. Um, and, and, and we'd like to just proceed because I know we're going to finish the conference soon with a very final special award, um, which we didn't have part of our main awards this evening, but was really a special recognition. And we heard from the last session just how hard some of our communities have been working to support uh, us all during this pandemic. And this award is sponsored by Islamic Re Relief. And there's, you know, the key workers that we speak about and that we've clapped for, but really the people at the front line. And sometimes they haven't gotten quite as much as the recognition that they've deserved. And they've really done such a phenomenal job in keeping us 
uh, and our families really at the forefront of their care. And that is really for the Muslim funeral services across the UK. Um, you know, they have been, I guess, silently taking care of our, us at our most needy, at our most desperate, at our most vulnerable. Um, we've heard from Brother Muhammad Omar some of the hard, hard stories, and Dr. Wajid as well, about how difficult this has been. Whole families, generations of families that, that have lost their lives, people who've lost their mother, their father, their siblings, and are quite alone. I know personally, and a friend of mine who said that all she wanted during the first part of the pandemic was a hug. And the only contact she had was with these funeral um, providers and carers. So this is really an appreciation award from the Muslim Council of Britain to the funeral services across the country. And they have been there for our mosques, they've been there for our community, whether it was doing ghusl or making arrangements for PPE and training hundreds of thousands of volunteers probably across the country, organizing the cemetery space, working with the NHS, um, the list goes on and on, but really this is a special recognition to all of you. And I really hope that we can all keep all of the individuals that we see, do, don't see, and that we maybe don't even hear of, um, to really thank them for this award. And I believe someone from the National Burial um, Council will be taking this award and, and maybe sharing some words as well. But thank you so much on behalf of the Muslim Council of Britain and our British Muslim communities. Assalamualaikum. Brother Ismail, welcome, Sam. Um, uh, good, good evening, uh, Sister Zaras and everybody at the Muslim Council. We really thank you for giving us the opportunity to receive this award. I'm extremely honored. We've got Brother Muhammad Umar there as well, who is the chairman. And I'm honored that he's given me the opportunity to take this on behalf of the core group of the National Burial Council. We are earnestly grateful for being recognized of the effort and commitment to the funeral, sec uh, funeral sector of the Muslim community during the pandemic. Alhamdulillah, we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving our community the strength and courage to come forward and ensure that we were able to fulfill the rights of the marhum Muslim brothers and sisters. May Allah embrace them with all his mercy and grant them the best of abode in general for those. I mean, National Burial Council is proud to have been available to give up-to-date guidance to the community at a time of uncertainty. Is it safe? Is it not safe? to do Gusar. It was good to learn that the government recognized the workers responsible for management of the deceased and were officially categorized as key workers. As a result, MBC ensured that those that were involved within the Muslim sector were asked and considered to be vaccinated in line with other key workers. We know that the key workers within the funeral industry of all faith have been working extremely hard during these unprecedented times. We were fortunate that Executive Committee of the National Burial Council have been working alongside a Shura panel of scholars for Islamic guidance and were joined by health and safety advisors specifically for the COVID-19 pandemic response and were ahead and managed to put procedures in place so that all those were in, that were involved were able to fulfill all aspects of the burial. We took measures that had to be put in place to aid with not only containing the spread of COVID-19, but to ensure the safety of all those that were participating in the preparation of Gusal. We know that many towns and cities who were badly affected had volunteers who had been working nonstop to support our communities and keep this essential, essential services running without any undue delay. This award is not only for the National Burial Council, but I'm happy to accept it as a recognition on behalf of all the Muslim funeral directors and community volunteer groups who up and down the country were instrumental in this noble work. The truth is the community would have been at a loss without the selfless commitment from our community who rose to the challenge in these uncertain times and ensured that each and everyone's loved one were laid to rest, shrouded, washed in accordance with Tusharia and a last right with utmost dignity and respect. National Burial Council is committed and continues its effort and will work together with the independent and community funeral director throughout the country to raise the standard of Muslim bereavement service, which we can be proud of at a reasonable cost to the family. Due to the pandemic, we were unable to proceed with our aims in this aspect. Following on from our national conference last week, we hope to begin much needed work to facilitate 
rapid and dignified burial process for the Muslim community throughout the UK with the new challenges that the funeral sector is faced with and continue engaging with key government departments and statutory bodies. I am personally grateful to have the honor of working on the core group with excellent people who have the passion and vision to bring this to fruition. May Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our humble effort and allow us all to work with sincerity. I mean, and once again, I'd like to thank the Muslim Council of Britain for honoring us with this award. Jazakallah khair. I mean, Jazakallah khair. No, thank you so much for this, my own brother Omar as well. Um, it's been such a pleasure to have you speak at the conference, to share your reflections now, and, and on behalf of all of us, to thank you. Um, because the industry that you're in is not for everybody, 